that's working, yeah. Right. Good morning, everyone. Can I encourage people who are sitting to the outside of the room, can I gently encourage you to come and sit at the desk, around the desks here, around the tables here, so that we can feel like we're having a slightly more intimate conversation, although intimacy will be a little bit of a challenge in this room, but in this rather grandiose room. Um, Welcome, everyone, to this morning's session where we're going to be discussing data governance for developing countries. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Stewart, and I'm the Executive Director of the Pathways for Prosperity Commission. We are a, a two-year commission based at the University of Oxford, looking at how developing countries can use digital technologies to deliver inclusive growth, to transform their economies. We're co-chaired by Melinda Gates, by Strive Masiwa, and by Sri Mulyani Indrawati, who's the Indonesian finance minister. Um, and I'm delighted to have you all here today. Before I introduce my panelists, let me just say a couple of words about kind of the process. Um, if you're tweeting this, and obviously we'd encourage you to tweet it, please use the hashtag, please, at p for p commission Please also, um, if you're watching this online, and good morning or good afternoon, depending wherever you are, very early in the morning to some people, uh, we'd be delighted to take questions from the online audience. You have two ways of sending us your questions. You can either tweet at us with the hashtag Digital Diplomacy, capital D in both instances, capital Digital, capital Diplomacy, or you can send a message, put a message in the chat box using Zoom. And if, it's, if it fits with the flow of the conversation, where the conversation's heading, we'll put this up on the screen and come to you. So, so two ways to, to um, submit your questions. What we're going to be talking about today, I can't imagine that um, to anyone in this room it will be news to you that digital technologies are transforming economies. Um, but also that they potentially, it's developing countries who stand to lose or gain the most by them. This is really an opportunity. This is a watersh watershed moment for developing countries. If they're able to use and take advantage of the opportunity of digital technologies, this could completely transform their economic um, development and their economic, their development trajectory. But equally, this could go wrong. This could be something that entrenches and increases inequalities. And it's also going to be data governance that's going to be the thing that makes the difference, right? If we can get the data governance right, that is going to be the, what opens up the opportunities, these opportunities for developing countries. In our work at the Commission, at the Pathways Commission, we've uh, written this report, Digital Diplomacy. There are copies available by the door, where we've looked at the current state of um, regulation, policy making around uh, data governance. And we show very clearly that it's entirely dominated by the concerns, the priorities, the needs of advanced economies, if we want to use that term. Um, and unsurprisingly, the resulting frameworks that emerge from that are, let's say, at best suboptimal for developing countries. They just don't fit developing countries. And that's what we're going to explore in this session. You know, how do developing country policymakers 
deal with this dilemma, that they're faced with these frameworks which don't fit them, yet there don't seem to be any alternatives. How can developing country policymakers balance the need to govern their data, to manage emerging risks, but also make sure that um, innovation is, is supported in their countries? So to explore these questions, I'm delighted to be joined by, um, to my far right, Kamal Bhattacharya, who is uh, one of our commissioners. He's also CEO of an edtech company, Mojo Chat, and he's former chief innovation officer of the Safaricom iHub in Nairobi. Welcome, Kamal. Um, next to Kamal is Mariana Valenti, who is director of the Internet Lab in Sao Paulo in Brazil, and she works on internet regulation um, and uh, policy and regulation. And then next to me, delighted to have Fabrizio Hosschild, who is the special advisor to the UN Secretary General with responsibility for overseeing the UN implementation of the high-level panel, their high-level panel on digital cooperation, which I should say Melinda Gates was also co-chair of. She's been very busy in this space this year. Let me turn first to Kamal, if I may. And Kamal, can I ask you to share some of the findings from this digital diplomacy report. What, what is it that developing country governments reported finding in the space? What are their difficulties? And what were some of the solutions that, the, that, that are being suggested? Sure. Um, thanks, Liz. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning. My name is Kamal Bhattacharya. I'm very impressed, by the way, with this translation thing here. It's like this, this, you know, they, they usually suck, but this one is really good. <laughs> See, it says they usually suck, but this one is really good. <laughs> you know, that's, that's really cool. So, <laughs> it, so I shouldn't swear. Well, I should, and see if it's really good. <laughs> you know, I, I have to get more comfortable to swear, but you know, God knows. Like we can move on to swearing later on in the session. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, um, you should definitely pick up the. The, the great paper here on uh, digital diplomacy, I thought uh, was a very interesting piece of research that the Pathways uh, Commission has done. Um, you know, I want to point out sort of three broad issues that came out of this research study. The first one is, um, is really around the importance of economic development for every policymaker and developing economies. Um, obviously, policymakers right now in developing economies are mostly concerned about how to make use of digital technologies and ICT at large uh, to drive economic development, to drive their development agendas. Um, it is, of course, so jobs and skills are top priorities. What I think where we have a lot of confusion is how do you use the current trends and technology to actually drive economic growth and at the same time have the right kind of regulations in place that support that locally at a country level or at the regional level um, without necessarily over-regulating it to such an extent that especially small businesses can thrive. Um, Realistically speaking, it comes to the second point is how do you implement these, re um, these uh, regulations? And the truth is, of course, that today the regulations around data, they are um, monopolized by the United States, by China, and by the EU. And in the EU, for example, you know, GDPR is um, you know, a, an interesting starting point. But I think what is happening in developing countries right now is a little bit of a of a misconception, which is if you, if you tell people that data that uh, pertains to local citizen has to be processed in countries, the expectation is that the big multinational corporations will come into the countries and set up data centers to do business there. That unfortunately is going to backfire because it's nonsense from a technology perspective, and I don't think it is very meaningful from a regulatory perspective either. But you see the current G20 discussions around India and South Africa and others, and Brazil who are kind of pushing back on this, but I think it's completely beyond the point and the, the, the challenge is much deeper. And I think from a democracy perspective, the challenge is really around our future understanding of the word consent and whether consent is even a viable 
legal notion of the future. Um, we have to solve a much harder problem, but you know, this is of course then to the third point, um, which is are developing economies, especially in Africa, where you have a lot of um, countries with very small markets, even in a position to create their own um, governance and compliance mechanisms? Um, the answer is probably not, and the answer will always be some kind of a copy and paste to whatever model is deemed the right one. So it could be the Chinese model, it could be the European model. Uh, that doesn't make the model right, um, for example, for Kenya or for Nigeria. Um, these kinds of uh, themes probably require us, um, require developing economies to form local clusters um, both from an economic integration perspective but also from a regulatory perspective around data um, to understand what is the right regulatory framework, for example, for East Africa or for West Africa. Pan-Africa is still a few generations out, but you know, for all of these different regions, you know, what are the, the future visions for how to regulate these three things? So um, I think these were some of the three um, things that stand out. Um, I encourage you all to read the report. I think it has a lot more very interesting data um, on this particular topic. Thank you. Thank you, Kamal. And just to add to that, on, in terms of the data, so it was based on a survey of just over 100 policymakers, academics, um, think tanks, civil society and private sector in developing and developed countries. So that there's, there's, some, there's some primary data in there as well, so it's worth looking at. Let me, let me turn Mariana to you. So um, Kamal was just saying, you know, pushback from Brazil. We were just talking a little bit about kind of contemporary developments in Brazil around this. How does this resonate? How does what Kamal has said and what our digital diplomacy report says, the findings there, how does that resonate with your experience in Brazil? What is it, you know, uh, how, how are you, how are you um, realizing that power imbalance? What does that look like from, then a, from a, a MIC perspective? Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Kamal, for setting the stage for this discussion. Um, well, I think one of the things that's most interesting in the digital diplomacy paper is to show how there's a lack of evidence-based policies in many of the developing countries, and that's the case in Brazil as well. And it often happens that some of the solutions found elsewhere, like in Europe or the United States, uh, is just understood as policy that's also going to work locally. But I think more, even more seriously than that, uh, solutions that are being found in the international uh, law and becoming binding to developing countries are not necessarily also happening in the interest of developing countries. Uh, so one of the examples for that is uh, international intellectual property, which since the 90s have been, uh, go, has been going through a tendency of maximization. And that has been happening in different levels. So for example, uh, the first big example was the TRIPS uh, agreement uh, at the WTO, but then trade agreements as well. Um, all these negotiations, they have been leading us to higher intellectual property levels under uh, the argument that that's going to be good for development necessarily. Uh, and usually uh, there's a causality bias in this discussion because it will be said that developed countries uh, have uh, better development in digital technologies because of intellectual property. When, when you look at the history, uh, actually it hasn't been actually like that. And it has been the case that in Brazil and in many developing countries, these very high uh, levels of intellectual property protection, they have been hindering education and research, for example, which of course are uh, very essential to development, but also technology transfers. Um, and one thing that's happening at the international level now, which feels very concerning, is that in different trade agreements or in the e-commerce uh, um, treaty that's being discussed at the WTO, there's discussion on further protecting algorithms and source codes 
with trade secrets, which is a kind of intellectual property. Uh, and that's setting even a higher level of protection, whereas we, what we should be speaking of, of course, should be uh, open and free software if we're really thinking of how to make data uh, work for developing countries, right? Uh, that's one thing, and I think another thing that's really important when we're thinking of uh, inter uh, international policy making, but also policy making in the north that ends up having uh, results in developing countries, we also have to think that when we're speaking of digital technologies, extraterritoriality becomes uh, a de facto um, uh, standard. Uh, for many policies, so for example, even in the field of intellectual property, for example, uh, since the United States established the DMCA and because most platforms are headquartered in the United States, um, all countries in the world are able to be affected, maybe are affected by DM, the DMCA, and that's the case in Brazil. You can file a DMCA report uh, from Brazil I don't know if everybody's understanding what the DMCA is, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It's an act uh, from 1998 in the United States uh, that determines the regime through which a platform has to comply uh, with uh, copyright notices um, in order not to become liable for third-party content. And what I was saying is that we're able to use this US regulation directly from Brazil uh, to take down content from, uh, from international platforms, especially US-based. And that uh, leads us to the question as to how far are we able to really regulate uh, intermediary liability from Brazil concerning our own interests in this area, right? Uh, Brazil had a very interesting model of intermediary liability set in place in 2013. Maybe you've heard of the Marco Civil, the Internet. Um, you might want to explain what that is. <laughs> the Internet Bill of Rights. Um, it's considered very interesting because uh, it's a law that centers around citizens' rights uh, instead of criminalizing citizens, which was more or less the standard of the discussion by then in Brazil and in many different countries. Uh, and it sets a few standards for citizens, but also for the private sector. It's also aimed at thinking of developing uh, uh, the digital sector through guaranteeing a, a few protections for uh, companies and for citizens. Anyways, there is a good discussion to be made on intermediary liability and how that affects the development of digital technologies in developing countries. But the fact is that the intermediary liability regime developed in the US is being directly enforced in Brazil if we're just able uh, to use that from our ground. Yeah. So I'll leave it there. Okay, no, we'll, 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 but we'll come back to that because it's, I mean, it's fascinating that this is a, li you know, a live policy discussion as we're, as we're talking right now. Fabrizio, let me turn to you. And now you have the not inconsiderable task of <laughs> overseeing implementation of at least some of the, or at least the UN's contribution to the recommendations that were made in the high-level panel final report earlier this year. Can you talk to us, so the, the recommendations as they relate to this question of data governance, what, is, what, what realistically can the UN do to help resolve the kind of dilemma that we've just heard Mariana and, and, and Kamal talking about? No, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And as you pointed out at the beginning, we're a little bit joined at the hip because we, we share a co-chair, Melinda Gates, and I think that also ensured that the work um, done by the high-level panel was very complementary and hopefully mutually reinforcing of the work you're doing. But given the, the intimacy of this room, of this small room being among friends, I, can you indulge me for a minute? Because to be honest, I share Kamal's fascination with this uh, tool. So you'll know this, but I just want to try this out. D does everybody know what a tongue twister is? No, does anybody know? So let's try this one. She sells seashells on the seashore. Oh my God. Okay, let's try a bit faster though. She sells seashells on the seashore. Now, 
this, I must say, this is another um, Google DeepMind beating Go moment. Huh? I mean, uh, you know, technology triumphs once again over humanity. Anyway, and that's what this debate is a little bit about, I'm afraid. Um, no, I think we very much share the analysis. What we're seeing is that <clears throat> rules adopted in the more developed countries, de facto, um, uh, are governing um, um, processes in less developed countries in ways that are uh, often uh, unconducive um, to, their, to their needs. Um, and, and mention has already been made um, of the US Cloud Act, the EU GDPR, the European Commission's Convention or European um, uh, Council of Europe's Convention 108. Um, and these are all um, approaches to data that um, are designed for the needs of, of the North, but de facto are imposed um, on the South without adequate um, uh, recognition of issues around intellectual property, as Mariana explained. Um, without um, a recognition of the particular development needs um, uh, of the South, uh, and without um, uh, recognition of the value of, of, of data and the potential for data mining um, from uh, the, the, the South. Um, as, as Elizabeth said in her opening remarks, this is particularly critical because the, the issue of how countries, or I would add, um, the speed at which countries adopt connectivity will be critical um, to development. And the fact is that the trend at the moment um, is more towards inequality than towards equality. Uh, connectivity in the, least, um, in the 47 least developed countries is under 20%. Um, so uh, how, with those sorts of figures, can you imagine it's becoming a boost for development. The truth is, with those sorts of figures, compared to um, connectivity levels um, in, in the European Union, for example, of well over 90%, um, in China, of close to 90%, um, uh, it's those who don't, who, who have around 20% uh, or under, are literally left behind. Uh, in, the, in the place I worked immediately being appointed in New York, the Central African Republic, um, the connectivity was literally around five or six percent. Um, so how can you talk um, of internet um, being a boost to economic development uh, when you have connectivity levels of five or six percent? What it in fact means is that um, as other countries race ahead, um, the distance to catch up becomes ever more insurmountable. And how data is handled is just one indicator of that. So what can we do about it? I mean, I think the panel doesn't go into any detail on data management. But what it does make very clear is that there needs to be much more equity in say um, around um, what everybody, um, uh, the, the people in the developed world are the first to argue should be a global tool. Um, and I, I think there's a, there's a fundamental contradiction we need to overcome between this notion um, that uh, the, the North is, is the first to uphold, that we want to maintain internet and the benefits it brings as a truly global tool. We don't want to see walls erected in, in cyberspace. We don't want to see a fragmentation of the net. And yet, at the same time, we have a very limited number of countries around the table when it comes to rule setting um, and, and governance. Those two are mutually incompatible. Um, I think to the extent that a uh, greater number of countries are not brought into the debate, um, the, the reaction will be more and more to have sort of knee-jerk, sometimes unsophisticated reactions um, of, of protectionism that, that can range from trying to erect cyberspace, uh, walls in cyberspace, to uh, simply shutting down uh, the internet. And of course, that's highly undesirable, um, but not being at the table um, is, uh, contributes to the sentiment that can lead to such extreme uh, measures. 
So I think the way, you know, the, the, what um, we discussed at length in the panel is that there's also a need for capacity building at a, at a regional and sub-regional level um, to make it possible for more engagement um, in international fora. And that's where the idea came from that is um, one of the central ideas in the panel report of regional help desks. And some of us were, why regional? Isn't that, um, isn't, wouldn't it be much more cost effective to boost existing global efforts? And there are a number of efforts from the World Bank to the ITU uh, and many others um, to build capacity um, in countries. Uh, and we, we welcome, the report acknowledges and welcome those efforts, but says that they're really not to scale um, and they're not localized enough. And that, hence the idea of having regional um, capacity building um, mechanisms that could take into account in a much more nuanced, sophisticated and sensitive way particular country concerns, particular community concerns, particular regional concerns, and help empower countries, communities and regions to play a role in the global debate. Um, you know, this we'll see, this is one of the recommendations in the report that um, has raised a few eyebrows and that we're having some difficulty in finding champions um, for. So it's not entirely clear whether this recommendation will flourish. Um, but we believe um, both boosting um, efforts at capacity building and policy formulation and doing it at a, at a regional or even sub-regional level um, is the best way to address um, the sorts of concerns that are so um, uh, brilliantly analyzed by the Pathways to Prosperity um, report. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Fabrizio. And um, as you say, there's a cl clear synergies between this idea of regional help desks and the idea of regional collaboration, cooperation as being a negotiating modality that looks like the most promising option for developing countries at the moment. So again, we'll, we can come back to all of these issues later, but I want to open it up to the floor now for questions about any of these topics. Um, I'll take questions in a couple of groups. Could I ask you to give your, obviously use the microphone, give your name and your organization, and if you could keep your questions succinct, please, because we'd like to have time for a couple of rounds. The lady over here. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Ingrid Volkmer, uh, University of Melbourne, um, and I'm heading an initiative called International Digital Policy Lab. My own background is in globalization and political public communication. Um, I, when we talk about these statistics in developing countries, I think it would be good to think about the tremendous drive of young citizens in countries. So the 20% uh, rate of um, having a, a, a mobile phone access is, sli is, is important, of course, but it's slightly misleading because in these countries we have young people, 50% of the population often young people, and they are the drivers of the economy in the future. And I think perhaps it would be good to also think about policy frameworks for these young citizens, how they can participate in the global digital economy in the future. I think that would be really important. And I, from my own academic work and from my experience, I've worked with the OECD and other organizations as well, there is not enough emphasis on this, I feel. The second one is that cities in these countries also, they are hubs for digital. And I think a bit more focus on city development. I've done just research in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and we see clearly how Dar es Salaam is emerging as a local center. So that's one. Uh, and the second comment I would like to make can is... I, can I ask you, you make an, another question rather than a comment? Okay, another question. Well, there we go. Uh, I feel often we look at consumers, but I think in today's world, consumers and citizens merge. And we don't have enough understanding how political public communication, how democratic public spheres are constituted in developing countries. We have this wonderful Habermasian paradigm in the Western world, but there is nothing similar for other countries, and that's often misleading. That's why they are labeled as authoritarian countries, and et cetera. That's it. That's Excellent. Thank you for that. Let me take a couple of other questions. The gentleman here. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Jimson Olufuye from uh, Nigeria, former chair of the Africa City Alliance. Well, I just want to correct an impression I had, you know, when Kamau was speaking, 
uh, saying the idea of uh, uh, localization or policy of localization of data that uh, to bring in uh, DC, uh, data center uh, establishment in country that is uh, nonsense. Oh, uh, well, that is from big companies. Well, I, I don't think uh, the statement is uh, overly correct because in Nigeria, uh, the data protection uh, regulation has actually spoiled a lot of local activities. Uh, the, there are local entrepreneurs that are setting up data centers in-house and you know the Nigerian economy uh, has 13.8% uh, contribution from ICT, okay? And penetration is close to 60%. Broadband is about 33%. So uh, just to correct that, that, if big players don't come in, the local player are up to the game. And that links up to the idea of uh, the need for us uh, to have a global framework when it comes to data governance. Uh, we have, as I said, there is Nigerian data protection regulation right now, uh, which kind of uh, dovetail from maybe GDPR, so uh, with some um, uh, possible uh, authorization for data to be hosted overseas, okay? So there has to be a kind of a synergy. Uh, but a question I want to ask uh, Mariana is, um, regard to Brazil uh, concerning the intermediary, and liabilities. Uh, so are they really liable? Uh, is there a law that makes them liable in, uh, in, uh, in, in Brazil? And if I may ask the last one to our uh, special advisor. Uh, so I, I th thank you for the brief, um, but the question is, uh, how do we uh, really move towards ensuring that we could have a global framework uh, that could uh, now help to streamline the issue of data governance regime uh, across the world. I think at that top level, it will help a great deal. Thank you. Thank you. And could you repeat your name? I'm sorry, I missed your name. Yeah, Jimson Olufuye. Thank you. E excellent questions. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, I'm, I'm, there are sort of comments, um, but I think it is useful to bring um, some additional um, commentary before we take some of the discussions. So I am going to, but they, they, they uh, are also questions because I think they respond to some of the. We'll imagine a question mark at the end. We'll add our own. <laughs> I, will, I, I just wanted to say, you know, respond to some of the kind of assumptions about the conversation that we're having and the sort of references to, to evidence-based policy and even the important reference to the, to the lack of connectivity. Um, but just to say that, you know, the, 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 the information that we have within the ITU system and that is extremely... Sorry, let me just pause you there. Did you, did you introduce yourself? I, I probably didn't. I'm terribly sorry. Um, my name is Alison Gilwald. I'm from um, Research ICT Africa, which is an Africa-wide um, think tank, policy and regulatory uh, digital think tank, um, and the University of um, Cape Town's Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance. Um, so we've been working over decades with um, various bodies within the region, various governments within the region, and of course within these um, regional economic communities. Um, currently working on um, digital economy model law with the SADC Parliamentary Forum, um, data protection with SADC, et cetera. So um, it's kind of in this context that I want to speak about some of the assumptions that um, cause some of these initiatives to fail because you, there's a kind of normative conflict, there's a normative dilemma, less so in SADC than in some of the other regions. Um, in, so kind of assumptions of democracy, assumptions of you know, competitive markets and consumptions of, of not only connectivity, um, but also of you know, what connectivity means, post-connectivity issues that really affect the ability to get economic growth, et cetera. So, I mean, the first thing I wanted to say is that we, you know, we speak about the need for evidence-based policy. We actually don't have that evidence in Africa. We don't, we don't know where we are in terms of the you know, SDG, um, ICT targets. Um, so we, all we know is we're not gonna reach them, but we actually have no idea. The um, supply-side data that's used within the UN system, we know doesn't measure 
prepaid mobile markets, which were predominant markets in these, uh, um, you know, in these countries. And it certainly can't do the kind of policy disaggregation that you need around income, gender, et cetera, et cetera. So we have very limited data. And I just sort of do feel obliged to make the point that one of the big um, disruptions to digital development um, on the continent at the moment is around the sort of, you know, um, hype around the fourth industrial revolution and technology that has actually um, distracted policy makers and, and, and implementers from, you know, the challenges they have around broadband plans and things. And everybody's now sort of focusing on the disruption um, of, of, of artificial intelligence, donors, you know, every, all governments now have fourth industrial revolution commissions. And everybody's forgotten about actually the as you point out, the vast majority of Africans are not, are not connected. But I just wanted to make, sorry, the other point, because of the importance of this in, the, in, in terms of kind of re getting economic growth and that, is that you know, the connectivity is obviously a big challenge still in large parts of, of the continent. Um, but it's not, so, you know, it's not largely a supply side challenge anymore. Many, many, many of the countries actually have, you know, 80, 90 percent, at least 3G um, co connectivity, but actually, as was pointed out, you know, far less than 20 percent connectivity. And some of the poster children of, you know, of the multilateral agencies and the banks, um, like Rwanda, for example, very strong supply side measures with less than 10 percent internet penetration in, um, in, in, in 2018, and in fact, the biggest gender gap of 60 percent. So, you know, clearly, the, the, there's a lot more than just sort of, you know, supply side, um, kind of driven connectivity issues. And then in the data environment, you know, the real challenge in this digital inequality paradox is not just that as we connect people, we're leaving people behind, but actually the kind of connectivity that we're getting means that there's a big gap between those people who are barely online for a few minutes just to get some data and those who are, you know, really involved in, in, in extensive things. So I just want to say this is a kind of, before we even get into the questions of what's working um, at, in terms of, you know, data governance at a, at a continental, at a regional level, we're also working with the, with the AU, but also the, the real challenges around sort of mat multilateral um, endeavours in this regard that are, you know, um, they're basically failing because of these normative disjunctures that we're seeing on the continent. But I'll just leave it there. This summer. Thank you very much, Alison, for that very um, useful and sobering corrective of, you know, what's the, what's the reality of, on the ground that we're talking about? So that, that was very helpful. Let me turn to, in, in terms of sort of picking up on these questions, actually, let me turn to Fabrizio first, if I may. And <clears throat> maybe you could pick up on Jameson's point, but also what Alison just said about, you know, how, how, do, how do we deal with this conundrum of multilateralism? Uh, I mean, particularly, you know, a couple of elephants in the room, but let's talk about the role of the US. How, how, do we, how literally can we do this when you have the US playing the role that it's currently playing? What's our, what's our roadmap to solve this multilateral conundrum and what can realistically the UN do? Okay, thank you. I mean, I think both Ingrid and Alison made eloquent points about the lack of reliable statistics. And in fact, this is one of the recommendations also of the high-level panel, that we need to get much more detailed data um, about exactly where exclusion is, is happening. And I would agree with Ingrid's point that if we look at youth, um, probably there's a higher proportion of youth, maybe through prepaid mechanisms, connected in urban areas um, of least developed countries um, than the, the statistics I quoted um, reflect. But let's recall that um, uh, in, in, developed, in the least developed countries, about 65% of the population is rural um, and connectivity is seldom um, goes out of uh, uh, um, urban um, areas. And I think to look at connectivity statistics on its own is also, you know, a little bit misleading. Again, coming back to the Central African Republic, because I happen to serve there, um, the literacy rate among women, is a, and that is a reliable statistic, unlike some of the others, um, is 24%. So you can get 90% connectivity and you'll still be leaving 80% um, of women behind. Um, electricity connectivity, which again is a reliable statistic, is around 13%. So um, yes, you can have solar panels, etc. But 
um, you know, we need to look more holistically um, at needs. But the truth is, current trends are widening the gulf, um, I think, between um, North and South. Yeah, or, or North and South is a bit misleading, but between the least developed and the most developed countries. Um, and that needs to be addressed. And one part of that, as both Alison and Ingrid highlighted, is getting a much better grip um, on, on, on the figures and their, their breakdown. In terms of Jameson's point, how can we address this? I mean, it won't come as a surprise that I'll answer, I think the UN is the forum to have these discussions. Uh, if we want truly universal um, instruments, we need a truly universal fora, and that is um, the United Nations. I do think it also has to be a multi-stakeholder discussion, and that in the United Nations is not always uh, easy, but this IGF is one UN-supported, UN-sanctioned body that is um, multi-stakeholder. Um, but we need also to drive towards concrete outcomes, which this body um, um, still lacks, and so hence also the recommendations of the panel for an IGF pass. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to address the stances of any individual country, um, but I think, you know, if enough smaller countries take up the baton of arguing for, for greater inclusivity, um, you know, I think their, uh, their, uh, their, 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 their voice will be heard. Um, I don't think anybody in a, in a hugely interconnected world um, can afford um, to ignore um, uh, two-thirds um, of, of the world. So I think it's about a better coordination of voices um, among um, developing countries around their interests um, in this domain. Uh, and we'd hope very much that the IGF can be a little bit repurposed to help facilitate that. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. And I should just add that um, we, as the Pathways for Prosperity Commission, we wrote a report a few months ago called Digital Lives, where we looked at these issues of inclusion and starting to move towards, think about some sort of possible solutions and possible business models for better, not just connectivity, but relevant, appropriate connectivity in a way that's useful for people who are currently excluded. But let me, Mariana, let me come to you because um, I, I really like the way you framed the dilemma of this question on data localization, which is one of those sort of balancing acts, which is very complex in this space. And you, you had a specific question for Mariana on Brazil. Yeah, I think Jimson's question for me was regarding liability for intermediaries, right? Um, and uh, he was asking if we have a, a liability regime in place and if companies are liable at all, they are. Um, but the way this was discussed when uh, this law that I was mentioning, the Internet Bill of Rights, was enacted in 2013, it was in a way uh, so as to take values into consideration and balance different values in the digital environment. So what got enacted was a regime in which, in most of the cases, platforms are liable after uh, a court order or during takedown of content. And that was, at least at the moment, worldwide celebrated as being a regime that uh, takes care of uh, freedom of expression. The issue is that, at that moment, it was impossible to come to terms also with the entertainment industry to have a regime for copyright. And I think when we're speaking of copyright, other issues also uh, come forth, uh, which is a balance in different industries and how you want to use that kind of policy uh, to develop uh, uh, different industries in your country, right? So like the, the entertainment industry or the tech industry. And for that, we don't have a rule. And when I said that the, the US rule is being directly applied to Brazil, uh, it also has to do with that. There's no specific rule for copyright infringement. And we've mostly been using the US framework because of platforms. Can I just really quickly pick up uh, on what Alison was saying, because it really resonated to me as well, um, that we're at this point really discussing uh, different policies for the developing world. And I think if, if I got right what you're saying, uh, I completely agree that, uh, at least in Brazil, but I also think that in international fora, 
um, connectivity has become not so, not so much of a sexy issue anymore, right? And we're discussing many issues like regulating artificial intelligence, for example, right? That's like, or, or disinformation, which are all very relevant. And I don't think there's like a scale of relevance in terms of no, in, in developing countries, like we only have to be discussing connectivity because we don't have enough connectivity. But it really feels that when we're discussing policies for the developing world, perhaps we would have to take a more holistic approach, right? And take all these issues into consideration, not leave connectivity behind, because it's clear that this is like in the basis uh, of everything that we're discussing here. And then uh, not just connectivity, but other infrastructural issues. So for example, many of the services uh, uh, in Brazil, they're not available to everyone because of payment systems, for example. So like, uh, we really need like bold, plans, right, which don't just take into account like specific yeah. sectoral considerations. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, we'd agree, and we call these the digital foundations. So what are the, the, uh, what are the things that you absolutely need to have in place, and then you need to build your data governance regime on top of that, but there's no point having a data governance regime if you don't have these basic things in place because there's not going to be anything to, to, to govern, basically. Kamal, let me turn to you and obviously feel free to pick up on any of the questions, but I wanted to just pick up on Ingrid's point about cities and you know, not least thinking about, you know, it's very cliche to say what is the role of the private sector in this, but there are emerging examples of public-private collaborations in this space and it'd just be really interesting to hear you reflect on what's, you know, what can we learn from those? Is that, is that you know, what does the solution look like from that perspective? Uh, sure. I I want to just first address my friend from Nigeria. You know, I think we have to be careful. Uh, this hope of data centers is a fallacy because data centers don't create that many jobs. The businesses that you build on top of data, they're pretty powerful. And they, I think they're kind of the future of what the digital society is. Um, you know, I've helped a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, both in Nigeria, by the way, as well as in Kenya and in South Africa, uh, to think through setting up local data centers. One of the issues is always that building a local data center in a developing economy is always expensive because of electricity, because of cooling, um, and because you have to build a double backup to a double backup, you know, to make sure the damn thing doesn't go down, right? So, so this is where, where my thing is also, you know, and, and the, the, the other example that I always give people is that, you know, the, the latest big trend in technology, especially in cloud technology, is something that is called serverless. Whatever that means, just think about the word, right? So what it essentially means, philosophically speaking, is that we're thinking about a future where the physical entity that does compute or storage, for that matter, um, is borderless. That's the future, right? And that was the future of the cloud already. So the implications of that is, you know, I kind of want to regulate um, something else, right? I want to regulate uh, the companies that are getting or that are already monopolies. I don't know what I can do about <laughs> consent, but I know that Nigeria has a tough chance in the future to establish really valuable data businesses that go global, because there are already global monopolies in play where the borderlessness of data is going to be an incredible challenge for Nigerian companies to compete. And Nigerian companies are technically always extremely competitive, right? But when you see the, the, the hindrances that we have because of the way how private sector operates today, private sector that is focused on sort of this, this data economy, it's crazy, right? And that's what Nigeria needs to do other than getting to mobile money instead of bank-driven stuff and all of the infrastructure issues that you have outside of the things, right? But that's a longer discussion. I, I just want to point out one more thing on the role of private sector, you know, and, and also the role of, of connectivity. You know, we've, we've been doing, and unfortunately, you know, we haven't published it yet, but um, while I was still working at Safaricom, which is a telco in, in, in Kenya um, that is uh, famous for the rollout um, of M-Pesa, uh, probably the most successful um, mobile money system in the world, 
uh, we did a study where we tried to see what happens if you give people who come onto the net for the first time with a smartphone, and Kenya has about 50, growing towards 60% smartphone penetration, what happens if you give them free data? Right, so which means they can use the internet as much as they want, as long as they want. Um, and, you know, and free was sort of in, in different, different segments. And, and we did a randomized control study comparing that to people who also come online and who don't get free data but actually have to build. And so we wanted to look at, you know, are they looking for jobs? Are they educating themselves more? Are they taking up opportunity? Is there any economic impact? So we also did a survey-based study on, on, the, on the groups that we selected through the telco. And um, the outcome of it is fascinating. Zero outcome. Zero. So, so it reminds me a lot about the, the discussion around electricity, right? Remember, you know, electricity, electrifying was the thing to do until we somehow came to terms with the fact that just electrifying is not enough. We also need to be able to give people affordable fridges or TVs or something that actually drives consumption. And I see the same effects on the, 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 the internet. Um, so this is a study that I've been doing with my friend Tavneet Suri, who is an economist at MIT and who's been working around these things for a long time. But, but keep in mind, so, so connectivity is one thing, but, but the question that I also need to ask is, is what value are the services that we think are valuable on the internet today actually are providing for people who live in, um, you know, not in the, in, in the developing countries middle class, who live in, you know, in poverty or slightly above poverty. Maybe the same things that we value are not things that they value. Maybe Twitter is not as important. Um, or maybe some other of the services that we think are not important. And we, I, I don't think we have sufficient information about what actually provides value. And the second thing to me is, um, you know, I've been working with um, also a, a small company startup in the, in the technical and vocational training space. And what they have done is to introduce ICT into uh, training courses for um, plumbers, masons, and all that. And they build physical structures, physical workshops, where they do the theoretical part of plumbing with really interesting tools that they kind of develop in a factory, in, in, in a computer factory in India, where you have like visualizations of, you know, a pipe and how you put them in, and then you do it in practice. And they distributed these centers into rural areas in India, they're doing this in Kenya and Rwanda, and several different other places. Now you're exposing people to the internet with a very practical purpose, which is you want to get a certification as a plumber or a mason, you need to learn these kinds of things to do. And when I look at what the role of private sector in this is, we need to actually start understanding more before we think about you know, how to regulate everything. You know, what are the value services that will include those people who live in poverty, for example, in Kenya? I honestly, I've spent now the last 10 years across India and Kenya and many other African countries, I honestly don't know. I really don't know and I don't have any good indications. We love to make stuff up, right? We love to say, oh, it needs to be telemedicine because look, you have no access to doctor. It needs to be access to water. Needs to... I don't know. So because honestly, everything that I've seen except for mobile money was a complete disaster. So, right. Kamal, let me, we, we can come back to that because Jameson has a two finger on that. But let me, let me, I just want to check if there's any other burning questions in the room because I'm aware of time, but also to echo the fact that nobody has really conducted a, a, a major scale exercise of asking the poorest and most marginalized what they want, think, need, and prioritize since the World Bank did it 20 years ago. So it's, it's not good enough. But let's, let me just. It's not, it's not being used. 
Sorry. I just wanted to flag that they, I think it's, you know, it's, the, it's the fact that we don't actually draw on this local knowledge that is there, you know, statistical and otherwise that is there, that would actually tell us some of these things. It's not comprehensive. It is some. Right. So let me, let me put you on hold just for one second, Jameson. It does, let me take one uh, final question. The lady over there, could I ask you to go to the microphone, please? Thank you. Thank you. I'm Janet. I'm from Kenya. And I'm sitting here just to tell my friend who was indicated that Kenya we are really poor and, be, and did not get anything much. I come from that uh, part, the interior part of Kenya. And uh, there's a lot of penetration of, of course, electricity is helping so much, and solar energy. The government has done so much. And uh, what I believe is there is need for awareness and knowledge sharing. We believe that there has developing countries because we are also struggling with the culture aspect. We are still coming up very fast and very aggressive, but we still feel that uh, a lot is not shared off. I must say I'm at my 45, and I'm struggling to learn about these internet things. We are scared because the things we see there, they don't do much with our values and what we've learned since our old age. And because I have my children now, I have teenagers between 20, now coming to 20, I'm now trying to approach it. So I think what is required is a lot of sharing and a lot of uh, creation of awareness as we absorb this. There's that divide of the age and uh, the old. And the majority now, they are coming to that age group of the age who are now in these uh, natives in the technology age. But I believe our government is doing a lot. And I came here and I'm impressed by your comments. Otherwise, we are proud to be the pioneers in MPESA which is really driving economy, and is, we, we, we take pride of that. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Janet. So actually, a, a question in there on digital skills, and, a, and, and really interesting digital skills as they relate to data governance, which you know, it's, a, it's a whole other debate, but it's directly related to a data governance question. Let me just come back to your, your, your two-finger question, Jameson, or your, your, your comment back, and then I'll put this back to the panel. Yes, uh, quickly, this is Jameson speaking, uh, to our special advisor. Um, you know, you, you did talk about UN is a good framework, you know, to look at how to have the global uh, data governance uh, uh, regime or policy. Uh, I want to ask, the, in the work stream of the high level panel, uh, was there a consideration of the report of the CSTD uh, working group on enhanced cooperation? Could you just spell out what CSTD is? Okay, CSTD is the United Nations Commission for Science and Technology uh, Working Group on Enhanced Cooperation on Public Policy Matters Pertaining to the Internet. I happen to be a member of that working group and they look at these things, basically. Okay, right. So a, a very specific question there for Fabrizio, a general question on, 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 on skills for the panel. I'm going to ask you also, as you answer this, can you give me, uh, we're, we're coming to the end of our session, uh, sadly, because this is a conversation that needs to run and run, not just that it can run and run, but it needs to run and run. But I'm really interested in kind of getting very, very concrete about this. What, is, what do we need to do next? Because we can talk about it for a long time, but what is the kind of next action that we need to see happening to start unpacking this kind of, this, this, the, the, all the dilemmas that we've been talking about today. So if I could ask you, as you reflect on, on, on the, the, the second round of questions, just to give me your very, in very concrete terms, what, you know, what is it that you, you want to see happen next, you think needs to happen next? Um, let me, Fabrizio, as the question was, for, there's a specific question to you, let me ask you first. Thank you. Um, I, to, to the best of my knowledge, the, the, the CSTD was, um, the, the, the findings were reviewed and it was acknowledged as a, as a best, as a very good example of a good approach, uh, if, if my recollection serves me, serves me rightly. Sorry, I should also have added in one minute, please. I forgot to add that vital detail. No, I... I think two things happen next. I think we really need to revitalize uh, vitalize the, the suggestion about regional help desks precisely to address uh, these imbalances. And, and I invite anybody who wants to join that discussion to, to talk to us. And secondly, I think we need to um, see how we can upgrade the IGF um, to make it 
um, uh, more outcome oriented, particularly in this as in other areas. Thank you. That was very specific and very fast. Mariana, let me come to you. Well, first of all, uh, I'd like to come back to the idea that we should have bold plans, not just fragmented conversations on the internet, but also that we should be fostering these conversations within countries because sometimes even the developing countries are not cooperating uh, because also these conversations are not necessarily happening at the government level. And last, when we're speaking at the UN level, uh, I think we were speaking here of how difficult it is to find champions for these ideas and on, on my area of expertise, so uh, at WIPO, for example, there's a development agenda going on for a few years now, but actually the organization itself has been fostering much more of uh, the international rights, holder, rights holders agenda than the development agenda. So even in the international fora, this discussion, th these discussions have to be more fostered around cooperations and the interests of developing countries. Excellent, thank you. Also concrete. And, and Kamal, please. Yeah, I think, um, you know, what I would really like to see in the future in these kinds of discussion is um, to really start thinking about a taxonomy on getting a better understanding what are the issues that we are really trying to address. We are operating in this space without a proper taxonomy. Uh, that's why we love to use examples of, you know, here, here's a startup that did something and that's the future, right? And here is Google who did something and that's not the future. It's a very sort of broad discussion where I think we need to nail this down and understand where is the way how the digital society is run today a detriment and creates more inequality and create evidence in those spaces, but also look at the sites where, where is it really positive and understand those areas because we don't want to actually over-regulate those parts okay. either. Excellent. And, and I, I'm delighted that you said taxonomies um, because um, the, the Pathways for Prosperity Commission is now coming to a close and we are exploring what comes next and we're exploring setting up uh, a center that be based on in Oxford at Oxford University but continue to partner with country governments and partners and academic and policy partners around the world to keep exploring exactly this kind of issue so building taxonomies building alternative frameworks exploring some other possible alternative models that could be first best for developing country governments so we'd love to Stay in touch with all of you on this as we develop our, our thoughts and we explore how this is going to work. Um, I'd urge you, I've already said, there's copies of Digital Diplomacy by the door. I'd also urge you to pick up a copy of the Digital Manifesto, which is um, a kind of summary, if you like, of the Pathways Commission's final report, which is called the Digital Roadmap. The manifesto is the kind of the easy read takeaway summaries with 10 steps in there. So please take that away. And also, if you want to download the full report, it's called the Digital Roadmap. Um, I'd like to thank you so much for this excellent participation and enthusiasm and energy in the room around this discussion. And uh, particularly, I'd like to thank very much the panelists for joining us this morning. Can we ask everyone to please move along so we can get started? We only have an hour for the next session, so please um, take your seats and let's get going.
Okay, everyone, let's, let's have a seat. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Nelson. I'm the director for the Center for International Media Assistance in Washington, D.C. Um, I am here representing a group of people who have come together in a really, truly multi-stakeholder way to uh, talk about the future of the Internet. We represent a group called the um, uh, Open Internet for Democracy that um, uh, is composed of the Center for International Media Assistance, the Center for International Media Assistance, um, actually the Center for International Private Enterprise, the Center for International Media Assistance, and the National Endowment the, Na the National Democratic Institute, I'm, I always screw these names up every time I say them, so forgive me, but it's a group of people who come from different sectors to think about the, um, the issues that are involved in making the internet a more open and participatory uh, internet and, and governance process that involves people from around the world. And we are delighted that we have this opportunity to talk about this incredibly important topic today of the internet splintering into national um, pieces that undermine the, the very reason that the Internet Governance Forum was created in the first place. Um, the, as you know, this, this, this whole forum it has been going for the last 14 years that is, and trying to make the internet an inclusive and, uh, and participatory uh, process of governance that uh, values the open, connected internet that brings knowledge to isolated communities and helps um, the internet reach the far corners of the earth. It, it's, a, it's a system that um, brought knowledge and, um, and, and helped reduce poverty and help countries reach the information that they needed in order to develop and to thrive and to improve human progress. Yet today that, that internet and that vision of a democratically controlled internet through a multi-stakeholder pro process is under attack and a growing number of countries is being attracted to a, a, an approach that would create an internet that ends at national borders that becomes an instrument of social control and political suppression. So today we're going to be hearing the stories of how that is happening across the world and we've brought people from around the globe to talk about it. We initially had a really very good uh, gender balance on our panel but the uh, combination of no-shows and visas really undermine that, though we do have some important uh, 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 voices in this panel and some uh, important diversity in terms of geography. But I, I wanted to point out that we, we tried very hard to have a really gender-balanced uh, panel and it, uh, we were, uh, we, we, didn't, we, we were uh, stopped from that, so I, I'm sorry to, to report that. I'm going to let our panelists st start by introducing themselves and telling us where they're from and the organizations that they represent, and then we're going to have an, a, a conversation here at the front and we're going to involve the audi audience in that process. Uh, let's, let's start here on my, on my right. Um, Ephraim, you, you can introduce yourself and, and tell us where you're from and who you represent. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ephraim. I'm from Kenya. I work with Article 19, uh, working on freedom of expression and information across the world. Uh, we are a global organization which have done this for the last two years. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited to be here so that we have this conversation to ensure that we have one united internet across the world. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Olga Kirilyuk. I'm uh, a CEO and founder of the Ukrainian-based organization, uh, The Influencer Platform. We are working uh, on the protection of uh, digital rights and the promotion of the idea of uh, equal opportunities, uh, free and open internet. 
Uh, during the last year, I was also the ambassador of the Southeastern European Dialogue on Internet Governance, uh, and uh, now I'm also an incoming member of the executive committee of uh, this regional initiative. And uh, also, since a few years, I'm a founding member of the uh, Internet Freedom Network for the Southeastern Europe and Eurasia. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Walid Al Sakaf. Um, I am uh, here representing Sedatorian University, being a, a scholar at Sedatorian University's Media Technology and Journalism departments. And um, I originally come from Yemen, so I bring expertise both from uh, uh, the North, Global North, and Global South. Um, my own interests are uh, how the internet allows freedom of expression and how means of stifling the internet through censorship and other forms of re repression can, in fact, limit the potentials of the internet. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kudakwa Shaove. I'm with the Media Institute of Southern Africa, the Zimbabwe chapter. We work to promote media freedom in Zimbabwe and in the region with the cooperation of our sister chapters in four other Southern African countries. Um, we've started working on digital rights around 2015 in response to government um, actions which sought to restrict uh, freedom of expression and access to information in online environments. And I'm also here as a fellow of the Joint uh, Open Leaders for a Democratic Internet uh, Program. So just to give you a sense of the kind of work that we've been doing, we have a, uh, a set of principles that have been worked out about the open internet that you can pick a copy up on our booth that is at uh, station number 50, uh, down in the second part of the um, open area where the uh, uh, different stalls are located. And it, we worked out the basic principles of what needs to happen in to, in to keep the, open, the internet open. And um, you might want to pick up a copy of this because I think it's a useful um, and, and practical uh, instrument to help understand what are the different, different components of that process. So today we're going to be looking first at, at the threats that come from the splinter net that is emerging in the world today and the, attractive, uh, the, the attractions that some countries are finding to the idea of closing down the internet at its borders in order to control people. Um, and I'm going to start with Walid to, to just give us a, a sense of how you see this happening, both in terms of the political uh, arrangements that are taking place as well as the technical side of it. Um, uh, are we getting to the point where this is actually going to be possible as, as a reality on the ground? And, and what does that mean exactly? Um, thank you. Let me start by saying that when the Internet came about, uh, it was a rather disruptive technology, something that governments are not used to. I mean, uh, many of you understand the decentralized nature of the internet, and so the centralized control of communications through the various uh, national establishments uh, had been used to the fact that you have a center node where you get to provide permission to access the various means of communication. But when the internet came about, that disrupted that this, this control, and so the uh, reaction was to follow, to try to have a catch-up uh, stage where governments look into ways in which, okay, we have no technical control of how the internet runs, but we at least have some regulatory, I mean, we can impose regulatory measures. And so uh, in many countries around the world, including, for example, in the Middle East, where I come from, national governments have control of the internet service providers. So in one way or the other, whether they are private or public, they have uh, ultimate uh, decision on whether they shut down the internet uh, in, in a particular geographical location, uh, whether they censor it, whether they impose any throttling. And uh, we are a bit uh, further away from the Arab Spring, but we very much recall what happened at the time. So within borders, you have the ability to control access. Uh, the only thing that is a bit, um, optim let's say, hopeful is that there are more and more people that are aware of how one can, dis let's say, circumvent forms of censorship through using the very essence of the technical features of the Internet. 
Then again came another wave uh, of governments reacting to this as well. So it's more to do with uh, um, um, you have a stage where you have an awareness of a new method, and then you have the governments taking uh, a step further to try and to limit the possibility of using that method. And I personally have gone through the experience of developing a circumvention uh, software to help activists overcome censorship in certain parts, but then governments and, and others found a way to limit that access by blocking, for example, the ports of the VPN entries, and sometimes even using that in their advantage by surveilling uh, citizens. So in other way, I mean, the, they see this as an entitlement being extended from the fact they are the so-called protectors of national security. So um, unfortunately, we have trends to see uh, where we uh, realize that this is going to continue and this uh, cat and mouse chase will remain in place. There is no real one solution to how to deal with this, um, but this is a good beginning to begin to discuss why is this happening and how can we resolve it. Thank you, Wally. I want to turn to Olga now. You know, this, this area that we're working in here is one where um, we fall in the cracks between a, a, a system of global governance and the system of national uh, controls and uh, the internet is, is has been devised to become a a real public good at the global level. Yet we are struggling to figure out how to do this legally and pr procedurally. And you've looked at the legal uh, uh, thinking that goes behind the ideas of a multi-stakeholder system that uh, governs the internet as and, and how what is the role of the state and legal entities in that process. So give us your thoughts about um, the threats of this, uh, this breakdown in the internet and what, uh, how you see this uh, from uh, your scholarship. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's indeed uh, not, uh, not an easy question and uh, there is no like, clear answer to, to this kind of question. But uh, to be honest, I believe that uh, the biggest problem is that uh, from the very beginning there is the assumption that digital space is something which is uh, existent uh, in purely technological uh, uh, space and purely technological terms. And uh, from this point of view, it is supposed to be regulated only by uh, technological uh, standards uh, and uh, it has nothing to do with the law and the legal regimes. Which is uh, not really true because uh, the digital space did not uh, uh, did not, uh, was not created uh, in the vacuum. It was uh, already embedded into existing uh, uh, social structures and uh, of course uh, uh, the states had a big role to play in uh, regulating uh, uh, everything which, is, uh, which has something to do with the uh, sovereign powers. So by no means we can say that uh, internet or sovereignty are like some stable notions. They are very dynamic ones and uh, they have to be developed with time. And that's why once the internet uh, was created, uh, the, very, uh, the very nature of the sovereignty has been uh, challenged, and that's why states uh, had to, uh, with the flow of the time, to adapt to that. And as uh, Valid uh, rightly mentioned, that uh, from the very beginning, the states did not understand the, the value and the very nature of the internet to regulate it uh, directly from the start. That's why it took some time. But, but now, when uh, the governments understand the, the very value and those benefits and also those uh, dangers which the digital digital space uh, has in itself, they of course uh, want uh, to regulate it, but uh, it also has uh, its, uh, uh, its difficulties because uh, digital space uh, has a uh, borderless nature and it's very difficult to apply uh, territorial design uh, laws uh, into uh, regulating uh, such, a, such a borderless phenomena as uh, the internet is. At the same time, uh, at the same time, uh, the states uh, do have the jurisdiction within, the, within their territory, and that's why for them, whenever they try to put uh, the laws, they of course try to, try to like, limit those laws uh, by the uh, territory of their state, because just they can't uh, uh, extend their jurisdiction to, to the other states. And uh, on the other side, it is very complicated for them to agree on something on the international level, because it is very lengthy process, and it is very costly process. And uh, of course, uh, we can't say even that the states have a unanimous approach to how to regulate the digital space. And you, you come from a, uh, from a country, Ukraine, that is going through a massive transformation from a country that used to be part of the Soviet Union to today asserting its uh, uh, democratic uh, future. 
Is the open nature of the internet uh, questioned in the power structure or by the people in Ukraine today? Do they want to be, to have this open system that uh, connects them globally, or is that a, a, an issue that it's uh, causing uh, concern or discussion? I would say the open nature is not even questioned by the governments because whatever restrictions they put in place, it is uh, all the time for the sake of the open internet, but just to protect some kind of security which has been uh, threatened by a uh, different uh, number of uh, external uh, threats. In our case, it was uh, uh, when uh, the restrictions were introduced back in uh, mid-2017, uh, uh, we could not even... Uh, Imagine before that that something like that could happen in our country because Ukraine uh, was always a country of a free and very affordable internet and uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, internet service providers. We have uh, a very cheap uh, cost of the access to the internet. Uh, we have very uh, uh, knowledgeable people who know how to use uh, how to use the internet. And uh, when the restrictions were put in place and it was already the society was divided between two different camps, like those uh, uh, who were like very much concerned about national security security and could buy any uh, justification that the government was selling that uh, uh, we need to restrict and uh, we need, you need to give up a part of your freedom just for the sake of the national security, otherwise you are just uh, not uh, the good citizen of your country. And there were the others who were selling, uh, who were telling, and uh, my organization was among, uh, among that, uh, that part of the civil society, we were saying that, uh, of course, national security matters, but when you start restricting, uh, uh, in that case, that was uh, freedom of expression online, you never know what where the government would stop, because this is a very slippery slope. Once the government starts to put the restrictions, it is very difficult to control uh, what uh, kind of uh, um, free speech they control and, uh, and when they would want to stop, because then they would find another reason, another argumentation for that. Let's, let's turn to, to what's going on in Zimbabwe, uh, Kuda, and, and your experience in Southern Africa. Um, Africa has been being seen uh, recently to be implementing a variety of new ways of, sh of shutting down the internet and stopping people from accessing and using this, this, this instrument. And this seems to be a real threat to the progress that, uh, that Africa has made over the past decades. I mean, you know, we've had incredible development in Africa and, and real progress in some countries. And you come from a country where these, uh, these threats are, are really noticeable. Tell us what you think the the, the consequences of this splinter net will be for, uh, for Zimbabwe and for other parts of Africa. Um, thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, so, like you're saying, I would like to start off with the fact that over the past decade, we've seen an increase in the number of Africans, specifically in the Southern African region, that now have access to the internet. This is uh, because of a range of factors. It's now cheaper to get a an entry-level smartphone, um, the use of social media bundles, the rise of technologies such as WhatsApp, Facebook, which have replaced more expensive and traditional means of staying in touch, such as voice communication and basic SMS. And this has also brought a threat, because in the past, uh, countries such as Zimbabwe and other countries that are concerned or that have governments that are concerned about what's happening in terms of free expression and access to information are now seeing the rise of these cheap, affordable, and widespread communication tools as a threat to their control of the information society within their countries. So we most likely won't see the scale of a splinter net as we've seen in China and Russia uh, mainly because of things like resources and, to a certain extent, the know-how to actually, first of all, cut off the whole country from the global internet, as well as the resources to produce alternative versions of Facebook, Google, WhatsApp, and all these popular tools that we're seeing being used now. So what we have been seeing is, in Zimbabwe, for example, and in Malawi, we've seen internet shutdowns and other forms of information controls around national um, events or events at a national scale that relate to political affairs such as uh, elections in Zimbabwe, in Malawi in April, as well as um, 
the social uprising in Zimbabwe in January, which led to a six-day internet shutdown. So those are sort of like the ways that we're seeing governments in that region sort of restrict what's happening in the internet space. They, they're not um, completely creating an alternate or parallel internet, but they are controlling what's happening on the global internet by restricting uh, information controls. And they're also using policy. An example of this is in Zimbabwe where the current uh, national ICT policy uh, from 2016 to 2020, uh, 2021, sorry, uh, ex actually um, talks about government's intention to shrink the number of international uh, internet gateways from uh, about five to seven to one. And this one internet gateway will most likely be controlled by government. So we're seeing the use of policy to change the physical structure of the internet in Zimbabwe <coughs> in a way that will um, give government the power to switch it on and switch it off as per need. And that type of, that type of action is being used else, elsewhere around the world. Article 19, where if I aim you, you work, you've, you've had specific examples of where this kind of policy has really reduced the ability of, of civil society to organize and to connect with each other during periods of crisis and during ma massive uh, changes that are taking place in Africa. You were talking yesterday uh, of, about Burundi, where you had some examples of how this um, manifested itself there. Tell us a little bit about how you see this, the, the threat that, uh, of, of, of a splinter net in the work you do. Thank you. So uh, the, regarding this, uh, the uh, get, gateways, the international gateways, similar example is Uganda where this year in uh, June, um, the government tried to reduce the number of IXPs and collapse them into one. Uh, that has its various risks. And then the policy that was uh, being drafted to uh, support this move uh, was drafted in a way that was imposing intermediary liability on the IXPs and anyone operating them, that they would be able to be liable for content, which is not best practice uh, when it comes to this. So such kind of actions um, have uh, led to uh, people being scared of the internet or being scared of using ICT. So basically just criminalization of ICT usage and making it risky to do your work. So uh, the specific example that, um, just building on to what Kuda mentioned, is uh, uh, for those who monitored the 2015 Burundi crisis, uh, there was um, attempts at disconnecting Burundi from the world because of the human rights violations. Uh, uh, and. Uh, that those attempts in a way, uh, for example, even um, there was first, uh, the first sign was the internet shutdown. There was an internet shutdown that disconnected the entire internet, uh, the entire Burundi uh, system from the internet, and not just internet, but also SMS and other um, telecommunication services. So in, 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 these are some of the risks that we see uh, in, in that, in that uh, uh, when this happens. But then, uh, in Africa, um, uh, where I've worked m mostly, uh, we don't see like an alternative um, internet being built or, or something like that. It's more of uh, uh, disconnecting from the global internet. But then one example that happened and, and uh, is um, recently, I don't, I don't know, uh, I think it was in April or, or, or March, there was some suggestion from the Ugandan ICT minister to come up with an alternative uh, Facebook for Ugandans. Uh, so if uh, this was after some conference between uh, uh, African and, and China uh, uh, Ministry of ICT officials. So uh, if, this, if we are building uh, and Facebook, for, Facebook for, uh, for each country, Africa has 55 countries. Uh, so we're going to have to download 55 apps to, to communicate with all our friends in all those countries, if you have friends across the country. So it's just impractical if you want to keep uh, global trade to, to ensure people keep working the way they, they, they wanna, uh, they're supposed to, to be working. So there's also that question of influence from various places. Uh, whenever there's those ministerial multilateral meetings or bilateral meetings, some of them unfortunately have had bad influences 
uh, on some of our countries which have less than 25% internet connection. So you can't start restricting uh, the, the, the internet for a country which has 20, less than 25% connection, or for example, Eritrea, which has 1% connection, or, or, or uh, Ethiopia, which is not opening up, but it was uh, a few years ago, it was in a much worse state with only 4% connection. So uh, it's, it's, it's working against bringing the people who are offline. Africa has one billion people, uh, most of them uh, offline, uh, around 70% of, of them offline. How do we bring them on, on, online if we have these kind of policies which are not, or we're trying to introduce these policies from certain parts of the world which are not opening up uh, Africa for trade or for um, work on freedom of expression and, and human rights? Yeah, that's a really good um, segue into the, into the next part of the conversation. And as you point out, this, this can really be a, a, a set of breaks on progress for, for the development of, of, of many parts of the world. And it's uh, the knowledge and, um, and connection, connections that scientists and health workers and others get when, through the internet can if that slows down, it could really have a, a really negative impact on international development and the progress of democracy. At the same time, there are real problems that are happening on cyberspace, and there are real reasons that countries have to worry about um, the, the, the way that um, information and disinformation are, are, are moving in this space. And there are legitimate reasons sometimes to think that we have to find ways that these, uh, these systems, these, uh, these communication systems, the internet, has democratic controls that, are, um, that, that work and that are effective and that, that don't stop freedom of expression but allow um, the internet to serve uh, public interest. So I'm, I think we should turn now to thinking about what are some of the ways we might think about that. And, um, um, maybe, I, maybe I'll start with Kuda. What, what is your thinking on how uh, we might consider these, uh, these, this, this, this tension between the need for connectivity and the need for open systems and also uh, some of the real problems that may be necessary to find ways to um, uh, have democratic oversight over how this internet works? Uh, I wish he had gone first to someone else, but okay. Um, so from, from, from the work that we've done, um, from the readings that I've done, the issue that comes out is that it's less about states and big corporations looking for ways to approach or to solve or to address the threats that you identify. I'm guessing you're talking about how, for example, it's so easy to spread messages of hate over the internet now. It's cheap, it's affordable, it's widespread. But for me and the work that we've done, it's all about democracy. Um, the ways that people are controlling and regulating the internet right now is being done in a way to stifle democratic processes. Very few people are talking about how to secure the internet against genuine, legitimate cyber criminal activities or cyber security threats in, in, in that regard. But look at the number of countries in Southern Africa that have been working on different cyber legislation. We're talking about um, e-transactions and e-commerce legislation. We're talking about cyber security and computer crime legislation, and to a certain extent, data protection regulations. Most of the cyber security and cyber, um, cyber laws that are being drafted and that have been shared are really meant to stifle free expression, access to information, and genuine democratic um, participation. I think that f what we need is a platform where governments can come together with civil society, because if we just leave governments to meet by themselves, 
we probably would get a situation where they end up sharing the negative ways that they've managed to clamp down on free expression and access to information. So we really, we really need a platform that is more effective than the IGF, because the IGF, like you're saying, this is the 14th edition, but we still, every time we meet, so next time we meet, would probably be at a situation where the need for solutions is much more dire than this year. So probably we need to revise the platform that brings together civil society and government to bring about meaningful engagement. Um, in one sentence, do I have a solution to this? No, I do not have a solution, but I think it's a solution that won't just come from one sector. It won't just come from the states or governments, but from several stakeholders coming together. So it's going back to this, um, this vision that started the IGF of a multi-stakeholder governance system, but that it needs to be deepened and made more meaningful and stronger. And there, there are definitely some proposals out there that do just that. But it's a, it's a, a very important point. I wonder, uh, Olga, do you, have, do you have any thoughts on this, on this question of what do we do and how do we manage this and how do we build, how do we build uh, political will to have such a system in the world where there's so many, you know, um, also in a world that is increasingly moving toward authoritarianism and uh, one that where a lot of countries really just want to control their populations from top down. How do we do that? First of all, I think that it's not only the authoritarian regimes that want to have their stand uh, and their control on the internet, but also the democracies, which is, which is very interesting because, uh, let's say, these uh, <clears throat> two different regimes would be using different um, sources under which they will be saving uh, their regulation uh, to their population, but still they will be targeting uh, uh, the same goals. I think uh, it is high time to have the alignment of the... Um, of the legal uh, framework uh, that we have and uh, of the digital space, because so far we very often tend to oppose this, uh, these two uh, uh, phenomena and to say that they have, nothing to, uh, they have nothing in common just because the cyberspace has to develop in its, in its, own, uh, in its own pace and has nothing to do with the regulation. And um, I think uh, that uh, we need uh, to make a choice that uh, it's it's only because uh, the internet is interoperable and we have nothing like interoperability in the international law when we have, uh, and also among lots of national jurisdictions. So now we have to make a choice. It's either we realign the cyberspace along the territorial borders of national jurisdictions as it is happening now. That's why we are talking about national authoritarianism, about splinternet, about balkanization, whatever you call it. Or we have to work collectively and uh, elaborate uh, uh, the interoperable framework, uh, legal framework, which would be regulating uh, these uh, uh, different uh, different types of relationships, which uh, which have this, uh, which have uh, which either are connected with cyberspace or have uh, some element, this digital element uh, in them. Uh, at the same time, I don't think, uh, like I've had at some of the panels during this IGF, that we need more dialogue, we need more discussion. Uh, I don't think we need more dialogue. The IGF is happening for the 14th year in a row now, and we had a lot of dialogue. We, have, we know all these challenges. We put them again and again, year after year, but uh, nothing is changing. We need to, to come to the uh, stage when we move to the solutions from just the dialogue and the discussions. And uh, for this, like 14 years ago, there was a lot of illusion that multi-stakeholderism can change the world, that this model of, govern of governance can be uh, opposed uh, to the um, classical multilateral model of governance. Uh, which existed uh, between the states. Nowadays, I think it's more about collaboration between uh, two of these models, because the states in themselves, they have the, the normative power, they can uh, make, uh, the, they have the law enforcement, they can make uh, the regulations uh, being implemented and, uh, and working. At the same time, the multi-stakeholder community has the necessary expertise and has uh, uh, and has accumulated in itself a lot of uh, a lot of uh, knowledge in from different perspectives, uh, from uh, technical perspective, uh, from academical, uh, from civil society uh, practice. So it has to be done all together. Let's say, for example, if uh, there are concrete ideas, not just the discussions that we leave the panels with with nothing, just concrete ideas which come up here at IGFs, let's say, 
and then they are brought back to the governments, but in some very much feasible deadlines, and then, uh, and then those things are, are being uh, set up at the regu um, regulatory level, then, then there is a way that those regulations which are being adopted, they make some sense and uh, that uh, they really correspond to the digital reality we are living in. That's, that's really helpful, thank you. Um, Efraim, do you want to say anything on this from the, the, the standpoint? Okay, well, why don't we open it uh, to, uh, or Wally, do you want to say anything on this? Yeah, go. go. Very quickly, I'd like to say what we should not do uh, uh -huh. instead of what we should do. Uh, the internet has worked very well so far. I mean, we have what we call uh, self-governing institutions. Uh, you know, the IETF, uh, for example, the domain name system, for example, the IP addresses, the distribution of that as well. And so there are standards in place that make it work function very well. It's dangerous for governments to intervene in the process. It will cause a massive rupture of the network. And not to forget, the internet itself has brought so much common good. So there's a global commons that we all share on the internet. And there's also the private goods, which countries can have through the internet access services that they provide. Let's not mix those together and lump them as one. I mean, the internet's main value was the global commons. So that's something if we remind over and over uh, to the institutions that would like to impose what is called sovereignty on the net or the cybersphere uh, would be very valuable for us to remind. That's, that's really helpful. And, it, and it's, it's kind of a positive uh, and hopeful outlook that you both have outlined here, that you all three have outlined, that we, we know a lot. We have a really important asset that we need to maintain and protect, and that we have the expertise and, and people to do it. So there's a, there is a hope for this point of view. It's nice in this world we live in right now to have some uh, ideas of hope. We have a first question here. Can you introduce yourself? And Absolutely. Um, hello, good morning. My name is Max Senges. I work for Google. And uh, I wanted to react to Olga's last observation that we have come together for 14 times and that, that, there is ti uh, that it's time to evolve the system. Um, and I um, back to understand you in that direction because you said, ah, you know, it's not working. I don't think it's not working. I, in fact, I think it's the worst system that we ever have except all others. So um, uh, it's close to democracy and, and other um, uh, means of governance that they're not perfect. But I do think um, that you touch on an, a very important point, and that is there is a growing pain that we all feel that we need to get to solutions and that we need to get um, to the next generation of internet governance. And um, along those lines, I wanted to propose that um, this topic in particular, which uh, seems to have a very strong zeitgeist and momentum, is worthy of a dynamic coalition to uh, actually organize the work on a more continuous basis than just to check in every year. Uh, having that said, I do think that the role of the IGF is to set, set the agenda, to frame the issues in a way so that we can meet after this um, session and say, okay, how, what do we actually do? So I encourage that those who are interested to actually do something gather in the, um, on the, the side of the um, panel to uh, see what we can do and then to monitor what is going on. And that was also something that I think is happening in a decentralized manner but could be much more organized than the contract for the web is in fact um, a, a nice instrument to connect a good bunch of metrics and measurements and monitoring around. Thank you. Rashid, yeah, please. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Andrew Kempling, 419 Consulting. Um, to give a slightly different perspective and maybe challenge the, uh, uh, the pre prevailing view of the uh, uh, panel, um, I, I contend at the moment that the so-called global internet is, is largely dominated by uh, sort of U.S. cultural norms and standards, and dare I say, U.S.-centered uh, companies, um, and it doesn't reflect well the different values elsewhere. Uh, so, for example, in Europe, with a, a much stronger preference to data privacy. Uh, compared to the US. Um, and so I'd argue that if, if it continues as is, um, so, the so-called so splinternet is both inevitable and necessary, uh, at least on a regional level, to allow different cultural norms 
and standards to reassert uh, themselves. Otherwise, we continue down a path of increased centralization and all-pervasive uh, corporate surveillance, uh, which I think is hugely damaging uh, for democracy uh, uh, and other values. Uh, the alternative, to give a more positive spin on it, though, uh, is that you need much more uh, international political and policy input uh, into setting things like internet standards. Uh, so the discussions this week are fantastic, uh, but most of the stakeholders here weren't present in Singapore last week when the IETF met. Uh, now, the IETF sets the te technical standards, but behind that makes its own decisions on policy. Um, so I think what would be a far more valuable development would be to have the IGF to assert itself as the client that directed the uh, requirements onto bodies like the, the IETF, rather than the IETF so acting in isolation um, and technocrats making decisions uh, that, that, that overcome the preferences of Democrats. Okay, thank you. Let's, uh, let's move over here, and we have, we have two. We'll take the next two. So you start. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bertrand de La Chapelle. I'm the executive director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. Two, two comments quickly. One, it, whenever we talk about splinternet fragmentation and things like that, we need to really, really make the distinction between the layers. What Walid was talking about in terms of the governance that functions, the IETF, the World Wide Web Consortium, and the rest, that is governance of the internet. For governance on the internet, what people do with the internet, this is a completely open space, and this is where the challenge is. Let's not touch the underlying uh, thing, and the spreading of uh, gateways and so on is indeed tampering with the architecture and we have to take into account whether this is diminishing the resilience. Even apart from the control, it is an architectural question. The structuring of the cyberspace of application, let's be honest, there is an enormous structuring of the cyberspace of applications. When you see the fight between the content providers who are setting up the Apple Plus, the Hulu, the uh, Netflix, and so on, and they have their own programming, it is a structuring. Is it a good structuring? Is it not a good structuring? You have applications on Android that do not exist on an Apple um, um, app store. These are also structuring things. What we're talking about, and the real challenge for the Internet Governance Forum, is the legal structure that applies the governance on the internet, what are the rules, what is the respective responsibilities of private entities, governments, etc. And here I want to piggyback, and that's the second point, with what Olga was saying, which resonates tremendously with what we do, because this was the main message of the third conference that we had in Berlin uh, here in, um, in June. The alternative is indeed do we take cyberspace and reimpose the exact territorial boundaries of legislations on a structure that is fundamentally cross-border, or do we go, and I'm very happy that she used the term, towards legal interoperability? And I want to make a distinction here. Just like we have um, technical standards, we need policy standards, but we need something more. We need standards for policy making, which is a different layer. It's the architectural approach of governance that is an institutional challenge. And at the moment, to finish, we are moving from techno-euphoria to techno-doom, where everything is going wrong, and, and there's only abuses everywhere, after having thought that the internet was going to change the world, just like actually people were saying about the telegraph in the Victorian internet, for those of you who have read the book. We are now seeing a flurry of initiatives for setting rules, and I'm purposefully not using the word regulation because the private sector and the governments are setting some rules, but because they're not coordinated, we're actually increasing the conflict of laws and the potential tensions. So the challenge is that we move in the direction of understanding that this is an institutional question, and how do we go towards legal interoperability is the real good question, I think, that we should address. Very, very helpful comment. Thank you very much. And we have uh, this lady. All there. right. Thank you. My name is Tobe Gilematimbe from Zimbabwe. And I would like to say that the, the, the way I see it is that technology is moving at a f very fast and accelerated rate, 
more than um, the, the way African countries are developing with respect to respect itself for human rights. So you find that where the paranoia is coming from within the African continent is specifically coming from the fact that African governments cannot stand their citizens enjoying human rights, like, for instance, freedom of assembly and association. So you find that within our context, you find that when there's going to be like a planned demonstration, for instance, it's going to be done on WhatsApp, or there's going to be a tweet or something like that, and it'll be like a felt fire, and you have people that are gathering and things like that, and that can, African governments cannot stand that. So you find that even as much as we're discussing the issue of the internet, the issue is we need to go back to the issue of how are human rights being respected within the context of African countries on, on, or whichever developing countries. Once we are able to go backwards and step back, not as fast as the rate at which the internet is developing and technology is developing, we can be able to really troubleshoot and have a much more effective discussion on how to actually uh, promote an open internet. So, yeah. Very useful comment. Do, do we have anyone on the panel who would like to respond to any of the comments that have been made so far, and then we'll take another round? Anybody? Yes, please. Kuda? Um, just a brief um, uh, comment uh, on the second comment we received about the Thank you for spinning around the argument about the splinter net. It's, it's really useful. But what I would like to say is that in as much as it's an internet developed by American-based corporations and exported to the rest of the world, the rest of the world has done what it could to make that American export very much a piece of their own thing. Look at the content that comes from Africa, for example, is very much about what's happening in Africa. So I think it becomes a slippery slope if we then say, well, we now need regional internets or things. We definitely do need content that comes from each region that speaks to the audiences there. But to then say we need it at a structural level, that might actually be a bit tricky. I, I think it, uh, the content justifies how we're using this American export. Pali, do you want? Yeah. Yes, uh, in reference to the uh, notion of uh, the layers and not to touch the bottom two layers, let's say the network layer and I mean the physical link layer. Um, the problem here is that in, in some instances, the top layers where you have the protocol and the application layers, these are beginning now to change so rapidly and so drastically for some countries to the degree that it's almost simple to sh shut down the internet and keep it in, in bound. And this is a, a typical example is China, for example, where you have a way they do and others that are very already well national, I mean, nationalized to a degree that any single app, I mean, member who is you know, posting or reading can actually be more or less uh, surveilled. And so the thing is that if we totally abandon the idea, the risk that happens in the long run and think, okay, everything will be okay, um, I mean, uh, in the, since the technology works and fine, uh, then we may wake up one day and realize, oh, now we no, no longer have any layers. It's all now becoming more and more nationalized. It's not a distant uh, possibility. On the other hand, if we constantly look into solving the top problems of the top two layers, then we can slowly begin to show the case that the, the, there is much more, let's say, to get or to gain from being a globally connected network than it is to become a sovereign uh, cyber network. So looking at them in, in a more, let's say, a combined way is always good uh, for the sake of the future. Uh, thanks, Bertrand, and uh, we've had this conversation with Bertrand before uh, about uh, the layers, and, and just to build on to what Walid is saying and, and, and Bertrand about the different layers, uh, the problem being uh, the, top, the top layer, uh, especially the content, uh, uh, legal uh, interoperability than harmonization because various countries have different um, uh, legal uh, and social uh, histories, so we can't say harmonization, we'd rather interoperability. Uh, and uh, on, 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 on the issue about um, the infrastructure layer, that's where now we think, I think we need to fight more together in a uh, multi-secular manner, uh, that um, we ensure that we remain united, because the, f the, the more united we are, the better 
our companies operate, the better our work as, 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 as human rights defenders, as, as governments is in terms of uh, coordination. So that's something which I, I'm just trying to spark a conversation with Bertrand uh, on, on um, a previous conversation we had recently. Yeah, just, just a two finger. One on Walid. I didn't mean that one should be prioritized over the other. It's, you're absolutely right that the two should be continued. I just highlighted the distinction. Uh, and and in the second, on the second comment, I want to reiterate something that is extremely important is legal interoperability is not harmonization. It is not harmonization. It's precisely the opposite of harmonization. And the bottom line is that we need to do for the set of heterogeneous governance frameworks, public, private, to make them interoperable, what the protocols for the internet and the protocols for the World Wide Web did to create the internet and the World Wide Web, the TCP IP enabled heterogeneous networks to be interoperable, HTML, HTTP enabled heterogeneous databases and information structures to be interoperable. We need protocols for interoperability in governance systems. Thank you, first of all, for a very interesting talk. My name is Veronica Thiel. I'm an associate with a local NGO called Algorithm Watch. Um, really interesting things coming up and brains going really fast. But first of all, the notion that the internet is self-governing on a certain level has just been recently disproven by the fact that the .org company is being sold off and nobody really had any say in that what happened there. And I can somehow lifting the price restrictions for .org domains. The accountability there is not there in the sense that who, do, who got to vote on it, so to speak. This is very much driven by an American or neoliberal for-profit motive, and we haven't sorted that. But coming to something that Olga said about um, you know, not only authoritarian governments using these kinds of measures, um, for me the question is, is there a way, or is it even legitimate, to say, we can shut down certain parts of the internet in case of national emergency. Um, and the abuse example I'm going to give there is in 2011, the riots in London when I was living there, um, the government shut down the BlackBerry network, messenger network, because it was said that all the rioters were organized through that network. And obviously, that's the same thing that people did, China did in Hong Kong. And you can't really do that if you claim this to be a democracy. But on the other hand, you can argue Yesterday, we, um, at the discussion around spread of misinformation yesterday afternoon, there was somebody from Kenya, I think, who said the spread of rumors is so malicious that we have to do something about it. So how do we square that? Is there a way that we can use criminal law to shut down, you could argue, criminal association via network messaging like happened in the riots in London? Oh, yeah, exactly. So what, what kind of measures can we take that ensures we keep the balance between freedom of speech, freedom of assembly expressions, and so on and so forth, while shutting down clearly malicious, threatening movements that use the internet? Thank you. Good question. Um, do we have one more? Or yeah, yeah. Where did that come from? You here? Oh, yeah, so let's go down there first. Yeah. Thank you so much. My name is Adrielli. I'm a lawyer from Brazil. And I thought it was very interesting, a comment by Olga that she highlighted between the difference uh, of government, uh, democratic governments and tyrannical governments that they all use, uh, web, uh, use legal instruments to suspend the internet and etc. So my question for all the panelists would be, um, what, how is, how the suspension works, so in terms of legal aspects, as I'm asking as a lawyer, because in Brazil we also had some suspended services uh, for not complying to judicial order, for example, because of encrypted messages. They were, not, uh, um, they were not given to the law enforcement. And then the judiciary suspended an application. So my question would be, how is this division between the legislative, the executive, and the judiciary when they suspend internet services. Okay, one more uh, with this gentleman right here. Hi, Vittor Bertola. Sorry, I was prompted to join the discussion by Bertrand's comments uh, because, well, first of all, I, I'd really like to make a point that this matter is really different depending on where you come from. So uh, I appreciate the point of view of, of the African people here and why they, it's like that. From the European viewpoint, I think it's still exactly the opposite. So the pressure we now see in Europe to restore some kind of 
national sovereignty over the internet is exactly because we feel like we have been losing democracy in Europe because of the, the fact that several things are now decided by American companies outside of any reach of, of our democratic institutions. And uh, there were, actually, there, there were, there, I mean, in, I was in another panel in which uh, there was uh, this person recounting the fact of an, an African immigrant in Germany being harassed because of a picture that was post, posted on Facebook with hate comments and, and no one being able to take it off because Facebook insisted this was behind, inside their terms of, of, of their community standards and no one has a say in Europe on Facebook's community standards. So, so that, that's exactly the point. So I'm, I, I agree with Bertrand, we could look for, let's say, an international way of making legal interoperability work. But I think we, as a, we as an internet community, have, we've been involved in this, we've had 15 years to, to get to here and we, we failed. So I think now this is why there, there is outside pressure on the internet community to do something different and I don't think we have time to wait for another international solution. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna let the panel Respond quickly, we'll start with Olga, since the question is often directly to you. Yeah, just quickly about the shutdowns. I don't think that uh, shutdown is uh, a right response at all because um, it's very often happening in uh, the situations in, and in the context of, uh, of conflicts on the, uh, of, in the countries uh, which are not, uh, why not really everything is going smoothly. That's why uh, when you shut down completely the network, of, of course you might have the very good uh, target uh, as, as the government. You might uh, want to, to stop uh, spreading uh, the, uh, the hate speech or the, like, uh, to stop uh, people who are involved in the terroristic activities uh, talking to each other, but at the same time you are blocking uh, the ways uh, to talk to each other for other people who might be in danger in this, uh, in this same situation and they also lose maybe their only and uh, last uh, resort, last hope or how they can connect to each other, how they can communicate that they are safe, or maybe even this, uh, this type of communication could uh, save uh, somebody's lives. That's why I don't think this is an option. Even, uh, even the blocking is not an option because for that case you will always find the circumvention tools and, uh, and uh, that just makes, uh, in many cases, makes the population uh, much more... Um, poses it much more on the other opposite end uh, to the government and uh, makes them even like more angry with, with what they can expect from the government. There is no trust, while there should be trust between, uh, between the government who is supposed to represent the citizens and like the citizens who could expect the proper level of protection for themselves. On the question about the, uh, how it is um, from the executive and judicial point of view, I mean, uh, the state is the state. Whatever, laws it, whatever laws and rules it puts uh, into play within their country, they have to be observed. That's why this is happening. And it's good at least when it's happening through the court, not only when it's happening by the executive decision uh, or like voluntary law accepted, because uh, at least when there is a court, you have some more hope that this is going to be happening in a more legitimate way than just by the executive order. Bobby, do you want to... Um, just to say that it's necessary for us to understand that uh, the uh, cyber so cyberspace sovereignty is, in my opinion, not possible. Not possible because of the reasons stated below. So what is necessary is for states to be seen as a stakeholder in this process for a global good that would allow both uh, the user and the state to both be represented. And there are different models to do that. And this is, the IGF in itself is one model that where we can take. There are no easy solutions, but to consider it as a state responsibility only is a very dangerous precedent. Ifan, do you have anything? Um, so just uh, on the content uh, issue, I would propose on the issue about legal operability, uh, use of mutual legal agreement treaties, MLATs, the system works when it comes to other criminal issues or other issues that are not criminal, uh, extradition and, and stuff like that. So if someone um, uh, does a crime and is hiding in a country that is in the system, the MLAT system, the, it, that works. Uh, why wouldn't that work in, in this uh, uh, global digital age, I think it's something which we need to use more uh, when it comes to the content issue. But then uh, when it comes to the uh, infrastructure issue, I will, uh, my, my previous comments are uh, stand. Um, I, don't, I don't really have anything in the way of closing remarks besides what I've said and what has been well shared by other panelists and I thank you. Um, for allowing me to be here. I yeah. a well, it, it, I just want to point out that two of our panelists are from the Open Internet uh, Leaders Program that we set up as part of the Open Internet for Democracy initiative, and it, uh, Olga and Kuda, and it shows 
that there are leaders from all over the world that can participate in this debate, and we're trying to increase the number of voices from the global south and other parts of the world that come to the IGF, that are part of this process, that get their perspectives in, and who can learn from each other about how to manage these very complex issues. And we want to try to expand that community of people because their voices can really help change the way this internet is governed. We all, I think, recognize that it is not ideal at the, at, the, at the current time, and we need to find ways to improve this system and make it work for humanity. And that's what we've been trying to work on here, and I really thank the time that you've spent with us. Thank you for the time you've spent with us. We hope we can continue the conversation afterwards, and do visit the booth if you want a copy of the principles and, some, and to learn about the work that we've been doing. Thank you so much for coming.
Test, test. Ah, this seems to be working. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks so much to coming to this roundtable on how to really do AI governance beyond voluntary ethics frameworks. Um, I want to extend a special welcome to the three panelists for the roundtable, Vidushi Marda of Article 19, Bernard Chen of Microsoft, and Vicky Janssen uh, of the um, Data Justice Lab. So my name is Corinne. I'm a PhD student at the Oxford Internet Institute, and I'll be moderating this panel for you today. Um, and the session is going to be structured as follows. We're going to start off with a bit of a short primer, um, contextualizing the, content, the contention around AI ethics, um, having a bit of a look at the debate uh, on how to govern and regulate AI systems. And after that, each speaker will take about 10 minutes to give their views. This is followed by a short panel discussion uh, between the panelists, and then we'll open up for Q&A. Um, so to get a bit of a sense of the current discussion, um, a recent quote, the relevant discussions of ethics are based on almost entirely open-ended notions that are not necessarily grounded in legal or even philosophical arguments and can be shaped to suit the needs of industry. These are choice words coming from the most recent report of the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, who questions the efficacy of ethics as a framework for AI governance, arguing that it provides little accountability while cementing the needs of industry players. He's obviously not alone in voicing these kind of criticisms um, about what is often dubbed as the turn to ethics in the debate about what normative and legal frameworks are best for AI governance. Um, AI ethics, as it seems, is, going, is undergoing its own tech-lash moment right now. And some of the critiques leveraged is whether these fr uh, frameworks and councils can ever lead to real accountability or are a sufficient preamble to regulation. They also argue that ethical frameworks and councils can be fuzzy, uh, lack shared understanding, are easy to co-opt, and don't really foster uh, actionable corporate accountability. At the same time, there are many others who argue we should not throw out the baby with the bathwater, uh, and that when done right, these kind of frameworks actually do provide a very solid base for which to think about the problems that AI raises in our societies. Now, it's clear that, if anything, this is a very contentious discussion, and that's why we're all here today. Um, and the discussion is particularly timely given the increased use of automated systems in very society-critical um, spheres, like healthcare, like policing, like the judiciary. Now, what we're going to do in this roundtable is try and focus on three things. So the first is we'll discuss the recent surge in ethical frameworks and self-regulatory um, councils for AI governance. The second is we'll talk about some of their promises and pitfalls. And then finally, we're also going to discuss some other strategies and frameworks, including those based on human rights law, as a viable alternative for or addition to discussions about ethics. Um, what I'll do is I'll ask each speaker to introduce themselves. And with that, I would like to give Bernard the floor. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to have a conversation with all of you here at IGF. My name is Bernard Shen. I'm an assistant general counsel at the Corporate External Legal Affairs Department of Microsoft. I'm on a human rights team uh, working on human rights, human rights issues that intersect our products, services, and technology around the world. Turning to the subject at hand, when we consider how we should govern AI, one question that occurs to me is, do we have to choose between ethical frameworks on the one hand and human rights law on the other? Are ethics inherently voluntary? Is it optional? For example, unfair discrimination is unethical, but it is also often against the law. Are human rights only respected and protected by laws? Again, for example, anti-discrimination laws prohibit unfair discrimination. But are those laws alone enough to help advance and protect the rights of a vulnerable population? Perhaps one way to think about this is that ethics are referring to our conduct, what we do and how we do it. Human rights refer to the consequences of that conduct, the consequences to the people and their rights. They are connected 
as connected as two sides of the same coin. I ask, can conduct that harms human rights be ethical conduct? Or does ethical conduct inherently mean conduct that respect and protect human rights? Let's consider a simple example, someone driving down the street at the maximum speed limit allowed. So the driver is obeying the law. But then the driver sees somebody, children, playing up ahead on the street. She immediately slows down. Now, is that a matter of the law? Or is that also an act of ethical, responsible self-governance? AI is a tool. And as a tool, whether it does harm or good, depends less on the tool itself and more on the human hand that wields it. And as a tool, AI can and is used in almost anything and everything that we do. Why is that? That's because today's AI, modern AI, almost always involves machine learning. Using math to look at an incredible amount of data, too much data for the human mind to comprehend, to study, to see, and to deduce kind of the hidden patterns and insights in the large quantity of data. But computer science and math can help us see those patterns. And with varying degrees of mathematical uh, confidence, generate some predictions, mathematical predictions. And we take those learnings and predictions that the machine and the math provide us to help us humans do tasks that we as humans define or make decisions on questions that we as humans pose. For example, in farming, how do we be more efficient, less wasteful? In medicine, how do we find cures more quickly or make more accurate diagnoses? For the environment, how do we better pre preserve the natural resources that we have? So it really can be used in any fields there where there's an increasing amount of data and help us gain insights and make better decisions. But the challenge is, because there are so many possible uses, each type of use presents a different context. And the ways to use AI in each context in a way that's ethical, responsible, and rights-respecting may be very different. And because it is so contextual, we really need to think about these issues with a context in mind. And I'm going to use one context to kind of walk through it a little bit. And that's the use of facial recognition by government authorities. Let's imagine five scenarios. Scenario number one, you're participating in a protest march. The government is using cameras and facial recognition not only to identify you during the march, but also to identify you and track you wherever you go afterwards. How do you feel about that? Scenario two, if you have a driver's license, you've gone down to the driver's license office, have your photo taken, they have it on file, and now, let's say there are crimes uh, being committed by someone, video cameras capture an image of the suspect, but they don't know who that is. Should, they, should law enforcement be able to use facial recognition technology compared to unknown image against all the driver's license photos to find a match, including your photo? Scenario three, a government has lots of sensitive government buildings, sensitive data, should it require all the employees who use smartphones, computers, to protect those devices with uh, facial recognition, not just password, because password can be oversimple, can be guessed. So you have to use face, you know, uh, facial recognition to lock your devices. Or when you enter a building as government employees, should they say, we have all your photos on file, you can't enter the front door until you show up and have your take picture taken matched to the photo on file. If it's really you, then you can't enter. If not, then you probably have to be further checked out. Passport control. In the good old days, when you enter a country, you talk to a person, you hand over your passport, they look at you, they look at your passport photo to see if it's really you before you can enter. Now, more and more in many countries, you don't get to talk to a person. You stand in front of a terminal, you scan your passport, they scan your photo, there's a match, and you probably never even talk to a real person during that entire process. Scenario four, this is a bit heavy, but let's say you have a friend, a family member went missing, and there's reasonable suspicion that there's kidnapping, maybe tr human trafficking involved. 
you gave the photos of your loved ones or your friend to the police, they have it. They're trying to help find this person, save this person. Should they, be able, should they be able to use video cameras in all public places, airports, train stations, and capture images of people going in and out and compare it to the photo of your friend or family member to help find your friend or family member and save him or her? Last scenario, scenario five. You're a music lover, you are going to a concert, a big, huge stadium. But police authorities have reliable intelligence that a terrorist group is trying to target this event with a bombing. They have photos of the members of this terrorist cell. Should they be able to use cameras at the entries and entryways of all, at, all this, at the stadium and look at everybody that come in and compare, to the compare everyone to the photos of the, of the members of the terrorist cell to try to stop them from entering the stadium. So just a quick note, you know, if you think about these scenarios from a technical standpoint, from a technology standpoint, there are really two things going on here, two different types of facial recognition. One is verification, one is identification. Verification means it's, it's a one-to-one -one comparison. You know, we already have the photo of a known person, someone presents himself or herself at that person, and you want to make sure it's really him, really her, before they can unlock their computer device, before they can enter a building, before they can enter a country. The second technological use is identification. You have a captured image, but you don't know who that is, and you're trying to identify that person. And somewhere you have a database of photos with known persons, and you're trying to cap compare that unknown image to all the known images to see if you can find a match so that you can identify that person. But you know, regardless of the math, uh, technological difference of what the comparison is, the question comes back to, in each of these and many other scenarios, how should governments use this technology? Should, should we rely on self-governance by tech companies that provide this technology to governments to help prevent governments from misusing this technology? Certainly, tech companies have a role because you know, we understand the technology, we know how it works. We can help the government understand what it can or cannot do. When is it reliable? When is it not? And help steer them away from inappropriate use. In fact, you know, Microsoft has publicly gone on the record that we have turned down some, uh, re without identifying the police authority, but acknowledge that we have turned down opportunities because we felt that the uh, proposed use was not appropriate uh, given the state of technology and the circumstance involved. So yes, tech, tech companies certainly have a role, but the problem is even if some companies try to act, responsibility, act, try to act responsibly, there will be, if you have some other companies that do not, then you still have a problem because they would still be ready and willing to provide the technology to governments and, and use the technology in ways that the public, we the public, find unacceptable. So we also need the government to regulate itself with thoughtful regulations on all of these use cases. But we also, as I mentioned, the tech companies also have a role. We, we also need to uh, act, engage in self-governance to have policies and guidelines and the two kind of work hand in hand because laws enact quickly and they often get outdated quickly because the technology develops very quickly. And if we develop a, a law that covers today, today's technology and today's scenarios, the technology so, moves so fast and the law would, would, would fall behind. And so it's also important that both governments and the tech companies that develop and provide the technology have policy and guidelines to think about new scenarios, evolving scenarios, how to address it, and longer term, more new laws may be needed. So let me close with something that Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella wrote in an article in June of 2016, uh, where he talked about the partnership between humans and AI. He said the most productive debate isn't whether AI is good or evil, but that, and I quote, it's about the values instilled in the people and institutions creating this technology, unquote. So when societies enact laws, or when we have international laws, those laws often reflect the values of us human beings. 
but values are more than laws. They also inspire and guide us to self-govern, to engage in responsible ethical conduct, conduct that respects and protects human rights. So what we need is all of us in this room and beyond, all of society to be involved in these conversations. Conversations to figure out thoughtful laws to regulate the use of AI, self-governance policies and guidelines for responsible conduct by governments, by tech companies that develop the technology, and by all the institutions, whether it be government, private, nonprofits, or any other institutions that implement and use the technology in so many different contexts. We need everyone at the table to have these conversations. Because ultimately, these are conversations about our values. How we connect the ways we use the technology tools that we have to our values. I look forward to having these conversations with you today. Thank you. Thanks, Corinne. Um, for my initial uh, intervention, I'd, I'd, I'd like to throw Oh, sorry, I have to introduce myself first. Hi, I'm Vidushi, I work at Article 19 um, on machine learning, where we focus on both tech spaces like the IEEE, uh, but also in policy discussions um, and sort of try and bridge the gap between language and um, assumptions that underpin both of these um, stakeholder groups. So for my initial intervention, I'd like to throw out four provocations to the group, just to add texture to what Bernard just said, but also for us to um, have a more critical understanding of the space in general. Uh, so the first is, machine learning is not always appropriate for social, um, for social purposes. So for instance, there's a lot of talk about how data is really effective and how machine learning can look at a large amount of data that no human can. But I think a big part of this puzzle is that maybe we shouldn't be using machine learning for many, many instances where um, the, the system oversimplifies socio-technical problems and tries to reduce them to mathematical uh, formula. So that is the, I, I think, ethical frameworks at the moment don't fully engage with this complication, which is what we're finding, where you can say we want transparency and equality and we respect privacy, but at the same time, you can be undermining a lot of social um, problems, but also making discrimination worse and social problems worse. So that's the first provocation, that it's not always appropriate, and that is a piece of a puzzle that ethical frameworks at the moment don't fully engage with. The second is I think there's a false dichotomy between ethical frameworks and regulation, because one is not necessarily the replacement for another, uh, and neither is it, I think, constructive to think about ethics as a preamble to regulation. What ethics affords us is an idea of this is where we want to be, this is what our conduct should look like, but it has no bearing whatsoever on this is what happens when we don't behave the way we should. So in a sense, it's, it's kind of a jigsaw puzzle where we say this is where we want to go and this is what we can do. The part that says this is what we can do is regulation. And it doesn't make sense to have ethical frameworks in the absence of regulation because there's no incentive to um, effectively follow these ethical frameworks. Um, ethical frameworks don't have teeth which means that there is no consequence to not following them. And again, if we really want to be effective with ethical frameworks, then having regulation is a prerequisite to it. It's not necessarily an either or situation, it's not a before or after, it must exist um, in tandem if it has to exist at all. The third uh, provocation I'd like to throw out is that ethics affords a sort of exceptionalism to machine learning that I don't think is fully merited. And what I mean by that is, Ethical frameworks assume that machine learning should and shouldn't do something, or artificial intelligence more broadly should or shouldn't do something, but we're not going back to first principles of law. So a lot of the questions we have around facial recognition and credit scoring are found in constitutional law, they're found in consumer protection, they're found in data protection, but because there's this new, quote unquote, really complicated technology, we suddenly go back to the drawing table without really engaging with existing regulation that's already in place. And the problem with ethical frameworks currently is also that they're built 
mostly in opaque closed rooms by people who design and develop these systems, but not necessarily people who are subject to their deployment. So what happens is you're subject to a system and you're not fully sure how you can appeal it because there's no mechanism for it. And the only verifiable public statement that you have are ethical frameworks which you can't appeal and you can't fully understand because there's no one meaning of transparency, there's no one meaning of privacy, there's no one meaning of accountability. And the last is, I think, only having ethical frameworks is more harmful than not having them at all because they also offer a shield of objectivity when there is none. So, so a company, and it can be any company, um, can say, you know, we have an ethical framework where we believe in transparency and accountability and privacy and we respect, um, you know, non-discrimination, for instance. And it, it almost gives the company the right to, uh, you know, move fast and break things and see how systems function without engaging with the actual social cost of these systems uh, because there's an ethical commitment in place. In the absence of this ethical commitment, we would have regulation and actual verifiable accountability mechanisms that any system should, should um, satisfy. And I think ethical frameworks buy time, which I think is extremely harmful. Um, I'd like to end also by saying, I think it's important to remember that human rights are an ethical and a legal framework. So I think the false dichotomy is also particularly dangerous because it discounts the ethical normative importance of human rights frameworks or rights-based frameworks in general. And it would be more helpful to think about it in terms of, well, ethical frameworks are enough, but do they invoke the right kinds of regulation, existing rights in first principles that we already have? I'll stop there and then I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fudushi. Um, hi, I'm Fika Janssen, and I'm a part of the Data Justice Lab at Cardiff University. Um, and I would ask anybody to reframe if you're tweeting to use the um, Data Justice hashtag because they're currently on strike due to austerity measures in the UK against uh, the higher education system. So uh, they don't want to cross the digital picket line. And I think with austerity, so I'll be, um, I do research into how police in Western Europe is using data and technology and sort of what the new social questions are. Uh, and before this, I spent maybe 10 years working as a practitioner on issues around and data privacy, digital security, data protection. And I sort of, um, I think we'll piggyback on a lot of things that Fedushi said and maybe ground them a little bit in the context of Europe and also in the context of public institutions in Europe. Um, because I think there's so many like things we should uncover. Um, having spent a lot of time in the tech scene talking to technologists, I think it's very important that we start unpacking all the discourse around AI and especially around ethics and AI, because there is this presumption that AI is already here and sort of people just use it blanketly for everything from basic statistical modeling to machine learning. And I think this is creating massive problems because on the one hand, it's not here yet and it's not like implemented blanketly in public institutions in Europe. Uh, but it also creates this in idea that we can't do anything about it, that it's sort of already happening and we just have to roll over and die. And maybe we can like mitigate the harmful issues by creating ethical frameworks. But I feel like this is a false sort of narrative that's being created. The other thing I also see is that the way people talk about public institutions is if there's, they're stupid, there's no knowledge inside of them. And, um, sort of, uh, they have no way of regulating this. And I feel like this is just all overstepping the fact that we have a lot of laws in place that also apply to AI. And this idea that law is slower than AI, I feel it's a fallacy that's coming from the people who are creating these systems to prevent us from actually applying the laws that we have into a context. Um, so I'm trying to unpack these things with a few examples. Um, and it's, it is, I think one of the issues is that we, look at AI and then look to society, whereas we also can look at society and then try to figure out solutions which probably are not AI. Um, so <clears throat> um, I'll go through some examples that I'm seeing like on the ground in practice. So I think one really interesting case has been sort of DeepMind in the UK and that they had access to uh, healthcare information of um, people, of like patients of the NHS. I think they had like access to 50 million uh, or like a few million records. Um, and according to the actual regulation that was governing 
uh, access from companies to this data, uh, the NHS made the right decision because this data is given for uh, innovation R&D projects all the time. Whether it's the Philips to develop a robot arm to like assist in sort of uh, operation rooms, or whether it's for like uh, trying to figure out a treatment. But maybe there's nothing wrong with the regulation where you say should companies get access to um, pseudonymized data of patients so they they can sort of develop new tools and technologies to help us solve a problem. And I think uh, they were in their rights, but the problem is that in this they didn't look that Google, so the, or Alphabet, the owner of DeepMind, is a data company and their business model is to actually um, analyze data and sell this for a commercial purpose. So I think like we have to open up these frames more to take into account the context and the business models of the people, of the companies who are uh, getting access to this data to train sort of their algorithms and figure out solutions. Uh, and as we saw, there was immense, immense, massive backlash. So once it became public, once the Guardian started reporting on the fact that the NHF gave data to Alphabet, um, it was a massive backlash. And in the end, uh, Alphabet pulled out. So DeepMind pulled out because of all the controversy. And I feel like this should be a societal debate. Do we want companies, big tech companies, to have access to our very private information? But it wasn't a public debate. Um, so this is a point that there is regulation. We just have to revisit it. Um, then with my, with my um, case studies on policing, where I actually talk to police, so also about facial recognition, I think the interesting thing is what they do themselves as well, is some are inverting the process. So when you look at risk taxation or all the examples that were just given about should facial recognition be applied in these contexts, they're sort of relatively easy ethical questions because Nobody's standing up on behalf of the people who get targeted. But what one of the police officers, when I was talking to her about risk aversion, uh, risk taxation, said, what if we apply this device? So what if we apply this to identify uh, perpetrators and victims of um, sexual misconduct? How would we feel the police intervening preemptively in people's lives? Because what are actually the actions we can take on it? Can we preemptively take off offenders off the street? Can we preemptively go into a victim's house and say, there's a highly likelihood you would be sexually um, harassed, raped, or something else in, a, in the near future? And inverting it to another problem than the standard problems all of a sudden makes these uh, questions far more pronounced. And they also said, we don't know if we actually should be the actors doing this. We don't know if police should be doing this. Whether if we talk about the same problem with high impact crime, so it's burglary, robbery, um, identifying terrorists, everybody will... There is a, a sense where people say, yes, we can do it, but inverting it to a different problem all of a sudden shows the issues that also apply in the case of terrorism and high-impact crime. So I think uh, in these debates, I think we sometimes have to challenge it by inverting it. Uh, I think we also have to unpack where this entire ethical debate is coming from. If I look, for instance, at uh, ethics uh, discussions in Europe, a lot of it is also funded and supported by the companies who are creating AI. And I'm not saying that the things that are coming out of it are influenced, so I don't say the content is influenced by these companies, but it is putting, they, they, by putting money behind it, we're, create, we're setting the agenda that we have to look at ethics instead of regulation. And I think we have to sort of uh, be critical about this. Is it bad that they're spending money on this? Maybe not, but then why are not governments spending money and figuring out if the regulatory framework should be different? Because there has to be sort of a balance in this. Um, so I think when we look at all of these uh, talks about ethics and like how do we govern AI, we have to unpack it. What are the interests behind it? Because uh, what I see in policing as well is that there's a lot of money usually made available after an incident happened in society and then we ask the police and they're like, oh, so what do you think about this money being made available, for instance, to implement facial recognition or something else? And they say, oh, we just have to do something to show the public that we care, but we actually don't know if it's going to work. And I think so sort of we have to unpack what are the drivers that are driving the implementation of this on social problems of technology. Um, who are the creators? Because yes, what are the values of the people who are creating AI? But if you look at all the tech companies, uh, there's <laughs> It's quite a homogeneous crowd who are creating this. Uh, and so it, are their values actually the values that are shared across the world and the values that we all hold into account? So we also have to be critical about this. Um, 
we normally don't take context into account. Things that come from one place, we just assume that will be applied everywhere else, whereas maybe the ethical guidelines of the EU wouldn't apply in other contexts, or they would. But it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, and I think, um, I think we also start, should start having discussions about what are the red lines? What are the places we actually don't want AI to be implemented in? So is it like uh, we, don't want them, we don't want it implemented in identifying fraud detection in welfare schemes? Or do we, there's certain areas where I think we don't want technology be, be implemented if we can't be sure of what the drivers are to do it. Because if it's another austerity measure, this is a problem because in the end, what we're seeing with a lot of these AI systems that they're sort of penalizing the poor, marginalized, and uh, other groups. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Right. Uh, thank you all three for this excellent provocation. So there seems to be um, quite a number of topics that keep on uh, coming up. So the, the limits, but also the, po the possibilities that these frameworks provide. And the question of context. So I think one of the, one of the first com, uh, questions that comes to mind is there are currently uh, many of these ethical frameworks, 70 on my last count. Um, some of their principles contradict, some of their principles overlap. Um, and considering sort of this mushrooming of, of ethical frameworks and the importance that all three of you stressed for context is how do you make sense of these principles from your respective sectors and their contradictions. I think current ethical frameworks, I mean, we've touched on this a little bit already where there are certain deficiencies, but I want to pick up on something Fika just said, which is, we talk about machine learning systems being discriminatory and being built by only certain sections of society and being um, particularly dangerous for vulnerable communities, whether it relates to your gender, your race, where you live. I think the ethical AI field um, kind of makes those systems a microcosm of what the field actually is. So on one hand, we're in a room saying these systems are discriminatory and they only work if you're a white man and they never work if you have darker skin or if you're a woman. But the same is true for ethical frameworks. They work in the areas in which they're built and they're harmful in, in contexts that haven't been considered in the room. Um, and I think no matter how many ethical frameworks we've seen, I have yet to see one that meaningfully engages with the difference in context and the harm that it can create. To give you an example, um, a lot of credit scoring algorithms around the world look at you know, things like how many times do you leave your house? Do you go to the same place every day? Does that mean you have a steady job or not? That wouldn't work in a country like India because a lot of people, you know, a lot of women in many parts of India are not allowed to work. They don't get to leave home. Um, and that fundamental proxy is inconsistent with the context in which it functions. But that is not engaged with at the, at the level of ethical frameworks, right? So a system could be systematically discriminatory against a vulnerable section of a particular society, but ethical frameworks do not engage with the complexity that comes with it. So while there may be 70 at this moment, I'm, I'm, I, I don't feel the need to make sense of all of them. <laughs> to be honest, because I think they say the same thing in different ways and in different permutations and combinations, but they don't actually meaningfully change how these systems are designed or developed or even deployed. So I think the 70 ethical frameworks, I think my, so what I'm seeing from, uh, when, when you talk to people who have to implement parts of them or like think through them is that uh, what it obscures is one thing is like the question of should we actually implement something to begin with mm -hmm. so with the question of facial recognition if you see how police are experimenting with it in uh, the UK um, actually for me all of these uh, things that were suggested like uh, can you identify if the right people is walking in the building can you see if a terrorist is walking into a football stadium can you do other things most of these things can actually be done by other police work uh, or other sort of type of work like having somebody in the front door to sort of uh, that recognizes people so for me it's like uh, this drive for innovation first we have to see what it's actually substituting and because we're having ethical discussions uh, this is how do we how do we maneuver it 
in the best way we will see fit without actually asking the question why to begin with. Um, and then the other thing is sort of with, uh, we've also seen this with human rights impact assessment, privacy impact assessments. When it actually comes to the ground where people are implementing, they usually, what they do is they, or well, I've seen some of these privacy impact assessments and you can see that people just basically Googled it because nobody gets training in these police departments on, on actually how to do a proper impact assessment. And the question of whether or not we should implement technology is never the question. So then it's like, how should we implement it? How do we get it through the bureaucracy? How do we make it compliant? Um, so one thing is having these ethical frameworks, but then the other thing is also how do we, how do we, sort of implement these at a lower level scale of uh, government um, and public institutions. And then for me, what is uh, quite like difficult about these ethical frameworks and what I've seen for a long time in the tech scene is that there's no responsibility. It is quite an impunity for things when things go wrong. So uh, we've seen it so many times also when uh, Google launched their facial recognition algorithm and it identified African-American people as gorillas and they said, oops, sorry. And this is sort of the consequence when things go wrong, whereas for the people it can be super super stigmatizing and very horrible, and especially when you apply it then in the context of police, where does the responsibility lie for when things go wrong? Uh, and I think these are the discussions that are sort of not being had because they said like, oh, we went through all the right processes and procedures. Um, so, so yeah, it's also a question about responsibility. Let me make two overall points. First one is, you know, do we need these ethical frameworks? I think we do, because as I think reflected in my opening comments, I don't think law alone is enough. Uh, you're right, there are a lot of ethical fr frameworks, a lot of AI principles, and, and one could be spending an infinite of time to sort through all of that. And I, I guess I would think that that's probably not the best use of time, although you, need, you do need some sort of ethical, ethical reference, because law alone, why is law alone not enough? Uh, a couple of ex examples. I, I don't know how many of you have heard of this law, but about motor vehicles. In the UK, back in, I think, 1865, I could be wrong, there's this Locomo Locomotive Act you know, motor vehicles were very new and evolving then, and there was a law that says when a motor vehicle moves down the street, you have to have a person walk in front of it waving a red flag to warn everybody else, horse carriages, people walking around that the motor vehicle is approaching. It's a safety measure. And I, I think that law actually lasted 30 some years before it's repealed. Obviously, you know, it wouldn't make any sense today. You know, a lot had advanced both the laws and, and safety features in cars and, and the operation of motor vehicles. And, you know, you look at cars today, do they strictly adhere to the law as the minimum and that's it? Certainly, it has a lot of safety features, safety features that require the law, but many cars also have safety features that go beyond, beyond the law. You know, why do they do that? Because maybe because they understand that people desire safety and the law, the minimum required by the law is maybe not, doesn't go far enough. So in order to earn the trust of customers and the need for safety, they provide features that go beyond what's required by law. Uh, and you know, it, I think about Microsoft, it's you know, just us as humans. You know, when we conduct ourselves, we don't just conduct ourselves in a minimum in terms of what's required by law. You know, we, we have ethics, we have morals. And the people at company, I think of colleagues I work with, they come to work every day, they don't park their values at the door. They bring it with them. And, and so they as humans want, care about doing the right thing, not just the minimum required by law. And also, it's like I said, it's a matter of trust. Nobody's gonna use our technology if they don't trust us. People don't wanna use things they don't trust. So to earn that trust is not enough to do what is required by law. We have to figure out what it is that we're doing in what scenario, in what context, what's reasonable, what's responsible, and try to meet that expectation. You know, otherwise, we don't earn that trust and we don't keep that trust. Uh, about data, I wanna make a comment about data and discrimination. That's, that's a important topic to talk about because it's really central. As I said, modern AI often involves machine learning, and, and like any science, any technology is not perfect, but it does make important contributions. And um, as to whether AI is here, 
I think that's a reasonable debate. From, from where I'm sitting, from what we're seeing, AI is already here being used in many fields. Machine learning is used being, being used in many fields. And it's absolutely correct that there is the risk of discrimination. And with machine learning, what it is, it's critical, the data that we use, there was a study uh, where they found that after crunching the data, they found that people with asthma is actually uh, less likely to die of pneumonia. Very counterintuitive. And the reason they found out was that ultimately after consulting with medical experts, they found that the reason is because if you are an asthma sufferer, you're probably gonna get much more immediate medical intervention being checked into the hospital when you're sick. So the chances you actually die from pneumonia is much lower. So they figured that out and understand why the data make that prediction. Then the question then is, well, should, should they take out that data point about people having uh, asthma uh, so to, to, in terms of deciding the risk of dying from pneumonia? And the data scientist finds out that no, you don't want to do that because when you remove a data point, all the other data fields are already affected by the fact that some peop those people have asthma. They are already kind of polluted. And the, the effect is hidden. And if you remove that data point now, why the data is skewed is opaque to you. It's actually better to include more data so that you can account for that abnormality. So it's really critical that you have good, thorough data because if you omit some data, you have externalities that you're not counting for, blind spots you don't see, and the predictions that the machine learning give you are bad. They're not accurate. They're less accurate from flipping a coin if you omit, omit a lot of important extern externalities. But then, you know, I also hear the concerns about privacy. I mean, that's the conundrum. In order for the machine learning to be high quality and pr produce prediction that's highly accurate, you need a lot of different types of data and a lot of them. You know, if you have a, if a, a, if a bank trying to make loan decisions, they only include data from past applicants, people that they grant loans to, and they are all, you know, uh, Caucasian, male, uh, et cetera, then this, that prediction model is probably going to skew towards only favoring people that are also Caucasians and male, and therefore, if you're female and of other races, you probably don't get as good a chance of getting granted a loan. So it's really important to test your data to see whether it is representative so that the machine learning is fair and reasonable and actually account for and address those biases. But then it, it, the conundrum is if you want, want more data, you have to address privacy concerns because people are understandably concerned when you use a lot of data. So we need to address people's concerns about data protection and privacy. And again, not only comply with laws such as GDPR, but also think about what is truly responsible practices so that people can trust that as we use that data, it's being used in a responsible way for their benefit without violating data protection laws or invading their privacy. Yeah, just to quickly pick up on some of the things that was said, I think the, the example of the flag in front of the car, I think, is that the Lotum, Locomotive Act? Um, that Bernard talked about. I think it's fundamentally different in the case of machine learning because in the case of a car, you can see the car, and if a car hits you, you will definitely feel it. And if you've been hit by a car, you know where to go to say, I am hurt here, or I am bleeding, or hopefully you're still alive. The problem with artificial intelligence is that it is more often than not intangible. You don't know you're being subject to a system that has reduced you to a data point, and you don't know who to appeal to. Um, even if it's in the case of a state-deployed artificial intelligence system, even if, you apply, uh, even if you appeal to the state, it's often said, well, the, the system said this, we didn't say it, and we don't know why the system said it, so you can come and appeal to us every time you're wrongfully denied a service, but we can't actually tell you why you were hit by that metaphorical car. So I think it's fundamentally different in the case of systems that you cannot peer into, that you cannot see, and that you cannot control, and that are subjectively and selectively made and built by certain stakeholders only. Um, the second thing about machine learning um, is that I think it's a great tool if you want the future to look like the past. It's a fantastic tool if you want to replicate the past into the future and be efficient and quick while doing so. It's not an efficient tool when societal complexities are in the fray because I think 
regardless of where you stand politically or socially or whatever discipline you know you come from i think it's safe to say that we don't necessarily want to repeat social discrimination mistakes from the past and the problem with machine learning is that it obscures these very complicated systemic human problems into a simple data point that then become a reflection of what we want a good decision to look like in the future so i think while in the case of health uh, you know there are enormous benefits to be had i think there's also a huge danger because there's enough research to show that there are only certain types of people who have been able to access healthcare in the past um, that overlap with certain types of genetic problems or not that overlap with how male versus female um, patients are treated and and all of these institutional realities and human pitfalls that data can never um, i think fully capture and i think being mindful of that regardless of how representative your data is it's still a reflection of one human interaction that is almost always harmful to those who have been disadvantaged already um <clears throat> yeah and I, i also would like to uh, pick up two points one is uh, the point of trust that uh, ethics are a way to build trust but if you look at a lot of the technology that we use and we actually think of the companies behind them you can question for yourself if you actually trust them and the answer might be a bit in the middle that you might have a little bit of an uneasy feeling about it because we all use these big services and we all know that they're not that respectful for our privacy for instance so trust is not a one dimensional thing usually trust is a multi dimensional thing take uh, google for example your gmail they're very secure they also uh, look at your data so it's not like a, a a one way or one thing fits all it's a very complex process of do you actually trust these companies behind it so i don't think and then the question is also what you can do as a user or like as an individual who then gets subjected to these systems so i think trust is maybe not the right wording um and then also when we talk about accuracy this is very common like in the fatamel discussion about how like how accurate can we make these systems can we make them less biased can we make them less discriminatory for instance uh and also if you look at some of the principles behind these ethical guidelines they're about privacy they're about sort of um uh things like this like accuracy but also if you look at uh the european guidelines on trustworthy ai the first thing is actually that it should be lawful and then you can question what is lawful because it's always happening in a context even if you have the fairest system in the world or the most accurate system in the world it might actually not be applied very fair so if you take a look at for instance um facial recognition or uh, fraud detection in welfare systems they always target they in their piloting phase they usually target specific parts of cities specific cities and not the general population so there was just a um a lawsuit in the Netherlands uh, against Siri which is a fraud detection uh, algorithm for uh, welfare fraud and it was only tested in six areas and these were very low income areas because the government has the most data about them so also like even if this is an accurate system even if they actually uh, predict it it's only applied to one proportion of the population and not to the others so is that then fair so we have to look at the situation in which they're being applied to and then also about like um the there's somebody in the room here who was involved with the creation of the uh, EU uh guidelines on trustworthy ai and i think uh, from the civil society perspective also a lot of criticism has been um who have been part of this process have have been raised about sort of the process about how these guidelines were created who was in the room uh how it's being applied currently because now we have these very beautiful guidelines but it's still questionable if they will actually also be implemented in the eu horizon 2020 ai funding so then if we have them are they actually being applied across the board by the eu so there's so many questions also around these ethical guidelines and i think there's a lot of knowledge in the room as well i'm curious to hear about all of this but i think just looking at the technology itself is too limited um so that puts me to sort of the last question that i would like to ask of the panel before we open it up uh to the rest of the room which is clearly there are a lot of outstanding um questions that need to be asked and context and how to make sure that um that is taken into account in any kind of discussion is one of them and i want to try and sort of ask all of you what are some examples of frameworks of regulation of organizations of actors that you feel are getting it right so can you speak a little bit to debates that you see that you feel are going in the right direction and why that is the case and and what we can learn from that here today tablik
Um, so I've been in a room a few times with Fiducia. I think uh, she's raising very important points. So I think Article 19 is raising some very critical issues. I think Access Now has been involved with a lot of ethical uh, debates. I think they're also pushing for human rights standards and they're doing critical work. Um, it's, I think it will be interesting to see how the San Francisco or the uh, California facial recognition ban is going. Uh, so what are the implications of sort of these types of legislations? Uh, so I think it's like there's a few actors that are very interesting to follow uh, and then see how they will play out. Yeah, I think uh, I agree about the California ban on facial recognition. I think that was the first instance where we saw the existence and the inevitability of machine learning truly being questioned by a critical, you know, through a critical discussion. And I think that's where we need to go because treating these systems as inevitable means we necessarily give up some amount of critique. And I think that is very dangerous given how um, sensitive and how profound the implications are. Um, I generally, um, think that if, if we're going to look at these systems and not treat them like this silver bullet to social problems and not treat it like this extremely complicated robot that might kill us and just look at it for a socio-technical system that must adhere to first principles of law, whether that's international human rights law or constitutional law or consumer protection or whatever body of regulation that is actually verifiable and actionable, I think there's a lot of space for that. I, I don't think enough of that is being done, uh, which is a big um, you know, gap in current discussions. But I think, yeah, I agree that we need to see how these bans and things play out, but I think just questioning inevitability and looking back on what we already have and not treating these systems as magic would be a great start. I think instead of citing any particular conversation, I think it's just important that we are having them. Uh, as I said in my opening comments, we, we desperately need any and all of these conversations so that we can uh, surface all of these concerns, anxieties, and issues and questions. There's no exception. Every new technology that comes upon the scene through the ages, if they are major, they create fundamental challenges, fundamental changes to society, uh, and um, we need to figure them out, and it causes a lot of concerns and questions. It could also cause a lot of harm because if you rush into it too fast, then you put your blinders on you and you don't see the problems and you cause the problems. So when it comes to sensitive users, users that could cause harm, you know, Microsoft for its part certainly um, advise caution and proceed with caution to have conversations to figure out where the technology is, what the circumstances are, to use imagination to figure out how could it co go wrong, who could it harm, and how can we mitigate that risk and address that risk. Um, certainly, when Fiduci talked about uh, whether people know they're being harmed or not, I think that goes to the point of transparency. Uh, I didn't have a chance to address that in my previous comments, but we one of our one of the AI principles of Microsoft is transparency. If, if the use of a technology is so big, you don't even know about it, and yet it affects you, uh, the companies that develop technology or the organization that implement it should be transparent, it, transparent about it so that you know uh, at an instinctual level how it's affecting you, you know, whether it's a loan application or a job application or whatever context it may be. You, you have a right to know how the operation of that technology is affecting your rights. Um, but I, I, you know, the most important thing to have constructive conversation. You know, if you, when you talk about bans, sooner or later this technology is advancing and organizations are using it. And they use it not, you know, I hear the point that somebody may be trying to demonstrate that they are trying to look good to the public. Maybe there are those scenarios. But, Equally, there are a lot of scenarios where organizations are using it because they believe it can help them make better decisions that benefit people, and they're experimenting it and using it and finding it, it can indeed, and it does help them. So this is happening. The question is, how fast does it happen? How thoughtful we are about letting it happen? And as I said in my opening comments, you know, must we choose between ethical framework and the law, human rights law. 
Because you really need both. You really need it all. Because anything that you can help you figure it out, you need to look at it, incorporate it. That's a responsible, constructive way to move forward as a society so that you can take advantage of uh, new technology that, after all, is the product of our human ingenuity. Data scientists comes up with it, and responsible, ethical people come up with a way to use it to benefit people. And people in government figure out responsible way to have thoughtful regulations to mitigate uh, the risks of, this, of these users violating people's rights. So everyone has a role, and everyone has a constructive role to make sure that it is being used in a responsible way that benefits society. Thank you. And on that note um, of the call for constructive conversations, I would like to open it to the floor. If there's any questions, I would also like to ask you to briefly introduce yourself and keep your question uh, snappy, as there are many. Um, I'll start from the right-hand side. Thank you. Um, I'm Veronica Thiel. I'm an advisor for Algorithm Watch. We've compiled a global inventory of AI ethics guidelines. At the last count, which hasn't yet been published, we found 106. As Vidushi said, uh, we're not really that bothered with looking at the, extre the exact content of it because they're all broadly the same. What we found absolutely startling is that um, there is next to no um, evidence of any sort of self-regulating enforcement. So what happens if somebody within a company that has a shiny dancing, singing AI guideline is not adhering to it? There is very little information out there. I think we found six, roughly, who have anything like that. So in other words, it seems it's more of a fig leaf. The other thing and the question I would pose to the panel is, um, how long are we going to talk about AI ethics as if this were something completely new? Corporate social responsibility has been around since the 1960s. We're still struggling to get companies to adhere to certain principles of like you know, child labor, environmental um, carefulness, and all that sort of thing. At the moment, the AI, the ethics discussion is discussed as if it is something completely new, whereas the basic principles of do no harm is really not that hard to understand. And Google, after all, started out by saying do no evil. So yes. Um, for me, it's not a discussion whether or not we should have AI ethics. For me, it's a discussion about how we're going to get companies to finally adhere to standards that we all seem to be agreeing on. That is a good idea. Thank you. Um, I think, like, I agree it's completely nothing new. Uh, what I do think is that uh, we should also celebrate the things that people are actually doing that are uh, not related to uh, ethics. So, uh, for instance, um, even though they didn't completely win, I think it's very important that Liberty, for instance, took the South Wales Police to court for applying facial recognition in it. And this is actually then trying to, because there's no, at the moment, no real legal framework to govern the use of facial recognition within the UK. And so they're trying to push for the creation of new legal standards, not ethical standards, legal standards. And I think, I think this should be one celebrated. We should also acknowledge the fact that this is a very long process that Liberty is uh, going on. I also think that in this we should question where the money is coming for, from, from the South Wales Police to do it, because in any, any other sector uh, that has been hit by austerity, if then from the central government you get a tech budget, of course you're going to use it and apply it, and this is what we're seeing in the UK police landscape, is where they've been hit with massive austerity, and then the Home Office has said, here we have a, a police transformation fund that you can use for tech innovation. Uh, so uh, even well, everybody in the NGO scene also knows that as soon as there's money for AI and ethics, we're also working on AI and ethics. It's just because like, this is the way the world works. And so while I think it's very important what Liberty is doing, I also think we should question the Police Transformation Fund at the same time, because they are creating the enabling environment for uh, police to implement these type of technologies. So I do think there's a lot of things, other things happening. Yeah, I, I just, just I can't speak for other companies because I'm not familiar with the internal process. You know, we Microsoft has AI principles, and we have process and procedures to rever to review business scenarios to make a decision whether we should proceed or not. And there have been, uh, you know, I can't talk about private confidential instances, but there we have made public acknowledgement of a police request scenario where we turned down the request. You know, we we take that very seriously because. 
principles are not principles if uh, the revenue involved, you know, we go after revenue and sacrifice the principles, then it's not principles anymore. So we, we do hold ourselves accountable to review, have procedures in place, review business opportunities to see is this something that we feel live up to our principles and whether we should proceed or not. And, you know, we should help hold ourselves accountable and uh, society should hold each other accountable in terms of uh, government regulations as well as private sector companies that develop the technology and the companies that use it. Hi, I'm Guru from IT for Change. Uh, I think all the panelists agreed on the principle that legal framework is essential. I think everybody agreed on that. Even the example of the car safety, the ethical possibilities are beyond the legal requirements and they do not substitute the legal requirements. So I think that's a point. And I didn't know there are 70 ethical frameworks, but recently uh, the JustNet coalition of which IT for Change is the part came out with principles for legal framework creation. And I just read out five of those principles, which are very relevant for deriving legal frameworks that will work for everybody. Principle one, data subjects must own their own data individually and collectively. So the whole issue of ownership of data is very important, even though the private sector collects it, does it own it? And who is able to derive value from it and who is able to exploit the data is an important consideration. Two, our data requires protection from abuse. Three, we need the tools to control our data. Four, data commons uh, need appropriate governance frameworks. And finally, data production, sharing, and use require new institutions. So I think legal framework, institutional frameworks are absolutely essential if we need uh, AI to work for us in an ethical manner. And ethical frameworks are a part of the whole thing, but we need to go far beyond that. I have the principles with me. If anybody's interested, they can pick it up from me afterwards. Um, Anupam Guha from Center for Policy Studies, IIT Bombay. I am essentially an AI policy researcher. Uh, first, I would like to thank the panel for at least acknowledging that regulation is at the key of this debate, and that's, that's new. But one word I was trying to, like, I was hoping to hear one word, because it has been a very critical panel, and that word has not yet been heard. It's capital. So rights... Uh, include the right to life and the right to equality. And uh, machine learning systems are ultimately systems which uh, amplify and make efficient current modes of social relationships. So when are we going to start talking about material power, about intelligence, influence, control, and most importantly, wealth? And who are these systems helping? So an, uh, an analogy was made of cars. Well, uh, many people who are into economic history like me know that the prevalence of cars, for example, in the United States of America, was not due to them organically being better than, say, trains. These were very contested political things. Lobbying was involved, Chase Henry was involved, and ultimately you have a reality where uh, people who have the wealth to buy cars are privileged over people who would probably require public transport. Um, I'm not saying that's what the AI situation is, but it could become like that. We are seeing a lot of function creep in the country where I come from, India. You see uh, often code precedes policy. You have uh, artifacts being made, being peddled to state, being peddled to private actors, things like facial recognition, which was mentioned, and then those things become the de facto standard, and then policy catches up later and tries to play eight dimensional chess to justify the world that already exists. So when are we going to start talking about influence and material wealth? Because I think that's central to the question of any rights-based framework. Thank you. Yeah, I fully agree, Anupam. Thank you for that. I think when we think about artificial intelligence systems, there's always a focus on the stage of deployment when it already exists, when someone's denied a loan or someone is wrongly identified. Um, and I think if we're going to reserve our critique to that system and to that stage, we're always going to be too late. And thinking about the origin, the conceptualizing, the design, and then the development and testing, and then deployment, I think you're absolutely right. If we follow the money and follow the incentives, it's a much more effective way. Okay. 
Uh, okay, uh, Tiago Moraes, uh, wearing two hats here. One is a researcher from Brazil, which is particularly uh, interested in the topic of facial recognition because this has been implemented in my country for a while, since 2011. But also as a representative of the European Data Protection Supervisor, which I am currently working. So my question is to Microsoft. First of all, uh, I feel very relieved to know that a giant tech like Microsoft has decided to consider ethical principles before accepting business opportunities with government institutions. Particularly, I was pleased to see some public statements from the company, such as the commitment to honor California's privacy law, the CCPA. My question today is, well, I would like to know what's Microsoft's approach in other commercial relationships, most particularly B2B and B2C relationships, and, for example, I give facial recognition. If it's being provided by Microsoft, I don't know, but if it's being provided by Microsoft in any B2B or B2C relationship, what are the conditions, the contractual uh, relate, uh, clauses or whatever that's being uh, uh, proposed by Microsoft to ensure that its service will provide minimal safeguards to protect the privacy of its customers? Thank you. Yep. Um, with regard to facial recognition, including the, in, in addition to general AI principles, we have also principles on the use of AI that includes fairness, accountability, transparency, uh, and specifically also law enforcement surveillance use. So those are the principles we go by. You know, is the is the facial recognition fair? So, for example, if the data is uh, biased and representative, such as suggested earlier and have a high error rate for people uh, of color or, uh, or for different gender, then it, it is not fair and it would not be appropriate to use that technology. Uh, and also transparency. For example, if you are using uh, the technology to scan everybody in public, should there be some notice uh, so that people uh, know, know that technology is being used? So those are the questions that I think not just Microsoft internally need to consider, the public should have the conversation because it affects everybody and, and it informs all of us if we have those conversations to uh, arrive at a norm. You know, what is it that we in society expect? Because on the one hand, law enforcement that are acting in good faith, they are trying to protect all of us, public safety. And public safety is a human right too. You know, we all want to be safe and protected from harm. You know, that, you know we. You know, in these conversations, we should not forget about that. But at the same time, we don't want to sacrifice civil liberties and other rights and, uh, as we pursue the protection of public safety. So we need to have those conversations, not only within companies alone, but as a society, as to what is it reasonable for the, for the police to do? Because in the absence of that, then a government is left on its own and to figure out, you know, when is it that they can engage and use this technology uh, to pursue law enforcement and protection of public safety. But if those conversations are had, and we go through all those scenarios, not just the ones I mentioned, then you know, either that becomes law, you know, at some point maybe it's not a ban, maybe it's some permitted use to say that police, yes, you can use it in these cases, but in these cases is not allowed. Even, though the, even if the technology could put conceivably used because society believes that it is not the right balance between public safety and people's civil liberties, we would not allow it to proceed. Hi, my name is Idonje. I'm a data scientist working in Sri Lanka and across South Asia. Firstly, I would like to thank Lavika, I hope I didn't massacre your name, for um, pointing out that perhaps people have watched a little too much Terminator 2 and uh, that there are different modes of explainability and different granularities to this. Um, Going by the discussion of uh, some others as well, there seem to be a few problems uh, clashing at the table. And the first is the demand for explainability, the need to understand the black boxes that we live under. Um, the second conflicting with that is anti-competitive law, where some countries let their corporations say that this is our secret source and that we can't reveal it. Then the third is, of course, the issue of bias which exists in every system, 
a machine or human, and it is mathematically impossible to engineer a system that does not have some error rate in making addition between any two given groups, unless it is a condition of perfect prediction, which we don't, we don't live in that world. So what I'd like to ask, because you have been studying the laws and the conversation on this, is why is nobody talking about accreditation of systems? Because if you take a machine learning system apart, uh, we should be able to examine the data sets, critically interrogate the biases therein, study the shape and distribution of the data and the categories therein, and discuss whether these data categories belong to uh, revealing information on protected classes of people or not. Um, and even if we do not uh, expose, expose the black box itself, in a machine, given a machine learning system, we should be able to feed it enough input perhaps synthetic data in instances where feeding it actual data is unethical, examine the outputs, feed it enough different distributions of input data so that we can judge its responses under different conditions and make a judgment. And potentially to look at what a human error rate is, is what we consider acceptable in a particular domain and then test this system critically against a human, against that, given, against that uh, sort of accepted error rate and then make a judgment on whether to use this system or not. Um, is there a conversation on doing this? Because this is practically possible with the level of technology and with the legal structures we have today. Explainability is still theoretically on a very mathematical level, it's still a pipe dream. Um, is there a conversation on this? And that is the first I'd like to ask. Um, I would like to ask that tough pretty much anyone who would like to take it. Um, the second is a sort of general comment uh, addressed to Bernard from Microsoft. Um, the libertarian ideal that companies should be able to regulate themselves and have done so is perhaps a little naive. I understand that Microsoft has many good faith attempts and that you do not leave your morals at the door when you walk into work, but you're not the only people doing this stuff. As a case in point, right now there is a, a particular company that has brought something to the parliament in my country saying, we have solved hate speech. Uh, it's, it's this Norwegian company that's doing AI. So we asked, well, what's it doing? They haven't the slightest clue, but it's a Norwegian company, and therefore it is AI. Right, this is the level of conversation in many instances, and where you potentially stop and say, no, this is unethical. And the Californian thing is hilarious to me because it was California that banned facial recognition. It was Californian law enforcement that requested facial recognition of Microsoft, where you potentially say this is unethical and stop. Another actor sees a business case and says, maybe I can put a system there. I think that also needs to be addressed, particularly in the global south, where a lot of these systems come into play without ever being discussed in fora like this. I, I absolutely agree with you. I, if, in case my early comments were unclear, I, Microsoft absolutely believe that regulation has a place. And you cited an example that, you know, if some companies act responsibly, you could have the scenario where others don't. So regulations absolutely have a role to play in making sure that there's responsible use of AI. Um, I want to quickly check off some of the other questions you raised. In terms of black box, I would just say that we need to remember that um, while we absolutely should be concerned about transparency of machine learning or new technology, we need to consider that before we have that, when let's say in the good old days of pure human decision making, uh, that is not necessarily that transparent either. Uh, you know, yeah, loan abso applications. Absolutely, right? which is why the right. subject is being broached in certain circles on the technical front, because a doctor testifying in a court of law mm -hmm. is not his testimony may not necessarily even be understood by the judge, but we look at their accreditation, we look at their history of work to understand whether this man is evil or not, and perhaps can that process be applied? Right. Yeah, when you have a human decision maker making a decision, that decision could be biased and discriminatory. It could all be, also be unconscious. The decision maker may not even know that he or she is being biased. So the point I want to make is that Machine learning actually could, if used wisely and constructively, it could actually help address that problem because of the presence of data. You mentioned error rate, and 
companies that develop and organizations that implement this technology have the, both the opportunity and the responsibility to try to address error rate, to address that opaqueness of a pure human decision maker that we used to live with, and, and, and do testing. Because machine learning is not just the development of a decision a prediction model. You test it. You test it by, for example, the following. If you're trying to make loan decisions, you look at, you certainly don't want to repeat and perpetuate mistakes of the past. But with machine learning, one approach that data scientists share with me you can do is you first build a model based on historical data. And then you uh, wisely create a test data set of a, a wide spectrum of loan, applicator, uh, uh, loan applicants with varying degree of background, income level, ethnic groups, gender, et cetera. And then you stress test that model that's based on the past and see how it did. And when it came out that it just most of the time deny loans to minorities, to female, et cetera, et cetera, you have very strong empirical evidence that the historical model of the past has a problem and it needs to be addressed. So, I mean, there, ma machine learning and AI can be a force of good if you use it responsibly and creatively. Uh, and then your point about, I'll close by addressing a point about accreditation. In connection with facial recognition, Microsoft has proposed that in order to address this very sensitive use, that companies, tech companies that provide this technology make available public API, application program interface, so that anyone, any researchers can access the system that's developed and stress test it with data to see how it does, so that it verifies where it's accurate and where it's fair and unbiased. So I think that's absolutely critical. We need to find ways to uh, allow people to gain that trust, whether that technology is being de developed in a way that address error rate and bias issues. Um, I think the argument that we can make machines less biased than humans because we can see where the bias comes from, um, I think it's an interesting academic exercise, but I still stand by what I said earlier in that you cannot teach a machine um, how to feel and you cannot teach the machine what discrimination looks like and what past discrimination um, is because of in systemic inequality. So I differ a little bit and I think we may be oversimplifying it by saying we can point where the discrimination comes from. Um, to your question about where, um, you know, to, to your question about like understanding black boxes, I think Cynthia Rudin has done fantastic work to show that using a black box algorithm is not necessarily better than using a more scrutable algorithm. Um, I think the accreditation system, I don't know if I've seen something specifically like that, but impact assessments are becoming increasingly popular. Um, I think, however, the problem is that it ends up becoming a game of whack-a-mole. So you assume that, okay, this could be bias on the basis of gender, and then you fix that, but given the, the huge amounts of data sets, you never know how a system will function and what it takes up as a, um, you know, a di discriminating factor. Well, actually, you could, because there's significant I, work. I want to be a little bit mindful of the number of questions in the room and not make this too much of a background yeah, for sorry. We ask you to take it up over coffee. Sorry, I just want to counter with that saying no, no, you could. Of course, I just also want to make sure everyone gets heard. I'll stop there so other people are heard. Uh, maybe can I say, add one more thing? I think uh, this is... A, when you sit in the sort of the fat melt or the fairness accountability and machine learning community, there's a lot of this. This is often the rebuttal where there's like humans make mistakes too. So who makes less mistakes? Is it machines or humans? Uh, and then how can we make machines make less humans? But it's a false dichotomy because these machines and humans interact together. So it's not like usually the mistakes get added on top of each other. Um, and then uh, maybe a call out to the room if like anybody knows any implementation of AI that are actually for good, come find me afterwards because I haven't found one yet. Uh, so because there's always a lot of issues around it. So I think while we're all very critical about the use of AI, especially more in the sort of academic and NGO circles. I do think that it would be interesting to figure out the cases where it's actually used for good. Maybe it's like spam detection, or maybe it's like more infrastructure related, because I would like to see these examples and then explore them to actually think like, what, are the, what is then so good about it? So that was my comment about like a force for good. If you have examples, come talk to me. Um, in which case, I know that a lot of people are having to go to other panels, so we can entertain one more question before we have to slowly uh, head off. 
And so, hello, my name is Mariana Gomez. I come from Brazil. I am a, a student of journalism over there. And as a youth IGF, I would like to ask you guys um, that we are as different mood stakeholders, which world we want to build, really? Because right now in my country, I see a lot of, um, a lot of initiatives using AI, especially, um, to discriminate and to reinforce racism over there. We are facing a huge problem with our security, uh, public security policies. And I would like to suggest for all stakeholders uh, at this panel, and that maybe we should um, look for different strategies. And one I, I, I'd like to suggest to, for you guys is the one called intersectionality, um, built um, through these experiences of black women in African diaspora. But it's something that is already being used um, in law in the law field, but it needs to be spread because when we think about intersectionality, we don't think about uh, especially um, what, are, what, what is the profile of a person who is being discriminated, but we look, uh, we tend to look to the structure and look into the structure, we can, um, we can address uh, humanity and I think that uh, there is something that needs to be reinforced in humanity, and intersectionality can help us to see the blind spot um, where we are thinking on companies and civil society demands. Because as a young black woman in Brazil, I'm really afraid of the use of AI um, for some new kind of colonialism, and that's it. Yeah, I think you're spot on. And you've said very eloquently what it took many people years and years to say, which is that an intersectional approach is absolutely necessary. And it's hard to do, but I don't think that should stop the, the conversation from going there. And I think uh, fairness, accountability, transparency, and machine learning in the last three years, I think, has come a long way from looking at solutionism and coming up with technical definitions of various um, you know, of fairness or transparency and looking at how it interacts with different intersections of society. So thank you for that. You, you, what, what you said really strike a chord with me because uh, Microsoft believes that this technology should be for everyone. Inside the company, we use this buzzword of de democratizing AI. But what it really boils down to what it means is that this technology, technology shouldn't be confined to the rich and powerful, the biggest institutions. If we can make the technology available so that any organizations with an idea on how to improve people's lives, how to have responsible use to data to build a prediction model, not to have the machine blindly apply the decisions, again, just to a sidebar, you know, you, Microsoft, one, of Microsoft, one of the things that Microsoft emphasizes is that humans need to be in the loop. It's not a false choice between either or all. You only rely on the technology or you rely on humans. You really need both. Machine doesn't know what's ethical, but humans do. That's why when you test the model, you stress test with good test data, you look at the results, and people of good faith see the results that minorities, female, are being done denied loans, it would recognize the bias and would push and call for changes so that the institution that's actually making those decisions would make changes so that they can become more fair. And we want all institutions around the world to be able to have access to this technology so that they can apply good faith, responsible, and beneficial use. Uh, and that could address, partly go to address the concern you, you have. In terms of, you know, I, there are so many examples of good uses. There's one example that I recall. I want to cite it because it's not even used by a huge institution. There's an organization called PATH, P-A-T-H. Uh, I don't really know a ton about it. I just remember reading it some time ago. One of their projects to, to, is to help uh, address the problem of malaria in, in Africa. And they did a project in, in a country in 
African, I apologize, was too long ago, I don't remember all the details, where they use machine learning and, and analyzing data to find out ways to use medical supplies and treatment and patterns of diseases to predict where they need to direct their efforts to be most effective. And I believe, I could be wrong about the precise data because I don't have perfect memory, but I think the scale was, before they started, the infection rate in this region or in this country or this part of this country was like 50%, like one in two people gets malaria. But after using machine learning and be more uh, effective in applying their efforts in medicine and treatment, I believe the infection rate went down to one or two percent. One or two, one or two people in a hundred as opposed to one in two. I would say that for those 48 people, it makes a difference. I think they like the fact that they've been helped. So I would suggest that this is technology that is beneficial. Absolutely, there could be problems, but we, and we absolutely need to use laws, ethics, guidelines, policies, whatever we can come up with to help us so that we use it responsibly because it can bring benefit when we do that. Um, on that note and that important call to take an intersectional uh, lens from the, the youth coalition here at the IGF, I hope you will all join me in thanking our speakers and I hope that this will result in many interesting conversations over lunch.
Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, hello? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Do you hear? Can you hear me? Okay. It's not really loud, but. Okay, so welcome to this session. Um, this is um, to, to, to present and discuss um, a process that Euridic, the European IGF, has uh, launched at its uh, last meeting in June in, in The Hague in, in the Netherlands. My name is uh, Thomas Schneider from Switzerland. I'm the, the chairman of the Euridic Association, which is like the organizational backbone of, of Euridic, kind of the, um, and uh, so the idea was uh, Euridic was held a few days, Secretary General's high-level panel report was uh, published in June, so um, there was a feeling that there should be space to discuss, comment, analyze, agree and disagree with the content of, of that report and in particular, of course, with the content of the recommendations. And then Euridic decided that we'll uh, open a, a window on the website uh, to uh, comment on the report. And there were two ways of commenting, so people could either comment in a generic way with a, sending a, a document that was then published as a PDF format uh, or on, on, uh, in the way they wanted, or they could comment on every single paragraph electronically. Uh, there was a comment function where you could say, I like this, or this is important, or this is missing out something, and so on and so forth. So that was, that was the process uh, that was launched um, after the Euridic in, in The Hague uh, until early October, mid-October, people were invited to make comments. And this session is now here to, to present you uh, give you a little bit of an overview on, on what we received. There, you find it, everything online, of course, on, on eurodic.org on the website, and there are some copies of, of a, a paper synthesis document uh, on this. And it was, it was important for us that we would design this as an offer for people to talk to each other. It was not meant to act as a gatekeeper to channel or, or influence or manipulate any content, it was really, the attempt was to, to give a space. Other spaces have, have been added, like there was a, a, a similar exercise done by the IGF Secretariat, and, and also in, in other spaces there were, there were opportunities to discuss. And so the, the only thing that, and with this I will hand over to, to Mark, was to try and synthesize the whole thing in a way that it's digestible, but it, it was, the attempt was not to modify or, or do anything to the substance just to make it accessible and make it readable. With this, I'll hand over to, to Mark Carvel, a former UK government representative, now um, in, 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 the, uh, in his free area of his, of his lifetime, and we are very happy that he uh, was willing to support us uh, in this exercise, in this fundamental role. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Thomas, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great gig last night, uh, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, and really appreciate your uh, coming here to, uh, to listen to our uh, account of the uh, consultation we did on the report. Maybe you ought to play Wish You Were Here again to get some more, <laughs> get some more people in. Anyway, um, so uh, I was uh, very pleased to help the Eurodig uh, team out at the invitation of Sandra and Thomas with preparing a synthesis of uh, the responses we received to the consultation, as you said, during, uh, during August to October. Um, we received 
about 25 responses, um, which is pretty good, fairly, fairly diverse. Uh, we, the European institutions responded, uh, the Council of Europe, European Commission. We also had responses from uh, a number of, uh, of European governments, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, and uh, my former colleagues in, in the UK uh, government. <clears throat> we also had contributions from two national ITFs, Croatia and uh, Ukraine, and also a number of non-governmental organizations, uh, such as uh, European Broadcasting Union, RIPE NCC, the uh, regional internet registry, and uh, also a number of uh, broader international NGOs uh, provided inputs, which we very much welcomed. European stakeholders uh, participate very actively in those international NGOs, so that was a valuable contribution. They were valuable contributions for us to receive from ISOC, uh, International Chambers of Commerce, and INTA, for example. So, um, what I've what I've done, as, uh, as Thomas has described, is kind of pulled together uh, primarily main areas of, of agreement uh, in, uh, amongst all these uh, responses to the report and, uh, and its specific recommendations. Now, there are, we do have actually a few physical copies on the table here. Maybe, did you mention that, Thomas? Yeah. Uh, but also, of course, it's online, as you said. Um, I, I don't uh, plan to go through everything in, in detail in our relatively short uh, session, but I'll just uh, highlight a few key, uh, key uh, points. Um, and, and generally, the response from, from, from the European stakeholders was one of, of great support for the initiative of the UN Secretary General in convening a, a diverse high-level panel of experts and it, at a very timely opportunity given the, uh, the change in digitalization across the world, rapid uh, evolution of new technologies, AI of course uh, in particular. So the report was very much welcomed and um, in particular stakeholders welcomed the, f the focus on achieving greater inclusivity through universal uh, affordable access so that nobody gets left behind. That was a, obviously a very important, valuable uh, objective for, for the panel and, and, uh, and the work of the, of, of the panel in, in devising recommendations on how to achieve that. And also the report's focus on ensuring fairness, and respect for human rights and security in the online world, very much uh, welcomed. And crucially, crucially, that the development and the implementation of digital technologies should be undertaken in a sort of holistic, balanced, transparent, accountable, and human-centric way. All these were, were messages uh, of the panel which uh, the respondents to the, to the consultation greatly welcomed. Um, the, the stakeholders also responded in, in welcoming the emphasis on the importance of flexible, multi-stakeholder, multidisciplinary uh, cooperation through flexible, inclusive, agile processes and mechanisms. So again, very much uh, supportive of the direction uh, and the approach taken by the panel in emphasizing multi-stakeholder approaches that uh, you know, have achieved have, have, so, have achieved so much since the WISIS back in 2005 and have become institutionalized in a way. And we, we, we witness it here, of course, in, in Berlin at this uh, fantastic uh, IGF here hosted by uh, the German government. Um, and stakeholders strongly supported the recommendation of, of looking at where there are deficiencies and gaps and strengthening these existing processes and uh, institutions and mechanisms and not going down the road of creating new ones. The, the panel stuck to its intention not to do that and that was very much appreciated by, by the respondents to the consultation. Um, 
<coughs> I'll turn now specifically to, to the, the issue of architectures for global digital cooperation. If, if, uh, if you've seen the panel, uh, the panel's report, you see that it sets out uh, three possible architectures for, for di di global digital cooperation. Uh, firstly, the IGF Plus proposal that everybody has uh, not unexpectedly focused on here at the IGF. And that, uh, just to recount briefly what the panel are saying, they're saying that there are deficiencies in terms of uh, effective, broad participation, particularly from governments and, uh, and uh, business. The IGF Plus will try to address that and also ensuring that there's more and broader participation from developing countries across the world. Uh, the IGF Plus concept also sets out some additional sort of functionality, if you like, in terms of specific um, uh, new mechanisms within the IGF uh, structure. Uh, policy incubators, cooperation accelerators, an observatory and a help desk. So, the, the response from the European stakeholders is basically yes to support that uh, approach to sort of updating and revamping the IGF through addressing those problems about uh, not fully inclusive uh, levels of participation and, and looking at how to produce effective outcomes that could be actionable perhaps elsewhere. I mean, the IGF is actually as you probably well know, has moved in that direction already with the, with the best practice uh, fora and, uh, and uh, the dynamic coalitions, all that work. It's, it's, it's in the direction of producing more meaningful outcomes from the valuable dialogue that takes place in all the sessions and workshops at the IGF. So the panel uh, was respected, I think, in terms of looking at, at the IGF and moving, that direct, moving it in that direction a bit further with some additional functionality. But of course, that does raise the question of how the financing of the IGF can be undertaken to, to support that. It's, it's, all, it's well acknowledged that it's been a bit of a struggle to finance the IGF as it's currently devised, relying on donor contributions. Not enough uh, business uh, stakeholders coming forward to step up to the plate and support, <coughs> support the IGF with, with financial support. And there could be more governments uh, doing the same as well. So this additional functionality uh, of, the, of the IGF in, in the IGF plus concept is going to really bring that whole challenge into sharp focus and some of the respondents uh, to the consultation by UADIC noted that there's got to be work in terms of ensuring greater financial sustainability of, of the IGF. The other two options um, didn't uh, receive much support from the stakeholders. They were, if you recall from the report, this uh, concept of a distributed co-governance architecture, co-gov, as it's, as it's uh, styled, uh, which would be, a, as I understand it, a horizontal framework structure of cooperation through a system of, of networks and support platforms. Again, with a particular focus, as I understood it, uh, on, on ensuring that uh, technologies from start to finish, from the design stage right through to, to implementation, implement uh, norms and, and uh, values that uh, uh, everybody is expecting in, in terms of, of internet uh, and digital uh, technology development in the future. So a kind of loose coordination approach is what uh, COGOV uh, is, is uh, an, uh, conceptualizing. But as I say, not much support for that. Maybe uh, there's a need for further clarification of exactly how such a, an architecture would work. The third option uh, was uh, described as a digital commons architecture that would synergize efforts by governments, uh, civil society, and businesses to ensure promotion of sustainable development. Uh, there was <clears throat> no support for that, uh, really, other, other than interest in, in how that concept might, might be developed. Um, the sort of analogy <coughs> with uh, the law of the sea and, and so on, that this uh, uh, would, would try to uh, draw on, was not a convincing one uh, in, 
to, to most, uh, most of the respondents who commented on that specific option. So the, all, all the respondents pretty much went for the uh, IGF plus proposal and uh, we'll see how that conceptually will develop and how the challenges of financing it will, will, uh, will be addressed. Um, I don't think I've got time to go through all the other recommendations in, in the report. I, I would just highlight that uh, under, under, under one, uh, with regard to access and uh, digital public goods, there were, uh, well, access, full support. Under digital public goods, questions about what the scope of that would be. This is recommendation 1B. Um, 1C on digital equality, women and marginalized groups and how to, uh, how to deal with that in, in terms of a call for all stakeholders to address this issue. Widespread support, no question about that. Metrics under 1D, um, again, uh, there was obviously support for the whole approach to ensuring metrics are going to serve the interests of uh, decision makers and policy developers. Uh, and, and uh, uh, explain how technologies are successfully being developed and implemented in the interests of development and, and, and in, uh, ensuring nobody gets left behind. But um, a, a sense that while there's a lot of metrics going on already, uh, UNESCO's universal indicators you know, was, was a very significant uh, area, a very significant initiative how can uh, the existing uh, sources of metrics be coordinated was one of the questions raised in responses to that particular recommendation. Recommendation two on help desks um, at the regional and global level. Questions about how, again, those are going to complement existing uh, networks of help desks. Would this be actually uh, undermining the effectiveness of those uh, help desks that already exist? Um, I'll move um, now to recommendation four, which is where I think most of the uh, negative responses focus, because this is the one with regard to uh, developing a global commitment on digital trust and security to shape, as, as the report says, a shared vision, uh, um, identify attributes of digital stability and so on. Respondents said it's obviously important for the, for the panel to have focused on security, but uh, very um, anxious that nothing new is established in terms of a, uh, a, 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 an agreement or even a treaty-based approach to, to uh, commitment on digital trust and security. And Many of the respondents referred to all, to all the valuable work that's already been going on uh, with the Paris Corps, the UN, government, uh, UN group of government experts, and so on. So there's a lot going on in that area. This would probably be a risk to a lot of that existing valuable work for another, another process in terms of a global commitment to be initiated following the panel support. So that's the, that's the difficult one, I think uh, I would underline. Uh, and then recommendation five, well, I've talked about the IGF plus as the favored option. I'll just finally say that uh, generally respondents were quite keen to see a better integration with the UN system of uh, this whole area of, of digital uh, collaboration, cooperation, and governance. And uh, there was 100% support for the uh, proposal to, to, to establish a tech envoy post in the Secretary General's office, who would undertake a lot of the oversight of how coordination was happening and ensure system, uh, ensure across the UN system, cooperation and digitalization issues were addressed in a, in a, in a holistic uh, uh, manner with everybody really looking to existing mechanisms of cooperation, such as the IGF here, or the IGF plus, if that does, does uh, uh, achieve um, reality, uh, and, and the tech envoy position would be supportive of that. So the final recommendation of a holistic approach to, this is 5B I'm looking at now, holistic approach 
uh, for cooperation and regulation, step with the rapid development of new technologies and so on, but was, was supported by uh, all the respondents to, to, the, uh, to the consultation. So we, it's now, the, this, this report is, uh, analysis of the views is now out. We're submitting it to the UN uh, process. Um, we've talked about it at the session on uh, Tuesday morning, with particular reference to the, uh, the architecture options. So, uh, UADIG will continue to track and ensure that European stakeholders, in, in concert with other stakeholders across the world, include, especially in the Global South and developing countries and communities, work together to, to implement the, 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 uh, those parts of the report, most of the parts of the report, that are going to ensure more effective collaboration uh, worldwide in a holistic way um, in, in, in the coming months. There are roundtables being established and, and we should ensure that European stakeholders have that opportunity to participate in those uh, roundtables and working groups that uh, the UN are setting up to take forward the panel's uh, report. So I, I think I've covered tried to cover the main points that came out of the consultation. I hope that's been helpful. But we can take questions and discuss elements of it as, as, as you think fit. So I'll, I'll stop there for now. So the gentlemen are handing over to me. My name is Sandra Hofer. <laughs> My name is Sandra Hoferichter. I'm Secretary General of the Eurodic. And the Secretariat was basically assisting Mark in doing his work and we would like to thank you for, for that. And it is always also a nice element to keep you in the community since you are retired now. We are very glad you accepted. I'm glad to be back. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone who is retired, you will find a place at <laughs> Eurotech. No, um, actually we would like to hear from you now um, what you think on the conclusions, if you have maybe uh, read the report yourself, have different views but possibly did not contribute to our consultation process. I mean, it's uh, still open, the com comment platform, so basically we could still include that, but definitely it will not go into our synthesis anymore. But I think it's an ongoing process and uh, it doesn't stop here. Uh, now when it comes to the implementation, as said, uh, we will also closely follow that process and see how we can contribute as the Eurodic platform. But now I would like to open the floor for you to share your thoughts and ideas, criticism, Ask questions. None? Oh, here. Now we have. Start with Lynn. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lynn Sainamore, chair of the IGF MAG. Um, just to comment that I think what you saw in the EuroDay consultation process mirrors very closely what we saw in the global. Um, IGF consultation. Not surprising as a lot of the, the respondents were, were the same. I also think it um, matches very well with what we heard in the main session on digital cooperation on Tuesday um, as well. So at least with sort of three separate data points, I think there's, there's really good alignment in terms of um, you know, points of, of agreement and, and uh, indications of some departures for future work. Then I had a lady here, and the lady here, unfortunately, you go first, and then you follow. Hi, uh, Ingrid Volkman, University of Melbourne, so not in Europe, obviously. Um, but I have a question, I'm an academic, and I'm wondering, because we really need new kinds of knowledge production in this world, in this digital world, if there were any discussions how to, to, uh, or to define like a recommendation based on an increase of university collaboration across Europe, perhaps, or? Did universities play a role or academia play a role at all in these recommendations? I see uh, civil society coming up and perhaps education, but education could relate to schools, not necessarily to research. If I just take that briefly, I'm not specifically in terms of collaboration across the academic community. I don't uh, think that was um, picked up in the panel's report. But the wider issues of skills and education and so on were very much there as an important uh, challenge to be addressed to ensure that uh, everybody who, uh, you know, as access increases, that people have the skills to be able to develop uh, and, and to, 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 to use these new technologies in ways that are going to enhance their uh, lifestyle and well-being and uh, 
commercial opportunities and uh, community opportunities more widely. If I, if I may just uh, add to that, it's, uh, we're seeing an increase raising of national boundaries among uh, research foundations. I mean, in Australia, it's all about Australia. If I wanted to uh, create a project dealing with global policy makers, they would say no, no, no. And the, I think the same in some of European countries, I'm from Germany, I know a bit of that infrastructure. So I think for EU to pick this up and enhance for the next generation, this sort of collaboration would be great. That's all I'm saying. Maybe uh, just to make sure that, that we understand. Uh, so. The UN high-level panel's report is, is one thing, and what we did as Eurodic and, and Mark in, in, as, as the person was to collect comments on the report. So, but I understand your question is not on what we did, but on the report itself, just to, to make that clear that we are talking about the same thing. And uh, I happen to be with the panel because uh, our former president was a member of, of the panel. And there were uh, academics in, in the panel, for instance, Jean Tirol was one of them. Uh, so the panel was a multi-stakeholder panel, and so you had uni university people in the panel, you had techie communities, you had government representatives, business, civil society, and so on. And of course, this, this was discussed. And, and I mean, what you see in the report is, is a condensation of, of quite intense discussions. They had subgroups on, on, on about six subgroups on, on, on themes, and there were lots of papers produced, there were lots, lots of contributions. They also had like a comment rounds or calls for input. You all see this on the website, it's called, I think it's called digitalcooperation.org or something like that. You can assess all the materials, so you get a little bit more insight about what the issues were that were discussed, what the different events were and what the contributions were, so that that was covered. But of course then the recommendations uh, the a report and their recommendations focus on what they thought were the key things or the key takeaways that where the most need for action would be. So not everything that was discussed is equally prominently reflected in the report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for the report that I still didn't have the time to read. But um, I was wondering, and also from the point of view of all the replies that you gather, um, whether the, the issue of, uh, of the report not covering environmental and climate change issues has come up uh, among the respondents. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that I'm from the external action service, European External Action Service. Yes, if I take that one. Yes, a very important point, and it, it did feature in uh, a number of the responses that there was uh, no real um, deliberation in the panel's report on climate change and environmental issues and the impact of digital technologies and so on. And I actually mentioned that when I spoke at the uh, Tuesday morning session, that that was, in the view of European stakeholders, an, uh, a serious omission uh, from the panel's report. I don't know, if Thomas, you want to... Is, was there any uh, you know, background uh, discussion that, that the panel uh, undertook on that particular area? Oh, thanks. Uh, well, the, the, uh, <clears throat> of course, the discussions were confidential, so, uh, so that only people who were there knew what was discussed. But, um, again, many things were discussed, but not everything made it, it, its way in, 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 in the report. But there were also things that were not discussed and, and, and not in the report. Sometimes it also depends on, on the composition of people, on dynamics that, that somebody starts something. So it, ex post is also, we probably would have asked ourselves, why, why is there nothing on this? But if you're in a process, maybe suddenly, yeah, there's a uh, focus on something and not on other things. So, so I wouldn't, yeah, we just take note that this is not a, not a visible issue in, in, in the report. Of course, using ICTs and using the internet for the SDGs, if you take the climate as, as one element of the SDGs, I mean, that the whole development and sustainability of development issue is, of course, there, but it's not specifically uh, pointed at. Thank you. Christine, uh, would you like to use the mic? Yeah. Yes, uh, my name is Christina Aguida. I, am, uh, uh, I work for the Egyptian government. And um, my question is, since the consultation was facilitated by the EURDIC, um, and, um, and you mentioned that the IGF Plus was one of uh, uh, the things that received a lot of comments, and the IGF Plus uh, model in the report talks specifically about building on the strengths of, uh, of the IGF and lists the NRIs as one 
of those trances. So my question is, uh, did, did the responses that you have received, did they go further into how the, uh, this building on that strand in specific of the NRIs could be explored, what could be done with the various four um, uh, models, uh, I mean, uh, components of that model that are there, because the report doesn't say much about that. So, thank you. Yes, I, I would agree. There isn't much, um, certainly not much discussion about the role of the national and regional IGS in the ecosystem of internet governance. There is some reference to the, uh, e the uh, um, evolution of, of uh, the IGF model at the national and, and, and regional uh, level, but no discussion about how that uh, would, uh, would possibly uh, develop and evolve. And we, uh, the, the Euridic partners, we will need to look at that, I think, in terms of um, uh, if, if the IGF Plus proposal is taken forward, what would, for example, Euridic as a regional IGF uh, do in terms of sort of keeping in step, if you like, with the IGF Plus and, and its additional functionality and so on. Um, so that's it's a, it's a very valid point. It's, um, the national and regional IGFs have grown remarkably, and the numbers are very uh, impressive. And it's, you know, they have an important role in feeding up into global discussions, and also for the global discussions to be cascaded down to, uh, to communities, especially those communities that find it difficult to participate actively uh, in the global IGF. Uh, I, th I think we've underlined that point in discussion. Well, from when I was in the UK government, we underlined that point in our interaction with, uh, with the UN and at the time of the WISIS plus 10 uh, review. Um, Thomas or Sandra, did you want to add? Um, I, I would just like to add, in case you haven't yet heard, right after this little meeting, starting basically at 2 o'clock, we will feed into a discussion with regional IGFs, but also national IGFs, um, Luck IGF, for instance, just went to a review and how this report is, what does it mean for, for NRIs? How does it bring it forward? What are the elements that we could take out? So there's just after this a very informal discussion about these ideas. Maybe you can dedicate that time and stay in the room. Any other questions or comments? or ideas how to move that forward, that project. Okay, Mark, Thomas, any closing remarks on this? Um, thank you, uh, other than really just to underline, this is a significant step. It's at a crucial time in terms of the, uh, the mandate for the IGF is sort of halfway through uh, uh, and anticipating um, a review of the WISIS outcomes in, uh, in, in uh, five years' time. Um, and uh, I, I expect uh, there will be a lot of focus on how to refine the multi-stakeholder processes. But we should all be alert to, uh, from, certainly from European stakeholders' perspective, to the risk of the essential bottom-up multi-stakeholder driven mechanisms for, for governance not to be compromised in any way. Uh, for example, for the IGF Plus, if we were to take on uh, any uh, significant decision-taking function, that would be something that needs careful examination to ensure that there isn't a deviation from the multi-stakeholder model which has a proven track record. So I, I'll just underline that, I think. Thank you, Mark. I just, um, I think it's on, on the process that, that led to, to, to this uh, uh, publication, I think it, it, it is a valuable exercise just to give space for people to discuss also on the, in a written form that, that uh, you, can, you can do online and not just those that have the opportunity to physically participate in meetings. So with this, I would uh, again thank Mark that he uh, offered to, to, to help us with this and we hope that there may be other moments where we can do similar things to, to trigger a discussion <clears throat> and to contribute to, to the further development of, of the digital cooperation architecture. So thank you. And, uh, 
Thank also you for dedicating your lunch break time. We are now taking a five minutes bio break and waiting for other NRIs and regional IGFs to arrive and then we will continue the discussion, basically take it from there. So stay in the room if you are interested in that or, or enjoy your lunch. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay. <laughs> I, th I think we should continue now. This is the informal gathering of first regional uh, IGFs, but also nationals are invited and, and partners and those interested. Since it is in, called an informal gathering, I would kindly ask you possibly to come to the table because it feels a bit strange. The room is so big and people are spread all over the room. I think that would create a little bit more of a cozy atmosphere. <laughs> and um, then I would, to open up, ask for a show of hand, basically, so that we know who's in the room. Um, who is a representative or who is involved in a regional IGF? OK, very good. Who is involved in a national IGF? Very good. And others, I guess, are just interested individuals. That's a good way of starting from. And I would ask uh, Raoul to open up, because he was one of the persons who had that idea to organize that session. Uh, uh, thank you, Sandra. I will uh, modify slightly the, the first question. So I say, who is involved in the organization of uh, one regional IGF? OK. Good. Thank you. Uh, can you, because uh, we are very few, so maybe those who raise the, their hands can, can say from uh, which regional IGF you are, and your name, please. Artyom Garien of Central Asian IGF. And? Ignacio Estrada from LAC IGF. Who else? Anne Rodewald from Eurodic. Sorina Delano, CDIC, Southeastern Europe. Predrag Tasaski, uh, North Macedonia IGF. North Macedonia IGF, Macedonia IGF. Regional ones, we have the Central Asia, uh, LAC IGF, Eurodic, and, and, and Southeastern Europe. Yeah, Okay, and we have also some nationals, including Macedonia. <clears throat> okay, the, the, the idea that the, the, there are several things that are happening in the field of internet governance from the point of view of the governance itself, uh, because everything that happened here has, is related with internet governance, but we are speaking about the second word now. <laughs> and so the, one of the things that we can see is that the, the, there is a lot of discussions about the, the improvement of uh, IGF and the, this uh, proposal of uh, the IGF plus. So, um, so talking to, with uh, Sandra, we uh, think that this is a, a good motivation also for discussing among the, the regional IGFs to see what are the, the, the natural uh, changes or evolutions that the, that the regional IGFs uh, should, uh, um, should uh, deal with. And we have an example that is the, in Latin America, we conducted a, a review, an open consultation about the LAC IGF, and I, I will talk about that now. And also other thing that is happening, and that uh, Sandra will cover uh, later, is, uh, is the, all the consultation on the uh, high-level panel on digital cooperation and the process that will start from now, from today, it's, uh, in the, as, a, as a consequence of that consultation. And this is something also that, that the regional IGF should be involved in. And we have a very good example with uh, what uh, the Eurodig has, uh, has done with uh, conducting a, an open consultation within the region. So, let's, uh, so those are the motivations uh, for having this meeting and see how the regional IGFs uh, could cooperate uh, more and better is, uh, with in, in front of those uh, challenges. So let me let me speak a little about the, the what we did in in, in Latin America. <coughs> um, sorry, I closed the file by accident. Um, I have my notes here. Okay. So the, there was a. a, a um, 
um, general feeling in the in, in the um, in the region that uh, it was time for uh, for conducting a review is not that the is not the case that the that there was a crisis with the with, with the lag HF. All the contrary, the meetings of lag HF are very well uh, attended by many people from different stakeholders, but some. Some things uh, started to uh, to come up, and the, the perception that the the, the participation of governments uh, was uh, reducing, and also that uh, other stakeholders were uh, participating, but with the involvement of people of lower level in some uh, in some cases. So we started this uh, consultation process that was uh, very successful, uh, almost. Uh, uh, about uh, 160 people participated in the in the consultation through individual interviews, uh, through open uh, meetings online that were conducted in three languages, the three languages that are more uh, popular in the region, English, Portuguese, and Spanish. And there were, and also with some face-to-face uh, -face meeting that were held, uh, taking advantage of uh, other important meetings in the region. There were two big uh, um, things, uh, agreements. One is that the that the that LAC IGF uh, continue being very valuable for the regional community, and the second finding, is in big terms, is that the uh, most of the people agree that this is the time to introduce some uh, changes. And we uh, introduced those. Uh, we classify those uh, findings in six uh, categories. Uh, participation, the contents that are being discussed, the format of the discussions, and uh, the structure of LAC HF itself, the intersectional work, and the uh, and funding. In terms of participation, I will go very, very, very quickly through the through the findings. But uh, I um, I recommend you to read the report that is online in the in the website of LAC HF. That, as you can guess, is lachf.org. Um, <clears throat> So in terms of participation, there was a claim for more outreach to advertise better the, 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 the forum, so more people is aware of what is uh, what's like HF and can be in, engaged in the, in the processes. Uh, there was a, also a, a proposal to have all the agenda speakers and details of the, of the meetings available with uh, more time in, in advance. Uh, especially the governments uh, emphasized on that point, and also the governments uh, asked for more formal communication between the LAC IGF Secretariat and the, and the governments uh, using formal channels like uh, Foreign Affairs uh, Ministry. They say that uh, that without, without those uh, the formal communication, it's difficult for them to become engaged and justify travels and the time that they spend in, the, in participating. There was also a proposal for implementing high-level uh, sessions in the, uh, during the meeting, um, those uh, in terms of participation. In terms of contents, and you can see the, all the links between the, the regional discussion and the, and the global discussion, because the, more or less the, the, the things that come up are, are very similar. The, there was a, a, a request to have more uh, focused uh, agendas, to contemplate the diversity of the region, and it, it means that the topics that can be interesting for one uh, country could be not interesting for another country in the region because there are different level of developments in the in digital development in the in the region. So, the, uh, for some countries, can be pushing only for the, the topics that are on the edge, but uh, those uh, those topics are, are not the topics that are in the the daily um, uh, challenges for, for other countries that are developing a little slower. So they claim to have a, a, a diverse uh, agenda that contemplate the interest and the realities of everybody. That the, the LAC IGF every year conducts uh, an open consultation to define the, 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 the main topics uh, for the annual meeting. But there was also a claim to combine those uh, open this open consultation with a more formal consultation with the local HFs, and also with the formal consultations to the uh, to organize the stakeholders, including governments. So it's a, that's the the, the, the the agenda could um, uh, um, is, could be uh, produced in based of the, all the, the, the consultations of all those uh, different channels. Uh, there, there is a, a, a rough consensus in, in terms that the, the, the LAC IGF should produce more concrete outcomes. Uh, there are some views about what the outcomes should be, how the outcomes should look, and the more the, 
what people say, uh, majority of people say, is that those outcomes should be in the form of uh, principles, uh, general guidelines, identification of priorities, and um, the, the way forward. So this is the, this is the issue that we have to, to, to deal with, and the, the solution is, uh, is in, in this way and not in this other way. Um, and also there is a, 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 a big claim that uh, the contents and discussion should not be repeated from one year to another year. There is a perception that some issues are always in the, on the table and, are the, and the discussions uh, uh, don't depart from the conclusions from the former, from former discussions, but start from the scratch uh, uh, again. In terms of formats, this is uh, I think that this is the, the, the issue that gets uh, more consensus is that that people uh, ask to have more interactive uh, formats and more innovative sessions uh, conti to continue with experiences like uh, breaking out sessions, but also having discussions without moderators or debates or even ro uh, role games and, uh, to to uh, to engage uh, more people in the discussions. Uh, the, it's, uh, it's very boring just, uh, the, this is what people say always, it's very boring to go to meetings to sit for two hours to see four people that is uh, also talking among them and there is never enough time to, uh, to open uh, discussion. There is also a, a, a claim to not, re not to repeat the um, speakers and moderators and to be more transparent in the selection of panelists and, and speakers. As, as you know, that uh, uh, if you, those of you who are uh, involved in the organization of these kind of meetings, sometimes you are running uh, against the time trying to to, uh, to organize a panel, a session, looking for panelists, and so that uh, is done in good faith, obviously. But the, the people that is, the attendees have no idea how the, the panelists were selected, and they say, okay, I, I I could have contributed to this discussion, but I didn't see any any way to any procedure or any, any channel to propose my, myself as a, as a speaker. Uh, in terms of intersectional uh, work, uh, there's a proposal to have uh, virtual working groups. Nobody proposed, fortunately, to have more face-to-face -face, uh, meetings, but uh, yes, to have more work online, to implement uh, more effective tools for collaboration, and uh, to communicate better with other forums, uh, the regional and global forums, in order to uh, put push the conclusions of the, of the discussion, but also to, to receive incomes, uh, to receive uh, sorry, inputs from the, from the other processes and, uh, and forms, uh, and, to, and to implement uh, better repositories of information. And in terms of a structure, there is a, the LAC IGF is conducted by a program committee. Here it's a, a Nacho is a, a Estrada is a, one of the members of the uh, one outstanding member of the program committee, and uh, there is a, 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 an ask to have um, more leadership and visibility from the program committee, but also to define uh, roles within the program committee. For example, to have a chair, something that you have in Eurodig, and uh, so the, there is a, somebody that is visible, like uh, the point of contact, somebody with uh, talk uh, whom uh, that. Um, also, that the uh, better criteria, more uh, clear criteria about the eligibility and processes. The, the process uh, currently in LAGHF to elect is based on, on the or, um, organized stakeholders. So, organized stakeholders are um, the ones that, who uh, submit names and propose names to be part of the program committee. But the, a large community is also asking for more opportunities to become involved in, in that level. And there is a significant, uh, um, a significant uh, support to the creation of a dedicated secretariat, as also as Eurodig already, already has. In terms of funding, the current funding based on, on donations is, uh, is uh, seen as a, as, a good, uh, as a good model. Uh, there is a, a common understanding that if uh, LAC IGF uh, continue being relevant or become more relevant for the region, so there will be always people interested in to contribute. But also there is a, a door open to analyze uh, other complementary me uh, models of membership. There are, so based on that, there were uh, several uh, concrete uh, proposals. 
uh, to, to start to implement some of the, the recommendations. And uh, since that, the, the, the program committee has been working on, on implementing some of the changes, and this is the, the, where the process uh, lies uh, at this moment, is uh, that the, some of the things are being considered and being, uh, the, the, the LAC IGF is moving forward in implementing some of the, of, of the changes proposed. Um, so I'm happy to answer any, any question, or, but more than that, I think that it would be interesting to hear from you. What are your, your, uh, your thinking about the changes that the regional the IGFs should introduce and how they can become more relevant in, in the respective regions? But before that, as I say, there were two motivations. One is the, the review of the processes uh, themselves, and the other is the, the relation with the, with the digital cooperation consultation. And so, Sandra. Without going too much into detail, first, if there are any questions or clarification to Raul, I would suggest we take them now, because you just referred to it. Are there any questions on this consultation process? Okay, you might not have been aware of this consultation process, but it's really a huge amount of work that went into this, and uh, we did a Eurodic uh, retreat last year, 2018, at the beginning also with the aim of improving our processes and uh, increasing relevance and so on and so forth, so I know how much uh, it entails, and then you have some results from a discussion on the one hand, but how to implement them, that's another challenge in terms of resources that are or are not available, and also in terms of um, participation of the, of the community, because of course the, the platforms, the secretariats, the coordinators, they can only uh, set the, the ground, but the input has to come from the community. Um, one thing that I, I didn't clarify, that's the, in terms of, I say that there was a, a, a significant support to the creation of a dedicated secretariat, is because the current model is very similar of the Asian Pacific Regional IGF. There is an organization that uh, uh, holds the, the responsibility of running the, the, the secretariat. In the case of Asian Pacific, it's not Asia. In the case of uh, Latin American Caribbean IGF, it's LACNIC and Kevin and Paula works both in LACNIC and they are in charge of the, of the secretariat. So the, when I say that there is a, a support to create a, a, a permanent uh, dedicated secretariat, is, uh, it's not because the, the people is not happy with what LACNIC is doing, but it's because uh, uh, people feel that it's the, 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 the process, the, 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 the forum is uh, mature enough now to have its own uh, secretariat, more uh, technical, and uh, not only focused on the, uh, on the logistics and the, all the operational uh, things uh, that are behind the, the luggage. Yeah. So, so, so. Okay, so I would summarize, we are united in diversity. <laughs> and possibly Anya can confirm that because she has the overview of all the national and regional IGFs. Um, I mean, united in diversity means we have different associational structures. Some are just in the process of setting up a structure. I know the German IGF, for instance, they just founded their association yesterday here at this forum. Others are still thinking about or are struggling. I, Italy is in the process of uh, forming an association. At Eurodic, we have an association, but I well know that some IGFs don't want or don't need an association because they have a body that takes care of. But I think we have all the same challenges to deal with, and this is the big question as the global IGF has to deal with as well. It's the uh, challenge of being relevant for policymakers, basically. It's the question of do we need more or other outcomes, and also of the question of engaging uh, more diverse stakeholders. There are some differences in terms of how transparent IGFs or national or regional IGFs are perceived, and possibly also differences on how on the process and how to get input. Uh, some re regions and nations are really good in getting input, others uh, see challenges here as well. And in, in the light of these uh, commonalities and uh, challenges and differences that we have, and also in the light of the discussion that we had here on the UN level, UN panel report on digital cooperation. 
And the fact that it seems there is a big support for the IGF plus model. I was looking a little bit in more detail on what the IGF plus model entails and was thinking, not really to the end because that's why we called for this meeting, basically we were thinking how far could we as national or regional IGFs go and maybe adapt, early adapt already some of the elements that are proposed in this report. And uh, here I would like uh, to name them again for you in case you are not so familiar with uh, what's written in the report. The IGF plus model would comprise an advisory group, a cooperation accelerator, a policy incubator, and an observatory and help desk. Basically, it goes very much down to the early ideas of uh, what was in the mandate of the IGF. All of these functions were kind of mentioned what the IGF should or could do, but I think it was never really institutionalized. It's still totally underfunded and understaffed, and therefore all these um, elements that have a name now here in this IGF plus model, um, they could be or should be possibly set in place when uh, there is a broad agreement and a decision about moving forward with the IGF plus model. I repeat them for you. An advisory group, something similar is in place with a multi-stakeholder advisory group, a cooperation accelerator, a policy incubator, an observatory and help desk. These would be the elements that form the IGF+. Plus. Going a little bit more into detail, what a cooperation accelerator, it would accelerate issue-centered cooperation across a wide range of institutions, organizations, and processes, identify points of convergence among existing IGF coalitions, and issues around which new coalitions need to be established, convene stakeholder-specific coalitions to address the concern of groups, such as government, business, and all these groups that we know, the media, women, and so on and so forth. So though they open it up a little bit more. Basically, that um, is a function that the global IGF is at least partly already doing, and also the national and the regionals. But of course, that could be improved. The policy incubator would incubate policy and norms for public discussions and adoption in response to requests to look at the perceived regulatory gap. It would examine an existing norms and regulations could fill the gap. If not, form a policy group consisting of interested stakeholders to make proposals to governments or the decision-making bodies. It would monitor policies and norms, source feedback from the bodies and adopt and implement them. I really think that's kind of a new element and uh, would like to hear from you how you think this could be implemented or if you think it should be implemented in your regional or national IGF. Then the observatory and help desk would direct requests for help on digital policies such as dealing with crisis situations, drafting legislation or advancing policies to appropriate entities including the help desk described in recommendation two, coordinate capacity development activities provided by other organizations, collect and share best practices, and provide an overview of digital policy issues, and so on and so forth. This basically is uh, also a new element that would look into the region or into the, into the uh, world. What is there, comprise all these activities, in particular when you think of capacity building, and you know, possibly all know these summer schools that are around summer and winter schools on, on internet governance, comprise those initiatives. And basically, that's the big question for me now, uh, anticipating that the IGF plus model is the one that is the most interesting one and the one that gets the most, uh, so the most, um, how to call, uh, support. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the most support. Um, how far should we or could we go or how you feasible you think uh, are these recommendations and would they be? Would that be something that you could think of implementing in your region and uh, and um, adopting them? And with this, I would open the floor for questions, comments, and I try to trigger the discussion a bit. Yeah. Oksana, please. 
please remember your name and so on. Thank you very much, Oksana Prihotka, uh, Ukraine, uh, member of uh, IGF UA steering committee. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to discuss this issue. Uh, I would like to um, tell you about uh, Ukrainian experience. We had plenary session uh, at our uh, tenth uh, IGF UA, which was held uh, in September this year, devoted to this report. Uh, Roberto also participated in this session, thank you very much, uh, and we sent our recommendations, thank you very much for including them into your report, but uh, I would like to um, give you another example. At the same um, IGF UA, we had a session devoted to the implementation of uh, European Electronic Communications Code. Um, in Ukraine, there are a lot of uh, uh, concerns that uh, implementation of this uh, legislation will be uh, very dangerous for uh, small Ukrainian ISPs. We have nearly 7,000 of, uh, 7, of ISPs. And uh, um, uh, this uh, discussion uh, became the example of uh, your recommendations uh, just now because uh, um, um, both internet providers, uh, both parliamentarians which are responsible for this legislation and of course civil society actively participated in this uh, discussion. And now we have working group uh, in Ukrainian parliament, uh, also multi-stakeholder, really multi-stakeholder group, uh, and we are working together on uh, draft of Ukrainian code of electronic communications. So, Oksana, let me ask you a question. Do you think the issues that you just described, would they be addressed with one of those uh, proposals that are on the table, possibly the policy incubator? Are you saying that the policy incubator is basically what you have recently established in the Ukrainian parliament? Absolutely. Okay, interesting. Yuri? Yeah, the, my name is Yuri Lanzipuro from uh, ISOC Finland. I'm active in the Finnish Internet Forum and also in Eurodic. Uh, when I first read these uh, proposals, including IGF Plus, and I saw all these names, uh, accelerate, accelerators and incubators and so on and so forth, I thought, my God, really, fine names, but uh, another battle about what actually they will be doing and who will be so <laughs> on these bodies. We all know that in all international settings, the, the real fight is about who will be where. So, uh, but I mean, I think when I, when I looked uh, sort of more closer to the proposal, I think that these are precisely the functions that have been missing, that the IGF has been missing so far. And that's uh, perhaps what has done uh, IGF uh, so far a little bit sort of uh, slow, slow thing to, to row, like a, like a boat that is too big. Uh, I would say that, for instance, in Eurodic, we actually in a way have these functions in a sort of proto form. Uh, for instance, the work that is done by the uh, subject matter experts, of which I'm, I'm one, I, I think that we, uh, we, we do a bit of both this uh, accelerator and, and incubator work. So, so wishing, wishing uh, good luck. I, I hope that not too much time will, will be used for these uh, Debates I mentioned. I mean, what exactly will be done by by each of these bodies, and 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 uh, who will be be there? Uh, I mean, I think that the forum. I mean, what is they have have to get started, and then then somehow get uh, sort of settled into what the role of each, the detailed role of each of these bodies. Thank you. Thanks, here. More comments? Please. Um, thank you, um, Sandra, for in the 
your, your co-chair for this meeting. Um, it's like breaking down the whole report to where it will affect. Oh, by the way, my name is Mary Uduma. Um, I represent the West African IGF as well as the Africa IGF. So, um, you know, as I was saying, that it, it, you broken down to a level that we could put our hands and see, just like the last speaker said, uh, the only issue is that for now we are struggling to, to sustain the regional uh, and, uh, and regional IGFs uh, and, uh, or continental IGFs in terms of funding and in terms of expertise. So I think uh, we would have want to see something on capacity building that will help actually the regions that are not, you know, that are not pulling weight to, to be up to date with others. Secondly, is that uh, at the African level, we already have what we call the policy and regulatory uh, development and agenda for, for the region, and uh, observatory is part of it, and the policy regulation uh, platform we are building where we could we could get information and share information. But the truth is that um, at the regional level, okay, we, we still have uh, some issues of uh, sustainability and buying of the, unlike the Euridig, where the European Union is strongly supporting, when it comes to West Africa IGF, the ECOWAS region, we have not had those buy-in. Well, I am looking at if the UN, at the UN level, that they are going to help us uh, drill, drill down the, uh, and um, uh, inform them to be to uh, put in more, more support for us or get a buy-in and understand what we are doing. And, and uh, so, so, so as the last speaker said, the, all those functions who and who will be responsible for them. Uh, we are just struggling with one, what of the rest. For, at African level, I, pretty much we have some, some uh, mechanisms that could take care of this, but at the sub-regional level, I think that's where we have challenge. Well, I want to thank you for bringing in that. We have broken it down to the point that we can have a handle on it. Thank you. Gentlemen over there. Hi, good day. Kevin Swift from LACNIC, but I'm just going to comment as an observer to another process in the Americas, the Caribbean um, Internet Governance Forum. Interestingly, when I saw the recommendation um, with the supporting Alexander IGF Plus um, for a policy incubator, um, I drew a parallel with something that existed in the Caribbean IGF process for a while, which is something called the Caribbean IG Policy Framework. It's an active document um, that is worked on at, the, at every IGF event. So besides the organization of panels and sessions, there's a part of the process dedicated to working on this framework on select thematic areas, um, relying on the expertise of experts who attend to the event and the participants who are there. And I find that very useful because the Caribbean has a number of challenges numerically you have disparate levels of development within that small block, um, but it does serve as a good um, template or a good um, starter for smaller economies who do not have a footing in some areas, let's say cybersecurity, but at the same time, they do have plans to chart into digital waters and they are trying to build themselves digitally. Um, so the one thing I would say, um, similar to the gentleman, I think he's at the back comment, the challenge we have with that is that it is a good fodder to, to start um, policies, digital policies, but um, in the Caribbean context, it's still somewhat challenging to transpose that, those recommendations into the actual tangible policies at the national level, and that is because of um, political reasons. But um, I just wanted to um, just comment on that because I see a lot of value in, in, in that mechanism itself. I'm not sure many people are aware of that being part of the Caribbean process. We've always looked at outcomes as updating the framework, but um, there are the other challenges that will come in who supports it and how it transposes into um, tangible or implementable 
items. Oh, one comment from myself as a personal comment is that uh, it's uh, something that I said um, Tuesday in the main session when this uh, digit, digital cooperation was discussed. And the, um, with regard to this policy incubator, one thing that I have realized in the last uh, couple of years working with different groups, uh, stakeholders and countries, it, is that there are many places where things are being discussed the same uh, or uh, things that are connected in, uh, in agendas that are connected. And so while we are discussing an issue here, probably there is a, a, a committee in UN or a group of countries discussing something or OECD producing uh, recommendations on the same topic. And some of those recommendations, in fact, will be implemented uh, soon or in a, in a shorter term that, uh, that wh the, ter the time that we need in IGF to produce a recommendation or getting kind of a common approach. So the, the policy incubator is, a, a, is one thing that, that's a matter of concern to me is that it should be conceived as a, as, a, as a, should not be conceived as a, as a top-down thing saying, okay, this is the only place, so we have, a, we have a challenge, I don't know, artificial intelligence or privacy or whatever, or, or DNA security. Or, so we meet here, so we create a frame for developing uh, policies, and this is what we spread around the world, because it's, it's, it will not work, because at the same time there will be other people working on the same issues and also developing policy proposals and policy approaches. So the, the only thing that this policy incubator could be useful is if it fills that gap, that is the gap of, of proposing uh, policies or proposing frames for policy, but connecting the dots, the, the, the things that are being, the discussions that are being held in different parts of the world by different group of people, different stakeholders, different countries. So this is uh, something that, same, same uh, concern, uh, this is something that is, uh, is, is close to us, because it has to be with the regions, is that the concept of regional hubs. Is that this concept of regional hubs that have been mentioned as, uh, many times is something we don't need uh, UN or somebody else or to create regional hubs to help, uh, or regional help desks to help the, the governments. Because in every region there are already a lot of initiatives. So what we have to do is to, is to in, 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 in any case, is to work with the different initiatives and stakeholders in the regions to achieve a much better coordination in terms of uh, developing the, uh, facing the challenges in terms of policy. So what I hear from, from your comments is that basically some of the elements you see already existing, at least in a slight way, in your region, and for some elements you are rather see challenges. Anya, and this is not, uh, we didn't speak about this before because this just came to my mind when listening to the comments. I have the feeling that national and regional, and particularly the regional IGFs, should sit on the table when these issues are going to be discussed in round tables. I know that there are now round tables are set up under the leadership of certain governments or so on and so forth. I really think with the experiences that is in this field of national and regional IGFs, those people need to be on the table. And maybe we could think about how we, or if we, send a recommendation out of this informal gathering that this should take taken into consideration and that this should take place. Because we have experiences in the region working with the people on the ground that made experiences in a positive or a negative way that possibly can contribute to a much, in much more detail than uh, maybe the people that will convene for reasons, I don't know how they will be chosen. Do you think this is something that we could do, or do we not? Would that not? Would this meeting not be give us legitimacy to do so? Yes, thank you, thank you, Sandra. But I actually think it's a very good starting point, and you know how we operate. Whatever decision is being taken in the group, we do work. If we don't have an opportunity to meet in person, then we meet virtually. Uh, in an on, uh, within an online meeting. Then we go to the list where everyone are subscribed just to clear 
what the group has agreed on a call and see if anyone would object or anyone would like to um, add any updates to it. And with that, the decision is made through a usually bottom-up consensus. So I think this group made um, some excellent ideas, concepts, could maybe um, take it forward to give it a form and then maybe consult all other NRIs to see, or if you want to keep it with the regional IGFs, uh, consult other regional IGFs that are unfortunately not present here just to see if they would endorse or they would have something against. But I fully agree with you what you said, that the NRI discussions should go much beyond on the level they are now, which is usually NRI to NRI. And I think especially on a local level, so you, get a, you gave a very good um, comment this morning on the NRI's main session when you suggested that we use this momentum here to connect the NRIs to their parliamentarians, to their legislators. And hopefully that will maybe build on some long-term collaboration between the legislators in the country and the actual still very unique processes in a country that I think are very much growing. I've also, the meetings that I've visited, which is, which is a very few, but still, I mean, the impressions are great that I have. They do have high-level presence, political presence, so, for example, when I went to the West African IGF in Gambia, the minister was there all the time, the minister in charge for the ICTs. And not just the minister, but the minister actually did such a great favor to the community. The uh, secretary general of the ITU was in the region. He was, I think, in Senegal or something like that. And then the minister invited him to that meeting. It was a complete surprise for everyone. But it made such, a, such an impact to the meeting. And later, when I spoke to DSG, he, was, he wanted to learn more, to know more what's happening. He was especially interested in Pacific region, what is there. So I think that's the key, that that face-to-face, -face, first of all, contact that we can make. And I think every momentum we could use, we should. Uh, producing a document would be excellent. That would be some kind of a political document that came out as a consensus from the multi-stakeholder compositions of the NRIs. And uh, well, Cengeta is there, he can he can confirm, but um, you know, we will definitely support whatever is the view of the NRI's network as long as it's, it is within the IGF framework, its principles and procedures. Excuse me. Uh, I, I will go very soon because I have another appointment. But I just want to raise two issues. One, um, there is the regional uh, parliament as we have it, ECOWAS parliament. And there is the national parliament. So at the ECOWAS level, what you're saying about connecting with the parliamentarian, at the ECOWAS level, there's an ECOWAS parliament. So for regional, yes, we could um, try, because ECOWAS is our secretariat, get you know, some synergies, some collaboration. Uh, but at the, at the um, national level is another one, is another, another level altogether, so nationals could get connected with their they are parliamentarian, but I am um, I, I'm a little bit withdrawing about, um, I don't know, this informal meeting of regional, um, are we creating another level, another layer, okay? Because we have the NRIs, um, are we now going to differentiate between the nationals and the regional? That's where I need a clarification, please. Uh, Anya, maybe you clarify for me, or, or, or San, Sandra, since all of them normally are supposed to be on equal footing when it comes to the network of the NRIs. Are we trying to do another layer? I just want a clarification, sorry. Maybe I'll respond to that first because of why we are initiating this. Um, I totally agree, it's, and, and, and it should not at all touch on the equal level of the regional and the nationals, but there is a difference between the work of a regional IGF and the work of a national IGF. On a national level, you deal with uh, issues that are very down to the people that have a very national focus that is held in the language uh, of the country. And for Europe, I can say that in particular, it's hard for me to go around the national IGFs because they speak languages I don't understand. And it makes no sense for them to change to another language that I understand. So. On the regional level, you agree at least on an overarching language most of the times, and also the work is different because you are covering or you are looking into the issues of a region. And that is a big difference, and it has nothing to do with being not equal or like this. It's just a difference that we can address. 
And therefore, Raoul and I, we decided to uh, get this gathering of regional IGFs. Of course, everyone is invited. These are open meetings in order to discuss from our perspective how we perceive the work that the LAC IGF did, but also the report on digital cooperation, how we perceive that being relevant for our development. And I think it's our, our right as regionals to come up with a suggestion that can be up for discussion on the list. And um, maybe it is, and, and, and honestly, it was not our plan to come up with something like this. It was only an informal gathering. But what I hear is kind of also surprising to me that many elements that are here recommended in this report uh, are already in, not in, I wouldn't call it in place and definitely not under these names, but elements like these are already in the regions in place and I think when the discussion on these reports is going forward now and when these round tables are formed, I really think and believe that uh, the regional and also the nationals for other issues should be on that table. And if we don't make that very clear, this will not going to happen. And if you take too long for any uh, administrative processes in terms of, uh, well, we have to find agreement and then we start a discussion that goes down to the road. Sometimes you have to use the momentum. And I think we have a momentum here in this meeting and maybe we can take that to the mailing list further and uh, come up with this recommendation there. And I mean, it, come on, it's a recommendation, it's something, please include regional and national IGFs in the discussion on the round tables, that's it. Anya, the question was also to you. Well, yes, I mean, ever since I started working with the NRIs, maybe I don't have that kind of profound historic knowledge of the NRIs because, but Mary, you would know, and Sandra, you would know as well because you were there almost from the beginning when all these processes started. But in any case, as I said, so ever since I, was, I came, there were those narratives that were uh, present in the network that um, maybe the regional, some of the regional IGFs would like to be, I'd say, more above some of the national IGFs. And through my work, to be honest, I did not see that. That is really not, not even from a single regional IGF, and I'm very close with the, not just the coordinators, but some members of the steering committee, which is very important to me. And maybe even more important, the community members, because you hear the feedback, how people perceive the process. I've ne any kind of piece of work coming from the regional IGF did not support that argument. Just quite the opposite. I do think that they, but we were very outspoken, it is true, the, the whole UN side, but I think the network as well, that all NRIs, national, regional, sub-regional, and youth IGFs are equal. There's, there are no reporting mechanism between. There's no hierarchy. We only feed into each other processes because we're keeping each other informed and we, um, we're learning from each other, exchanging best practices. So I think over the years we managed to kind of include that understanding um, on an individual basis with the NRIs. But on concretely on this, um, I don't see that we're creating, Mary, any new processes or that we're creating any new networks in a network. That's why I told Sandra, I think, this meeting could be a starting position, but others need to be consulted. I think that's critical, because we don't want exclusive small groups to be creating anything new, and I think that's, that's the process. I don't expect that anyone would object on that, and I think it's just very critical that the network, aside of, aside of the secretariat as a very neutral facilitator, that the network is proactive on a, on a kind of political scene of the internet governance and actually say, you know, we, do, we have these outcomes, we have tangible outcomes, we can actually help you. And I think some, some kind of streams in certain countries have already recognized that. You would know that, Mary, if you look at the Nigerian IGF, if you look at the, like the Gambian IGF, for example, specifically that region that uh, the ministers are present, you have communication with the legislators as well, in addition to non-government stakeholders, which are equally important. So that's how I see it. I don't see anything negative in that sense. I don't see any exclusive processes. I just think that we all have to you know, come up with good ideas, take action, use the momentum, as you said, but uh, yes, always consult the whole group. I think that's important. I want to bring one example, what we did this year on the third uh, annual meeting from Macedonian. From Macedonian. Uh, um, um, just 
I got the sign that we have to clear the room soon, so please keep your intervention yeah, very short. Yeah, I'll be very short. short if that's okay. So, our uh, example, this year we decided that each year from now on we will invite one regional uh, IGF from the neighboring countries. So, this year we invited the Albanian uh, representative from Albanian IGF, and it was quite interesting retrospective uh, point of view where she provided a very interesting outcomes, what was in Albania, and things what has to be done in Macedonia, and what has to be done in the region. And of course, this was actually one of the uh, first po point why we did initiate it as we need to start cooperating out of our borders. We need to have more uh, cooperating and to work together. And nevertheless, if the languages are not the same or different, that doesn't have to be a uh, stopper. Okay, thank you. I think that's, we have to free the, the room, but I think that's the, there are some a couple of clear conclusions that, uh, that there is a, a, an appetite to collaborate <laughs> and to work more together. The, um, I agree with my colleagues that that is not an intent to, to diminish the importance of the national uh, IGFs or the opposite, and, but the regional IGFs have things in common that uh, there's an opportunity to collaborate, to strengthen the cooperation. And the regional IGF should be part of the of the picture in all this uh, global debate on the future of digital cooperation, but also discussing about how to adapt themselves to the challenges at the, at the regional level. So uh, I think that Sandra's idea is very good, and we can continue working and coordinating with Anya to see how we can move forward this. Please. Also, thank you, Raul, and uh, what Anya said was basically also a very good closing remark. I think I went a bit too far with my idea, and I promise it just came in my mind when we were sitting here and I was listening to you. But I also think maybe we should uh, establish a li little bit more the exchange among regionals, because they are dif different than, than nationals. And uh, reiterate, this had nothing to do with uh, putting one over the other. It's just that we have different challenges, and sometimes they have to be addressed. So. I will try to keep up for another meeting and maybe we can think about uh, another mailing list, I don't know. Uh, we will take that with Anya and uh, take it from here. I thank you for your participation and for dedicating your lunch break. Bye.
Quatsch. Hallo. Hallo. <lacht> Hallo. Hätten wir eine Gruppentour machen können. <lacht> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Spellman. I'm the Head of Thought Leadership at the World Economic Forum, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, topic around uh, human-centric uh, digital identities. 
Uh, and I'm joined by two World Economic Forum colleagues, uh, Christian Duda on my left, who is going to be uh, our online moderator, moderator and looking at some of the comments that we're going to get online, and uh, Monica Glowacki, who's uh, our rapporteur for today. So thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us. Um, if you think about why you've been here this week, I think a lot of us have been motivated by how do we shape a inclusive, sustainable, and trustworthy digital future. And those words about inclusivity, about sustainability, and about trustworthy are right at the heart of what digital identity is all about. And so if we look at this discussion today and think that by 2024, there may be five billion people who are in some way using digital identity systems. But if you look at some of the challenges that we've got, a lot of the issues that we've talked about this week are right at the center of the digital identity debate. It's about ambition, but how do you balance that with capability? It's about how do we get inclusion, but avoid exclusion? How do you empower people with digital identity, but yet avoid discrimination? And if we look at some of the aspects of today's world and what is coming round the corner, we can see how digital identity becomes absolutely central to everything that's involved in participating in the digital economy. If we think about cross-border travel, think about the possibility of doing remote operations on your heart where the doctor is operating from another country. Think about the role of government e-services going forward. The possibility of using data from multiple agencies around humanitarian aid. All of these will involve aspects of digital identity as we look forward. But the question that we've got to ask is, are we falling into some of the same old traps? The issues about single-use identities, when we know that what users want is an approach that's inclusive, involves their ability not just in terms of health, not just in terms of banking, not just in terms of travel, not just in terms of how they interact with government services, but they're looking for something which is user-centric. So it's not just about how do we create digital identity systems, but it's about how do we make sure that those systems truly create value for the user. So those are some of the issues that I hope we can begin to get into today as we talk about human-centric uh, digital uh, identity. And the format for today is that um, I'm delighted, I'll introduce the panelists uh, to you in a second. We're going to have a, a panel discussion uh, to frame some of the issues, get the debate uh, moving. And then uh, we're going to get you to work. Uh, so we're going to have some breakouts. And we're going to have half an hour in breakouts. And then uh, in those breakouts, there's five groups. And you get 15 minutes in one of the groups, and then a second 15 minutes uh, at, the at a second group of your choice. And I hope that what we'll be able to do is draw on some of the collective wisdom in the room. And particularly what we're interested in is your insights, but also where you see good examples. So what are the examples that we can draw on as we go forward over the course of the next uh, three, four, uh, five years? That's the sort of the time frame. And I hope that by the end of this 90 minutes together, that what we'll be able to think a little bit more about is what are some of the principles that we need to understand better to help us with user-centric digital identities? What are some of the use cases? What are some of the best practices that will help shape how we should be implementing digital identity going forward? What are some of the main policy considerations that we should be looking at? How do we avoid some of those pitfalls that we can already see? And then finally, what do we think, and what does particularly the panel think, are some of the next steps that will enable us to move forward in a way that helps us to address both digital identity through a public lens, through a private lens, through an individual perspective, 
a business perspective and a governmental lens. So I hope that that frames the discussion for us a little bit. And what I'd like to do is go to the uh, panel. So starting with uh, uh, Linda Bonio on my right. Uh, Linda is the chief executive of Lawyer Hub. And so we'll come to Linda in a second. Uh, on her uh, right is uh, Dirk uh, Warwood of Verimi. And uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, Dirk, what you've got to say about how you're going to revol revolutionize digital identity. Uh, then we have Sebastian um, Hufnagel from Dell, and then Michael uh, Bultmann from Here Technologies. So uh, you've got pictures up there at the, uh, uh, on the screen. So Linda, let me start with, uh, with you, uh, Lawyers Hub. And one of the things that you've been looking at is this whole question of how the legal system and justice works with technology. And I know that one of the uh, exercises you ran recently was a hackathon in Kenya, looking at the whole question about digital identity. So just help us a little bit to explain what you've been doing and what are some of the insights that you want to sort of share with us about what you're finding around digital identity? Because I think one of the things that we're very aware of in these discussions is we can't look at it all through a developed country lens, and we need to think about it through uh, the lens of different parts of the world. Thank you very much. Um, I'd want to just say a little bit about what the Lawyers Hub does. We realized the gap between law and technology. And um, the usual lawmaking process is very bureaucratic and does not involve a lot of you know, the, the, the communities in our, in our country. So I'm from Kenya, and we work across Africa. So the Lawyers Hub trains lawyers to understand technology so that they make better policies. In our analysis, most of the time, the regulators and policymakers are actually lawyers. Members of parliament in Africa mostly will compose of lawyers. And so we thought that was a good place to start from. And now we um, host weekly events to talk about policy. And we have about 150 lawyers who come into our space every week. We have 1,000 active membership. And we have a mailing list of 10,000 lawyers. And so our, our reach has been very deliberate. And we see the difference in engaging lawyers in policymaking processes. So on digital identity, uh, I think it's important to learn the history before we move on digital platforms. And so in Kenya, for instance, we had um, the whole colonial uh, registration identity system that began, began in the 1920s. And so that sort of classified everybody in terms of their tribe and where they come from. So if I look at your, dig, uh, your ID card, identity card in Kenya, or even Uganda, no, not Uganda, but mostly Kenya, Zimbabwe, I would be able to indicate exactly where you come from, what your tribe is, just from your identity card. And so when the government put in place and said they're coming up with a, um, a Kuduma number, which is their version of digital identity, we thought that it was actually not well thought through because one, uh, we have stateless individuals in Kenya. We have individuals who are actually stateless and moving them to a digital identity without sorting out issues um, of exclusion would actually exclude them further in a digital environment. And so uh, we also asked about the second question, how do we ensure that there is privacy around, this, um, around these issues? The Kenyan government have, have been hacked more times than I have been hacked. And so having this information in their databases and their proposal was to centralize digital identity. And centralizing it on the layer of also adding DNA information on the digital identity would be problematic in the case that what if this information is compromised? And at that particular point, Kenya did not have a Data Protection Act. We recently enacted a Data Protection Act, I think two weeks ago, and just came into place on 25th November, that's on Monday. And so without a Data Protection Act, we thought that that would actually not work. So what did we do? We got on the ground and started doing policy hackathons and inviting people to our spaces and saying, what do you think about digital identity? Do you understand it? What, what proposals do you have? And what can we do about it? So we did um, policy hackathon across the country and developed an alternative policy, which we hope that African countries can take it up as alternative and model law. Because we think what's, ha what's missing, especially in the global south, is who can we learn, learn from? Most of the African countries are looking at India, for example, and saying, you already have the Adhar system. Can we pick your law for what it is? But our jurisdictions are different. We need something that's more African, that actually understands the difference in population. The tribe, for instance, um, I don't think a tribe, tribe information needs to go on an identity card. That means we are simply taking 
issues that we have fought through the years to a digital platform. So um, uh, my final comment on, on this would be um, learning from Kenya, I think digital identity should take first, um, should have meaningful consent. The government should not force you into a digital platform, but ensure that users actually opt in um, willfully, they see value in it, they see why they need to come into that system, um, and also engage other sector players, engage the lawyers, engage businesses, because businesses understand the importance of having a digital identity. And people also understand why uh, it's important for them to be authenticated, that you know, it could offer me good, good, you know, good, um, good alternatives if I'm banking, if I'm walking into a building, and I wanna surprise you, in Kenya, there are buildings you can't access without an identity card. And so people who are stateless and even refugees who haven't been recognized cannot access certain buildings in Kenya. And so I think identity is crucial for an economy such as ours and also across the continent. And learning from Ethiopia, my last point is this, learning from Ethiopia, they took a different approach and said, can we test a particular population around digital ID, then scale it to across the country? Thank you. So Linda, just, can, you, can I just pick up on this question about do Kenyans truly see value in this digital identity? So my understanding is 38 million people have signed up to this digital identity program. But the real question is whether it's Kenya or any other country is ultimately do people see value in it and the issues of friction? So when you did the hackathon, what was the value that your individuals saw? I, I understand the problems about tribes and uh, ethnicity, yeah. but where's the source of value? Because if we can't get the value clear, I think the digital identity programs won't fly. I think the value uh, is seen mostly by businesses. Um, we had a discussion last week on, um, on digital identity and KYC. And a lot of the businesses that are already working on um, building products around digital ID see the value, the banks see the value, but individual users still do not see the value. Um, the government had, um, they had a tagline that if you get Huduma number, then you will have better government services. And so I see tweets, people just, you know, uh, humor on Twitter, and they're saying, yeah, it's 100 days since I registered for Duma number, but I still don't get government services. So they don't see the value. Um, I think it will take a lot of teaching, and then also organizations like private sector having actual products on digital identity that actually would, you know, be interoperable with what government is already doing for people to see the value in, in ID. Super, thanks very much. Michael, let me, let me come to you, a very uh, different context, which is mapping and location services, um, but huge uh, geographical implications as those get rolled out. So how does digital identity in your business lens work? Yeah, first of all, um, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks a lot for having us here. I have to first give my compliments to the selection of the topic. And that was the reason why I was immediately saying to my colleagues, well, this is spot on. It is a, a topic of high relevance to all of us, human-centric digital identities. In one word, what we are doing, and Mark was already alluding to it, we are collecting, well, we are capturing the entire world in digital format. So we are active in 200 countries of the world and have a digital representation of the world, if possible in real time. This is not always possible in some parts of the world, uh, but we are on a good way. Um, we learned over the years the relevance and importance of digital identities. I mean, the starting point, we are not a clearly consumer brand, but um, more a, a customer uh, brand, so business to business uh, and business to business to consumer uh, approach. However, we realize that it is quite crucial um, to have, a, well, a proper management and a proper view on identities. I can give you an example. I was sitting in a, in a board meeting in California and my a colleague from China was saying, I don't know what you have about privacy. It's always about GDPR and consent and the relation between individuals and the government. We have a massive issue in China because there is not only one Mark Spellman running around in China, there are at least 20. So the identity is taken away. And without a proper identity and being really sure that the person who is allegedly acting is really the one who would like to vote, to consume, to express an opinion, is the real one behind, we have an issue. I'm, of course, not the one who is kind of giving advice to governments how to do. I have a bit of a simple-minded business view on it but we see huge opportunity uh, and necessity to focus much more on that. 
To give you one example, in the area of banking, we are collaborating with, with a big credit card company, it's not a secret, with MasterCard, um, and they have really the need to understand that the person who is allegedly behind a transaction is the one uh, who is claiming to be that person buying now a concretely a watch in Geneva, looking again to you, Mark, sorry. So that is of crucial importance, and location intelligence is playing a bit of a role in it to double check whether this information is correct. So digital identities are of uh, outstanding importance there. We are as well contributing to Rami, I'll leave it to my colleague Dirk in, in a moment to, to describe that approach, but my, my main message clearly is here, um, before we are talking about the challenges, about discrimination, about equal access to it, what is crucial in, in, the, in, in the internet without any doubt, um, we need to, ha to really raise the sensitivity and understand really that identity in analog world was already important, but that will not change in digital world. And it's of course because of the, the speed of the exchange of information, the vulnerabilities and the, the, the risk exposure is of course different uh, and a special focus and attention on it absolutely required. Thanks a lot. Michael, could you comment a little bit on um, this world of real-time information that we're going to move towards? Because clearly the sorts of work that you're focusing on, whether it is driving a car, whether it's looking at integrated supply chains, it seems to me that most of us think about the information that we access is very much historic. But we're just about to move into an era, you see 5G, you see Internet of Things coming, um, you look at what you're sort of doing with uh, automotive technologies, where we truly are in a world of real-time information, whether you're walking into a shop, whether you're driving a car, whether you're looking at where things are in your supply chain. How does digital identity, or how critical is digital identity in that world? Well, I mean, currently, while we talk now in November 2019, we are not there that we have in all parts of the world. If you're shopping or working with autonomous solutions, like with uh, autonomous driving, we do not have everywhere the, the level of saying we have access to, to real-time data. However, we see, of course, the first cases very concretely. And, of course, it's very compelling. It's a very, uh, well, interesting offering. To, to, make, to say it a bit drastically, nobody cares too much whether the city believes in a speed limit or in a certain road condition. What counts is actually what do we see in reality. Is there an accident? Is there black eyes? Can I drive the way I would like to drive? Or you can translate it to shopping. You go into a shop and you see um, the, the, the pricing system and the offering really in real time. And in that situation, if a customer, a consumer, a driver is coming to a scenario, uh, it's of course very important because certain of the, let's say, the environment, the point of interests, may vary. It is highly individual. And then it's of course very important to know who is coming around the corner. And that may, be, may create huge benefit for that concrete uh, person in a very concrete situation. I do see, of course, that there is risk associated to if you don't manage it properly. Therefore, uh, we do not have most likely time to talk in detail about anonymization techniques of the future in the context of privacy, which we are working very actively on. But this is crucial that we put the the, the human really in the center uh, that this person can consent into in, in order to proceed with a given situation, with a given solution. Very good, thank you. Sebastian, let me come to you. So Dell's strapline is the future is better than today. So as uh, someone who has a, a company which is critical in terms of uh, the hardware, the infrastructure that we're all using, which enables us to access uh, internet. Tell us a little bit about how Dell thinks about digital identity, and what is it that we see coming on the horizon which you think is particularly important for us to note? Thank you, Mark, and thank you for the invitation to this important uh, discussion. As you've mentioned, uh, Dell Technologies uh, provides uh, infrastructure for, um, you know, all for the digital transformation, including uh, digital identities and uh, da the data economy, data management. Um, and uh, so for us, um, 
uh, it's crucial that um, digital identities are adopted, that they are trusted and secure, um, as w without them, a lot of the solutions that we are talking about wouldn't be possible, and a, lo a lot of the solutions that run on our infrastructure wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be possible. So for us, um, uh, I think we see privacy and security as, as the crucial conditions that have to be secured uh, in this infrastructure, and um, at a company level, we have committed to um, um, privacy you know, as, a, as a fundamental right of our uh, customers and users. Um, I have to say that we are not using our customer data for um, commercial gain. Uh, nevertheless, our customers rightly expect us to uh, treat their data in a responsible and transparent way, um, which is why we've always invested uh, in our um, data management and our governance systems, risk management systems, and, and we'll keep doing so. Uh, recently, as part of our uh, 2030 um, corporate responsibility um, strategy, we've committed um, to create a, a dashboard for our customers where they can easily access their um, personal information, delete, update, and also choose um, how we share it with our suppliers. Um, We've also committed to um, only work with companies in our supply chain who share our, um, uh, our standards in terms of privacy. Um, in terms of security, um, as well, it's crucial uh, to ensure that in the, in the uh, products um, by adopting um, security by design um, approaches or even security by default. Um, and, um, and um, um, sorry, um, yes. And also to secure uh, the supply chain again, the suppliers with certified uh, supply chains. Um, we're working um, with, with risk management systems that are kind of state of the art. And um, we are um, uh, also working, for instance, with the Charter of Trust. Um, that's an organization that also had an event here yesterday where um, uh, industries, uh, companies from different organizations come together and um, work on exchanging best practices um, across uh, sector, sectoral silos to uh, create this kind of baseline security requirements uh, that would be adopted worldwide, ideally. So, so one of the issues that people always keep coming back to with digital identity is the importance yeah. of collaboration. Yeah. And you mentioned there the idea of security by design, sharing standards. Yeah. How do I know, or how would I know, that Dell, within your sort of ecosystem, mm -hmm are actually able to have common standards across company boundaries. Because it seems to me that one of the big challenges that we face is collaboration, not just across industry boundaries, but also between public and private. And that, to me, is one of the big issues going forward. So are there any insights that you can bring around how do you get collaboration to work and how to, particularly when you're focusing on whether it's standards about cybersecurity or just standards in terms of interoperability going forward, how's that going to work in practice? Mm -hmm. So, of course, um, we are teaming up with uh, other companies, leading companies in the sector, uh, to work with governments. That's also part of the, the dialogue, um, not just working within industry, but also uh, with the governments and um, advocating uh, for uh, policies uh, that, that uh, set a reasonable uh, framework uh, that provides some, um, some rail guards, let's say, uh, for everybody uh, in the industry um, to, to have some uh, standards that everybody can agree to and that are also interoperable. Uh, that's very important. Um, that we don't, um, um, uh, not every country, every jurisdiction comes up with its own um, regional standard, but we have this kind of uh, interoperability between uh, jurisdictions. And um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's just uh, uh, on, the, on the global level. And uh, we've seen that um, another, another issue is uh, lock-in that um, needs to be prevented. So it's very important um, uh, that um, you know, identities that are now uh, needed for every kind of uh, application, that they, are, um, they don't lead to um, dependencies on specific vendors. And uh, I think with, this, uh, with these common standards, we can prevent that kind of lock-in to happen. And um, the policymakers have the responsibility to um, provide the framework for that, as you know, it, it wouldn't naturally come uh, always in, in, the, in the market. So GDPR in Europe and also the free flow of data regulation I think two really good um, examples of recently adopted frameworks that enable that to happen. Um, also, in terms of uh, identities, the uh, EIDAS regulation um, 
helped uh, interoperability for digital identities, um, I think, among six European countries now, and it's something that's going to be rolled out across the region. I think there's other good examples in Western Africa, so I think that's uh, the right direction. Very good. So if you listen to the debate so far, we've had something about uh, user centricity and the importance of that. How do you get 38 million uh, in Kenya uh, onto a digital identity system? There's insights around how we're going to cope with real-time information. There's the importance of collaboration. And so, Dirk, let me come to you. Uh, so you um, purport to be able to revolutionize digital identity. So are we on the right track here? So if you look at some of the issues that we've already raised here, are, are we going in the right direction? Or are we sort of um, going in the wrong direction? So give us a few insights about what does revolutionizing digital identity uh, actually mean in practice? And then I want to ask you a, few, a couple of questions really about the problems, because what I don't want us to get across is that everything's rosy. There are clearly some issues. And so I want to know what the challenges are as well. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks for the introduction. So um, maybe I start. The first thing is, what, what do we mean by digital identity? So in the offline world, you think identity is uh, you take out your passport and show it to someone, and then maybe it happens. Yeah? You do go to a bank and open a bank account, or you cross a border, or whatever. But that is, of course, not digital identity. So that is offline identity. Digital identity is far more. Digital identity has sort of three aspects. One is, of course, proving that my identity data is there, that my name is Dirk, and I was born there, and I live in Germany, and my shoe size is 42. These are identity data which are maybe verified. I call it identification. That's one thing. So I need that in a digital world to prove that I live there, or I was born there, or I, I'm, I'm over 18 or something. Second. It's all about access, because in the offline world, you just enter a door, or you go there and take your key. But in the digital world, access, meaning I have to approve that I'm Dirk, and I'm allowed to go here in. So go into it. Sometimes you call it login. But of course, password and username is just one side. So you can also enter the digital world in far different methods. We call it multi-factor authentication, yeah, somehow. So you take your biometrics, for instance, on, so get into your phone. Yeah? That is access, sort of getting in. And there's no really offline sort of equivalent to it. So we have to discuss how to make access really secure. And third, it's authentic so authorization. So approve something, giving consent to something. Sometimes you call it sign a contract that I, yes, I will do sort of, I approve that. I sign that contract, but you do it in the digital world and you call it authorization. So and these three aspects, I call it digital identity core. So, and sometimes you always talk about that one and that one, but you have to come up with, it, with, with all three aspects of digital identity. That's one thing. So going back, what's in there? So states, maybe in, in, in Germany and Europe, they start to think, oh, I have to come up with an electronic ID. So maybe I put a ship on a, on, a, on a cart, like in the passport after 9-11, the international sort of states decided to put a ship into the passport. There's a fingerprint and a picture and all that. But can I really use my passport today to log in into my mobile phone or to log in into the government's website or to sign a contract? No. But so states are really focusing on proving the identity, the first, the first segment I mentioned. So that I'm Dirk, that I, I was born there, that my date of birth is there, my name is real, and all that. But they have no clue about getting a secure access for the citizen and getting a good consent or approval of the citizen. So states are focusing on identification, but forget a little bit about access and, and, and uh, uh, approval. So on the other hand, the global players are really taking care of all the three elements. So Google, for instance, Facebook, Apple, and Amazon, they come up with a really good Facebook sign-in. So with Facebook, you can go into the digital doors or through the doors. Yeah, you can log in somewhere. With, with, with Amazon, you can pay, so you approve a transaction. Yeah, or maybe with Microsoft, you can authenticate with a second factor. So they already offer really nice services, and they actually don't have really identity data. 
but they will go right into that now. So Apple recently, uh, I think one month ago, Apple posted a patent, actually two patents. One patent is to put a, a sort of a passport we use to cross border, to travel around the world, to put a passport on the iPhone, put a patent on it. So making, I know how to put a passport on the iPhone, so no one can do it as well. The second, the second patent they, they, they issued also one month ago, put an international driving license on the iPhone, sort of protect that, the driving licenses on that smartphone. <coughs> Google did it also, so they came up with the API on Android, saying, all right, I do it sort of the same on Android than the Apple guys do it on iOS. So they will come up in the next maybe 12 months, 24 months, with a real nice identity portfolio for all of us. And we will use that all because it's for free, it's easy, it's a one-click experience, and it's safe because from the technology, they know what to do. So what, what, what sort of in two years, so I think that that is done, it's good. But what the problem is about, then Apple decides whether you can sort of cross a border, maybe. Apple decides if you have a valid passport, a uh, driving license when a policeman stops you. Google will decide whether you, your visa is, is, is approved. And maybe also Amazon will decide someday if, if you cannot pay something in, in the digital world anymore. So the reason is, so that is, that is all true, no, no discussion about it, and I don't want to sort of come up with really sort of bad uh, interpretation of the, of the future, but I, I'm really worried. I'm really worried, and I can't see that, uh, that the, the countries, even in Europe or the, uh, the international member states, of the, of the UN will actually got that information and got the feeling that, oh, we have to protect our citizen and come up with a sort of a worldwide, maybe, open digital ID platform with a lot of providers. I mean, not, there will not be only one. Of course, we have very good sort of solutions here and there, and they're gonna, with an open, trustworthy network, sort of not intended to sell the data, not intended to actually um, sort of make big profit out of it, but to make sure that citizens on that planet have a real chance to go safely in the digital world as we do actually assure to go safely in the offline world. So, and I'm sort of, that's, that's my message, and I think we should really think about that. Well, that should have got everybody worried. Um, but tell me, how would you rate the user experience today on digital identity? And what would be the one, two, three steps that we can, uh, we can how can we improve it? Yeah, <clears throat> of course, uh, that, that was the one killer um, sort of criteria will be the usability, unfortunately. It will not be privacy, because no one is caring about privacy. If you want to buy something, you click yes, 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 every one of us. If you, if you think about security, it could, could be the criteria. No way. No one is, is actually interested in security. It's, I, I really, I, I always come up with sort of, if I go into the car, a, a new car, and then I drive, I don't check the security standards, and I don't come up with my airbag under my wing, on, under my arm, and put it in because I think, oh, that security feature I need to install here. I expect that when I go into the car, it drives, and easy. So the same should be a, sort of, should our sort of vision when we go into a voting system, or a payment transaction system, or an identification system. It all should be in. Privacy by default, security by design, no options, no consent, it's just in there. So the only sort of criteria will be for the adoption rate on people will be usability. And then we have to go to Apple and Google again and say, they're going to sort of go into the market with a one-click experience. We should come up with that as well. And, and Linda, how, how do you respond to uh, what you've just heard here, particularly when you look at it through um, a, an African lens? Um, OK. In, in Africa, governments are more powerful than Amazon and Google. And so I'll, I'll just maybe comment and say, on your point on who decides, we had a question in Kenya on the fact that the primary document for digital identity registration is your birth certificate if you're a baby, 
uh, and your national ID if you're an ad adult over 18. So what that means is that w when I register on Huduma number, um, it means anybody who's registering me as a government official is actually making a citizenship decision. Yet it should not be a question on citizenship, but getting everybody on the platform. So I agree with you on the question about Amazon making decisions around who goes to what country and what content. And I think we did not elect Amazon in a democratic society to issue such, uh, such sort of you know, uh, questions. And then maybe the, the second one will be on, I think digital ID is very crucial. And in my part of the world, the Global South, it's government, you can access government services without an identity. In certain cases, in certain countries, government is not as powerful to offer all these services. But most of the services we have there is actually government issued. If we talk about refugees and accessing, um, you, know, uh, you know, if they're having access to food, to all these ratios, you know, they need that particular identity. So I'd say, look at it in the lens of surveillance as well. The data collection is great in real time. Um, but I'd say, uh, for instance, in Kenya, the government came with a draft law that required that if I register for the digital ID, I have to put in my GPS location, I put on my number, and I put my email. If I change any of that document, or any of those details, I have to inform government, otherwise it becomes a criminal offense. So criminalizing it, but also getting data, real-time data in the hands of governments that may be rogue, means that there will be even an increase on surveillance. So I think um, you scaring us also just means that in our side of the world, we are scared even more when there's no a check and a balance on government. And so I think these two needs to be hand in hand. Um, my, my very famous quote is on Amazon and Google. They have a lot of data on us, but they do not run an army. They don't run a government. They don't, you know, they don't have members of parliament to back them up, you know, unless maybe they lobby them. But our governments have armies and can do all these things to us. So I'd say um, there needs to be a check and a balance on you. We have collected this information, but if it's a government-issued ID that is mandatory, it means that we need a check and a balance. And uh, tech companies should, you know, help even within the framework that can I control my data? Can I see what government has on me? Can I take it back, and one of the questions we had in our country is as a user, do I have a public access portal that I can actually take back my consent and say, by the way, I'm withdrawing consent. When that's not available on any platform, then it means it's not user-friendly, it's not human-centric. Very, very good, Sebastian? Yes, I wanted to come in on the aspect of usability. So um, I agree that um, uh, digital identity it doesn't have a chance if it's not connected to an attractive service that people want to use. And um, I think if we want to overcome that issue of uh, certain companies having uh, big uh, influence on uh, or kind of creating lock-in markets for them through their own identities, uh, I think governments have a task here to uh, come together and um, to work on this kind of open standard and to create a critical mass which should be easy to achieve when you have certain public services that can only be accessed um, or that can also be accessed through uh, the digital channel and that creates uh, significant benefits for the for the citizens. Uh, I think then um, th such identity can be adopted quite rapidly, and and when you get to that point, it will also make sense for companies to take that mechanism uh, to use that as a practical way of authentication, which maybe doesn't have to rely on passwords anymore, and which could be ideally much easier for for citizens to use. And um, I think for that, it's important to have a dialogue also with the uh, citizens and to see them also as customers, see what kind of digital services do they expect from the government, and then to see what's, what's necessary to um, provide those services. It will often be, uh, require some painful uh, adjustments in the government processes. They have to digitize everything um, from end to end, uh, break down data silos, um, and also change some, lo some laws, some restrictions on data localization, for instance, or even privacy in some cases. So um, it's a very complex uh, issue, and we're experiencing this also in Germany uh, for a long time now. Yeah. Very good panel. Thanks. Michael, do you want to come on? Just before we close. Maybe a very short comment, and uh, hopefully I'm not sounding too naive. And I, I heard you, Dirk, saying nobody cares about privacy. It will be yes, yes. It's only about usability. We do see globally a bit of a trend that people, societies, are more a matter of uh, really understanding what they are doing in the light of a certain experience collected in the context of some votes. Um, and uh, we see that in other parts of the world there's, there's more appetite and interest to take 
privacy and people more serious. And I think for the business, now I'm back on with my business classes, I think there's opportunity for a bit of differentiation. So it's not taking away the usability, I fully agree, this is key, but if on top of it you can really kind of provide the required transparency and require and, and provide trust in, in what you are offering, I see huge opportunity in that. Very good, panel. Thank you very much indeed. Now, this is your chance to uh, participate and to share your ideas. My quick reckoning is there's about 60 of us in this room, and we've got five breakouts, and we're going to do 15 minutes at uh, each breakout. So you've got a choice of two of five breakouts. And the panel are going to moderate uh, one of the breakouts. So let me just try and uh, summarize where the breakouts are. They're on the screen there for you so that you can see the titles. But breakout one, which is user agency, is on this flip chart here. Um, the breakout on um, vendor neutral identity and data approaches with uh, Sebastian is in the middle. And on the far right-hand side, as I look uh, down there, we've got uh, user cases and high consumer value with Dirk. So what user agency, neutrality, and um, consumer sort of high value cases down there. And on this side, uh, with Michael, uh, group four is going to be looking at collaboration. And then group five uh, is going to be with Solana, who's uh, joining us from Mozilla. And we're going to look there at particularly how do we get engagement across uh, our stakeholder community. So looking at citizens, consumer, and civil society. So could you break, go to the uh, flip chart that uh, most interests you. I will shout in 15 minutes, then we'll rotate. And then what we'll do is we'll summarize uh, conclusions from each of the groups uh, towards the end. Thanks very much indeed. Of Thank 
Can you be the same Can you both at the point, but that's it. How does that how does that work? <laughs> how, how would I say that? Space for identity. So is this well, kind of it's both, right? It's the best practice, or so? And, and is that uh, applied somewhere? Generally, it's that requires open source or yeah. Yeah. The, the existing one. So these are all company examples so far. Um, is, uh, do you see a role for governments to Yeah, could be another example for for a use case, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I probably don't want to discuss that right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
So the, the government accepts mm -hmm. in privately issued. And and in Korea, um, you said it also it confirms a bit. Have you heard of the FIDO Alliance? Um, that's they, they work on a different uh, new application. Yeah. I mean, that's one part, of course. Right? <laughs> So maybe we can so we can distill some best practices from these examples, kind of to generalize. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this anonymization, does it actually work, this anonymization, or, um, but can you, like, yeah. 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 so it can be traced back under any circumstances, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. For example, yeah. Okay, so they know that you are who you. They, yeah, they know sense, you, yeah. you. You. You are who you think you are, but they don't know who you are. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. So, 
Identity mixer, how does that uh, come in? Best practices. Yeah. That identity mixer is correct, yeah. um, but if you're looking for best practices, it's W3C. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. there's, there's no water here. This is a. I, I, I what is this? A standard? Or? <laughs> 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 yeah. They did. <laughs> Switzerland. Ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be time to change. So if you want to stay where you are, then feel free to stay. Otherwise, um, now's the moment to uh, change and go to another, another group. And we've got 15 minutes in the second round, and then we'll come back together again. So feel free to change or stay where you are if you want to. This is, this, this is not blockchain either, necessarily, right? It, could, it can be. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for that. I think you want to move on maybe to the next session. In this case, it's high consumer value. And in fact, it doesn't sound like high consumer value. So this, is, this is then the whole point to not have evidence anymore, to not be identifiable by the system. But the best way to not be tracked is to just not be identifiable at all. In many cases, like I'm, I'm, I'm quite a, a like my feeling is quite against a lot of the identity systems. Because in most cases, I would like to find ways in which we can protect people's privacy by not having to identify us. <laughs> it's like when I go into the shoe shop, you said, like, you have shoe size 42, you just, just right? Um, you don't have to show your ID card with your shoe size, because they only need to know your shoe size. Um, when, yeah, so exactly. When you're when you're for designing systems that allow you to show only what you need to show. When you buy Anko in a shop, there's no reason to show the name from and your birth date. Uh, only the thing you need to know is whether you're in the shop. So the, I think the great thing we should think of in a lot of these use cases yeah. yes. is not yes, I how, can, I do. how do people currently yeah. ask for your identity and how can we make it easier? Yeah. The question yeah. is, yeah. what can okay. we... Uh, how can so we, yeah, we, we talked about many two yeah. systems that are Ideally, existing right now to, uh, to ensure vendor neutral identity. The first one is uh, W3C, um, verifiable claims. It's just the first version of a standard that's been adopted. And it came from blockchain and it's about um, basically it uh, enables you to um, say who you are without telling the other person who you, who you are. So they just know that you, you are the person that you're in. That's anonymous. And um, that's important. And yeah, in, in this case, I, indeed. So pseudonymous IDs, uh, yeah, so object capabilities in the online world, like, we need way more things that are not linked to a person. Yeah, so privately. Yeah. The use case, yeah, use case. So the use case probably is just rent. stay uh, as private as possible. I would love to step a few steps back and wonder if we want to. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 
exactly. I want to just have some kind of token that proves that I paid, some kind of ticket, some kind of things. It doesn't need to have my name, it doesn't need to have my address or whatever. And in many of the cases when you think like how do people use IDs, how can it make it more convenient? Also, if you want to have privacy, data minimization, uh, everything by design, like if you want to have more rights respecting stuff, don't ask yourself, how can I identify it? How can I not identify mm -hmm. it and still get a service? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now I'll go to another chapter and have to think about it. Maybe you would, because you would like to go to the YouTube shop and the guy comes from the field of choose. Say hello. 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 The last 50 okay. years. <laughs> I can share it when I want to. If it's linked to my face in a database that they have, good point. Yeah, there are probably some kind of shoes he doesn't want to show anybody. Uh, that is definitely. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Something more, yeah. yeah.
sugar yourself. Can I give an uh, example with my terrible English? Sorry. Uh, it's uh, from Turkey. It's called e pus. Pus, right? That's called e nabus. And uh, every health data is uh, you must give to the government. And when if you in a Krankenhaus a hospital, you must give your fingerprint. A guy, uh, it's it's okay. If you flu, uh, if you have flu, or Krebs, or cancer, or you must give before uh, your fingerprint. Before anything, uh, before you the doctor see. For, uh, in entrance, you, yeah, of course, in Turkey, everything is full automated. As well. if, if you have, I don't understand, if you have one chip card password, 
Why you don't chip card identity card? Uh, why you don't? Uh, why you need? Uh, you are all talking about uh, must I give my information? Must I give my consent or not? If you have a chip card password identity card for governance. Okay, if we could passport. begin to wrap up and, and uh, come autumn, back and take your seats, that would be great. And we'll have a little bit of a debrief. If, if so, hospital, if the moderators could already, come back everything. to the front. You don't invite facial recognition. And everything if we could retake our don't. seats, thank you. Not, not only government, because these projects uh, in governments made by companies. So company and government is the same body, actually, not separate. Who is state? Who is corporate? It's the yeah. same. Uh, uh, in, in this, uh, for example, I mean, in hospital, for example, I mean. Or, uh, yeah. Point system, <laughs> you might. Okay. 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 Like bank credit. Yeah, like it's like a scoring, right? Scoring. Right. Cool. You should not be so lucky, but you could. Because then this is that then they would think they would not pay anything. But now there's no way around. Yeah. Yeah. Between if state and company, they take all the data and put in one database, and this database is share it between all the parties. All companies, state, and then. Is it a governmental project or? And everything, everything is digitalized in Turkey. Is it a governmental project or? I can understand now why you said that. Corporates are the same. Governments and corporates. No, in some cases, in some, in some other use cases, they are different. Because the government is using data for a certain purpose. Yes. And uh, companies for selling and for It's different. In this use case, yes, they are. So the, they are trying to sell a service. The government is not so it's free, but is it free? It's free. Thanks very much for the engagement, everyone. That was, uh, it was excellent. Let's try and get a quick summary from our moderators on some of the key points that came out of the uh, groups. Uh, what we're looking for are some insights around. Um, key points in the discussion, examples that came out, ideas that we should be looking uh, going forward. And I know a number of you were taking photographs of the various flip charts. We'll make sure that if you want to take photographs of the other flip charts, that they'll stay there at the end of, the, um, uh, of this particular session. But Linda, let me start with you. You were looking at uh, user agency. How do we get meaningful consent? A uh, couple of minutes on some key points that came out of your discussion. OK. Um, first of all, my, my team, everyone on my team was very intelligent. I think we were the most intelligent in the room. Um, and so, please, uh, let's, let's exchange business cards afterwards. Uh, but two, we had various issues come up, and especially on, um, on how, do we, 
how do, how do we get uh, consent, especially from governments? Because there was a general feel that when we go into elections, we already give government consent to do anything they want. <laughs> so with digital ID, can you opt out of government issued ID? Um, and so the suggestion was to have transactional consent so that the consent is not only at elections or when we have government come in place, but actually on every transaction that we have within the government issued ID. Um, then the issue of optionality, there was also a point on second factor authentication, especially online, on how um, that would help on consent. We, there was a general idea that there needs to be education that we could have education on what meaningful consent entails. Um, and this continuous education is, um, um, should be done hand in hand with the rest of the interventions. Um, then we also had an idea on um, um, platform cooperatives and digital identity unions where people come together and actually give consent within their union um, or within their platform. So I, th I thought that was a great idea. Rather than face the big tech companies who are issuing a digital ID on your own, that you can actually do it through a union. Um, and then there was also uh, um, a, a suggestion on uh, user modification of global rules uh, so that it can be modified for individuals. But on the other hand, we could also have regional modification that a company would actually issue um, global rules, but then countries can choose to opt in or out as a country on this particular um, consent issue. The various platforms, like uh, various issues and advice and um, suggestions, as I mentioned, were very intelligent, uh, but I'll stop there due to time. Super, thanks very much indeed. Uh, Solana, welcome. Um, thanks very much indeed for joining us at the top table. Um, Solana, you were looking at the whole question of uh, engagement across citizens, consumers, and civil society. So a few key points from your group. Sure. Um, as you might expect, most of the people who came to our group uh, insisted how important it was to have civil society engagement in processes that tend to be very opaque and closed. Um, a lot of the conversation was surrounding the implementation of new digital ID systems um, and how frustrating it can be to see them rolled out without having a chance to give consent, um, without understanding properly what's going on, um, and as civil society finding it very difficult to engage actually in the process. So when we were discussing, discussing best practices, um, it's about openness in terms of the process, um, it's about uh, building a culture of trust, and I think we were also discussing both in terms of um, the companies and, and what kinds of best practices they um, adhere to when it comes to um, how to do business in a part of the world where there might not be data privacy regulation, um, but also technologically, what kind of um, access does both civil society and government have to the technology that's being rolled out? Um, how can you have insight or um, considered feedback on something that you can't fully see or understand? Um, so that was, uh, we discussed cases in a number of different countries, but um, I think it was a common, a common finding for all that it's important for these processes to be open. And, and Solana, would there be uh, one or two countries that you would point to where uh, there may be some glimmers of, uh, of best practice? Uh, we talked about Estonia um, as having a, a good case. Um, and there was some mention of Japan. Uh, and we discussed aspects of both the UK and Brazil. Um, but I think there, it's, um, when you're talking about civil society engagement, I think the, the work is never done, so to speak. Um, it's something where not just the implementation process has to be open, but there has to be a, a dialogue and a method of accountability that continues over time. Um, it's not just a, a static thing, but something that keeps evolving and moving. I, I think what becomes very interesting is that we can all learn from what's going on in different countries because no one has quite got it right. And so how can we keep on learning best practice from what we see, bits of sort of collaboration, bits of ways that uh, engagement is taking place. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for sharing uh, that. Um, let me go to Sebastian. Actually, I'd like to uh, go next to the um, neutrality question and uh, hear a little bit more about uh, what was coming up from your group. 
Yes, thank you. So uh, there were two main themes that I would uh, summarize from, from, from our discussion. Uh, protecting users and enabling portability. Um, in order to protect users, um, uh, anonymous identification was mentioned. Um, so uh, being able to identify yourself without uh, revealing um, who you are um, as being part of a, a subset, a subgroup uh, of data um, that can be linked, but it's not necessarily linked to blockchain, uh, decentralized um, identification. Um, another way um, to protect users is uh, to um, use um, trust, trusted gatekeepers. Um, for instance, government verification of privately issued uh, identities. Um, there are already uh, some examples uh, for that. Also to enable um, as what we called multiple direction access, which would um, protect users from um, being taken away their identity or their identity being, being stolen or just closed down by an operator and then uh, blocking them from accessing other services. Um, then uh, on portability, um, Open source um, uh, was mentioned uh, repeatedly. Um, also, the need to work on inter interoperable uh, standards. There are a variety um, of, of uh, standards out there already, um, some of them in, in their kind of early version, um, but some, some good work already existing. And then we also discussed a bit on how to get there, how to uh, get these standards uh, adopted and further uh, uh, spread. Um, one. Uh, proposal was to, uh, yeah, there, there was a need to engage with the intermediaries uh, that are uh, relevant here, um, including, for instance, the, the mobile operators, but also the um, large platforms that uh, are dominant, uh, dominating some of the identities at the moment, and um, creating incentives for businesses as well to, to use, make use of open identities. Very good, thank you, for, thank you for that. Michael, in terms of uh, collaboration, uh, w were there any interesting sort of insights that you picked around models for collaboration going forward or any examples that you can point to? Uh, yes, sure, First, thanks a lot. We had a few very interesting examples, maybe two, two three quick observations. The first one is uh, maybe self-evident, however, I think important to stress out, it is clearly about Nobody can do it alone, so you, you need to have uh, the, the government clearly on board and the regulator when it comes to certain sensitive activities around identities. So that is not, not new, but it was confirmed by everybody. We heard about one case from the UK, um, which I would call a really interesting case in the sector of, of banking. Uh, so the traditional banking is preventing that certain uh, population is getting access to, to, to money, clearly to loans, um, and students uh, kind of, there's a startup working together with the university and the public authorities, um, allowing actually that the students are, without the traditional banking approach, getting via a platform um, money. So loans and they can pay it back in the financial services is a good one. Uh, I think blockchain uh, technology is playing a certain role. And and then, uh, just that you heard the name, we have in the first row there, Michael, who already in, in, in France, I think, developed a digital identity. He uh, kind of uh, uh, showed this example, working together with Interpol and Europol and others. Uh, very interesting case. So if you have time after the, uh, after the session, uh, please, maybe you raise your hand shortly. <laughs> uh, very interesting discussion uh, with him. Thanks a lot. Thank you for that. And, um, Dirk, coming to you, um, you obviously had a, a very animated discussion down there about um, uh, high value use cases and particularly, um, uh, as I say, how do you get that user centricity into all that we're doing? So what was your key take out? Yeah, thanks for all who contributed to that. That was a really nice discussion. <laughs> Uh, also, also controversial. So no, actually we identified two examples. You know that all the Estonia example, everyone loves it, everyone likes it. Uh, I don't uh, sort of, I like it as well, but uh, so uh, no words about that. But another good example was uh, actually uh, a transportation. So when we have a ticket uh, and you have a sort of a long-term ticket, which costs maybe a few hundreds or a few thousand euros or dollars, you have to pre prevent that as sort of that, that someone else is using that, so we have to show it. And there's a good uh, um, example from Tallinn, it's called Yelby, and I think that is also uh, now uh, a roll out it, uh, roll, rolled out in, in Berlin, I've heard. But also we discussed uh, sort of future use cases which are not really sort of uh, solved yet, uh, but will be, will be sort of 
that we push the identity, the digital identity, maybe in the market, and then will sort of that that everyone accepted it more. That one is uh, the the voting. So sort of voting is one of the crucial things. Yeah. So we discussed it, how difficult it is to come up with a good e-voting system. And another one is uh, we discussed a lot about sort of getting back your sovereignty and to control and sort of uh, taking back, for instance, the consent in the e-commerce sector. The e-commerce sector is, from my opinion, sort of lost already. So everyone has at least 100 accounts somewhere in some shops, and they have your data for the uh, next 5,000 years, yeah, at least. So you have no control about the data, and your consent you're giving. So uh, getting that back and saying, please delete that. I don't want to get your emails anymore. I don't want to be tracked. That is really hard, and if, when these use cases are coming up, that will, with a nice sort of digital identity solution from whoever, sort of, then that would be a, give us a good push. Very good, and let me just uh, wrap up with a few sort of thoughts for uh, all of you. Um, if you think about digital identity going forward, then I'd like you to go away thinking a little bit about the hardware side and the software side. Because it seems to me that as we talk about digital identity, it's very easy to get into a discussion about uh, standards, interoperability, how can we leverage technology, role of blockchain. And that is clearly very important. And we can use technology to help us with how we're going to take digital identity forward. But it seems to me you can't have the hardware without the software. And so we've talked quite a lot about the importance of getting the dialogue right, the right people in the room, the way that we have those dialogues, the importance of collaboration going forward. And I think the key message that I hope you'll take away from this is that this is a complex area. There are lots of contexts that needs to be understood. There isn't a one-size-fits-all model. But that if we're going to get for go forward in a constructive way, we have to get the hardware components right with the software components. And that if we look at the end result of what it is that we bring together, ultimately the user centricity is absolutely critical. Because if the users don't buy into the digital identity systems, they won't actually use them at the end of the day. And I think Dirk gave us also one or two sort of warning signals that if we don't get that right going forward, there are some potential consequences in the longer term which we might have to deal with. And that usually ends up with a hammer trying to hit a nut. So with that, I'd like to thank the panel very much indeed for your insights. Thank you very much in two, uh, two, to all of you for contributing. Uh, we'll take these ideas away way and we'll work on them and I know that I can't end this particular session without Linda saying to me there's a law tech festival going on in Nairobi at the beginning of March if you want more details talk to Linda but with that thanks very much indeed and enjoy the rest of IGF thanks a lot When this
Hello, everybody. Um, we're going to start the session now. Uh, we'd love to have your thoughts on artificial intelligence for SDGs. Hello everybody, how are you doing? Long day. <laughs> okay. Um, today is our session on artificial intelligence for the sustainable development goals, or artificial intelligence readiness for the sustainable development goals. And what we hope, it, hope to have is uh, some breakaway sessions uh, in which we solicit from you, the IGF attendees, uh, what would be uh, opportunities to using artificial intelligence to achieve the sustainable development goals, what would be challenges for artificial intelligence achieving the sustainable development goals, what are the harms, uh, possible harms from artificial intelligence and sustainable development goals, and then how we would measure progress towards using artificial intelligence for achieving the sustainable development goals. Could we have someone from the audience explain to us what the sustainable development goals are? Does anyone want, who, who doesn't know about the sustainable development goals? Okay. So um, when you break up into the sessions, I'll put the sustainable development goals up there. Um, we have 12 or 17 sustainable development goals. Um, and the uh, IGF is themed around them. So first I j want to introduce the panelists. The panelists will be responsible for facilitating discussion, but I want uh, from each of the groups someone to volunteer to rapporteur. So we're either gonna rapporteur on a piece of paper or by following one of these two links. So we'll have table one here table two here, table three on that corner, and table four on that corner. Um, I would just like a introduction from each of the panelists and um, their perspective on using AI for the SDGs. Uh, they'll either be answering one of the four questions provided or yeah, offering their perspective on what is honestly quite a large topic. Um, so we'll start with uh, Greg Shannon from Carnegie Mellon University. Carnegie Mellon University is the university that's famous for computer emergency response teams. And Greg, you are a cybersecurity expert, is that correct? Yes, correct. So thank you. So yes, I'm the chief scientist at the CERT division uh, at uh, the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, as noted, we uh, started CERT uh, back in 1988. Uh, with the Morris Worm, the first uh, uh, multi-platform international incident uh, <clears throat> that needed a coordinated response. Um, so you might wonder why I'm talking to you about artificial intelligence. Well, it's yet another technology that is 
uh, taking the world by storm, and there's opportunities for it to do uh, a great deal of good. And you know, as you know, Carnegie Mellon is a, a leader in artificial intelligence, and we have, in, in terms of developing the technologies and applying the technologies. And relative to the SDGs, one of the key aspects, and I think this was borne out in some of the one of the earlier sessions this morning, uh, you know, artificial intelligence is is a an advanced capability. It requires connectivity. It requires uh, capacity, capability uh, at a technical level to deal with, to understand and conceptualize data at some rudimentary level. So it certainly challenges, uh, you know, uh, uh, digital um, literacy. If there's not digital literacy, you really are going to have a very difficult time enabling AI to have an impact uh, other than in terms of what a multinational or a, a large government might be able to do. Um, you know, what we see where, where AI really takes off is when there's good, easy to use tools. Uh, and, you know, the open source community has done a, a good job so far, though it still does require a great deal of uh, technical competency. But that's also the best place to uh, uh, come to an initial understanding, but also then to incorporate protections and concepts to, say, protect data privacy or te techniques for ensuring fairness. And so that's part of the, uh, the strengths of that open source, open source approach, in part because it is a multi-stakeholder approach uh, in terms of who contributes and who uses uh, those platforms. So there's no exclusion as to who can, who can access it. Uh, I think what, you know, at, uh, at CERT, uh, Carnegie Mellon, what we understand is there are going to be vulnerabilities, uh, weaknesses of a different flavor, if you will, than we've seen in the past relative to cybersecurity, and this is kind of coming through in the notion of harms. There's general uh, algorithmic approaches that have some particular weaknesses that, that can be easily biased, that can easily be uh, manipulated, uh, can easily be mistrained as part of the work that we do to help uh, clarify and highlight those. The research community has been doing a great deal of work in this area to try and improve the quality of these, these algorithms uh, and their implementations. Um, so I, I'll close in just saying that, you know, supporting the, the SDGs um, requires data when it comes to AI. And I think that's really going to be the key aspect of uh, who can put their fingers on data. And AI is, uh, as, as, uh, uh, as we've seen, can actually do some interesting things with a little bit of data, uh, especially when there's a well-trained model or a uh, uh, reasonably robust trained model. Uh, for helping classify, you can imagine, you know, a farmer wanting to quickly identify what sort of insect uh, is uh, attacking their plant, you know, taking a picture of the leaf and uh, being able to identify that. It's similar to applications where, you know, you can take a picture of your hand and identify, get a quick diagnosis to, you know, maybe you have skin cancer or something that you should go get checked. Uh, so the ability to develop easy to use applications, I think, can have a huge impact uh, on something even as, as uh, important as uh, zero hunger. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, Donggi. Uh, you are, I think, from the South Korean Youth IGF. Is that correct? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Yeah. So he's uh, <laughs> a technical expert, a technical community and uh, youth contingent from Korea. Could you tell us a bit more about yourself and about AI for SDGs? All right. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dong Lee, and I'm from South Korea. I'm a currently a, a the community member of Korea Internet Governance Alliance to organize KRIGF, which stands for Korea Internet Governance Forum, especially the first youth session by myself in this year. And I'm also an IMA graduate student majoring in the industrial engineering, specialized in service engineering. So as I do consider how apply artificial intelligence in the shape of the service, I have to understand different stakeholders. That is why I would like to suggest that we do treat artificial intelligence as a tool rather than a complicated technology for sustainable development goals for this time. As a viewpoint of technology, rapid 
development of artificial intelligence has made extensibility broad, and what we have to do consider as a policy, policy side. Mostly, artificial intelligence is well known for magic, like making video or the image for only one second. But it is all about finding pattern, including text and whether structure or unstructured data. So artificial intelligence could be a useful tool to collect different opinion and idea, which single manpower cannot cover tons of the raw data from all over the world, especially online. In the past, it occurred via interpretation, usually depending who collect the data and how they understand. For example, we collect news data and social media data to understand what things interest people, and the result of automa automated collecting data, data could be a resource to interactive reference for decision making. As AI is not almighty technology, this is my point that it is a great tool to gather voice of people all over the world. In the past, new policy and regulations, especially related with SDGs, were applied all at once. However, we can customize a policy and adjust depending on variables, such as a level of understanding and an infrastructure, geopolitical issue, and so on. Through the dynamic usage of AI, I believe we can find effective method to implement the SDGs with broader coverage and increased productivity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next is my colleague Raymond from the Regional Academic Network on IT Policy. Uh, Raymond, I, and Sarah Keaton are working on artificial intelligence in Africa. So Raymond will introduce himself as well as his perspectives on AI for SDGs. Thank you, Alex. I think I've been introduced, so I'll just move straight to my opening, opening thoughts with regards to artificial intelligence readiness for the SDGs and what that will actually mean for from a developing economy perspective, especially for Africa. While we note that in the, the AI era brings with it the data revolution that is critical for promoting and achieving the SDGs, or at least if not helping in different areas to achieve the SDGs, but also to measure progress based on an analysis of the data uh, the increased data that could be made available with these technologies, then we can know how far or how well we have gone in meeting the SDGs, and also to know who has been included and who has been excluded from the process. So that's a critical uh, uh, imperative for AI within the SDG contest. So having access to massive amounts of data, it's helpful for countries to plan, to design and implement development and public policies in general. So for developing countries, this presents leapfrogging possibilities for the fourth industrial revolution, especially with regards to critical societal issues that have bedrossed uh, the region since now. So digital intelligence obtained through the processing of data can provide a way without for structural transformation and also position them for some form of competitive advantage when uh, it is done within the context of proper institutional governance and all. So what is critical? What will it, what will it then mean for uh, a region like Africa to be ready to harness the potentials of this technology? I'd just like to highlight two critical uh, aspects. One is on the soft part, what I would call the software, and the other on the hardware. On the soft part of it will require the re redefinition of the principles, the norms, and policies for data governance in the digital era, especially with regards to the traditional instruments that we have used to govern these processes before now. And then there is also the need to restructure the institutional configurations for sustainable development and governance as closely related to the capacity to adopt new rules and to adapt international structures to govern data and AI and their impact on our lives and rights. This will involve um, re restructuring the data architecture systems and trying to make them more open 
and I'm making sure that there is available data that is interoperable, that is digitally uh, uh, transmittable in formats that can be used to improve the analysis that can help policy making and actual interventions in different critical sectors uh, that the SDGs hope to improve. So although data and AI related laws and policies are nascent in most of these de uh, developing countries, in contrast to perhaps Europe uh, with the GDPR, concerns around biases and consequences for rights are still persistent within uh, the region with the increasing developments of this technology. So when we talk about structural equality, when we talk about non-discrimination uh, non and, and all that, it's been flagged by uh, civil rights groups. And then there, there needs to be, uh, it is vital to recognize that AI governance will require a more comprehensive approach that balances data, not just as a personal identity, but also as an economic resource, considering the new African continental trade agreement regime within the region. So it's not just important to protect and highlight security, but also to understand that this data can be a critical asset to leapfrog in the region with regards to the, its social economy. So for me, those are some of the critical aspects that Africa or developing regions should look at if we want to say that we are ready or we are prepared to harness the, the uh, verities that AI what will help in achieving some of these SDG targets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raymond. Uh, Sarah Keaton, also a colleague of ours at the Regional Academic Network on IT Policy, ran ITP, uh, is a PhD candidate at Dundee University. What is your discipline again? Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Kiden. I am a PhD student at the University of Dundee. I'm working on a project between the University of Dundee and Mozilla, and we're trying to advocate for connected products that are secure, open, and trustworthy. Um, yeah, so I'll be focusing on Internet of Things for communities and neighborhoods. Thank you. Could you offer us a perspective on AI for SDGs and maybe if you like the Internet of Things angle, why it's important for AI? <laughs> so I'm surprising Sarah because I asked her to help moderate. <laughs> Sure. Um, we're going to do breakaway panels now for, let's say, half an hour, and then we can report back and have discussions with the panelists. Is there anyone here who, like, really hates breakaway sessions? Anyone here who really hates breakaway sessions? <laughs> no. Okay. Sure. I've I'm sure everybody does. <laughs> well, oh. I think it's, it's a matter of what's most productive. Pardon? Me. What's, what's most productive for you to achieve your goal of uh, the, the break session? The breakaway sessions, because then the report writes itself. Uh, no, <laughs> I, what, we, what we really want is your input. So it, yeah, maybe we have a vote. Breakaway sessions, or are we going to just open it to the floor now? Who goes for breakaway sessions? Hands up. Opening it to the floor? OK. So, should we just open it up then? Okay. I'll ask the dis... dis yeah, I think that might be an issue. Last time we were, last year we were too big, now we are too small. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, well, then I'll ask you all to introduce yourself briefly when your question, uh, when, when you would like to make your question or your input. And I then would ask, yeah, explain who you are, your stakeholder group, and then we can dive into it. So we're first going to deal with uh, opportunities for harnessing AI for the SDGs. Um, and would anyone like to chime in on an example from their home country on opportunities for AI and SDG? Do you want a rapporteur for each question? Oh, you will. Okay. okay. Um, thank you. My name... If anyone wants to take notes, that's fine. Um, they can reach me at the end of the session, but we'll be rapporteuring and uh, integrating a report. Sure. 
My name is Alberto Diaz. I am co-founder from uh, in the startup uh, based in Berlin called Hedera Sustainable Solutions. And we do impact monitoring, which means that we um, cooperate with local institutions and collect data from uh, poor households to draw first a baseline, identify basic needs, and address these needs through uh, projects that are then executed by these local institutions. And then we aim to be able to uh, track on, on the advancements um, identified in, in the region. So uh, we do use AI. We uh, use it most of all for clustering in the moment to identify uh, common, common, uh, common features in, uh, in a very uh, rich and diverse data set of thousands and thousands of uh, variables. Um, and um, the, the thing that I want to underline here is that uh, the, the input or the fuel for AI will always be data. And if the focus is uh, sustainability and um, the only way to, to make sure that this actually is addressed is by asking the right set of questions or collecting the right kind of data in the location itself. Um, I am not very keen into addressing development in regions based on aggregated data or data um, obtained from statistical observations, but rather the data should be collected locally, uh, should be um, um, also time-framed because, well, of course, uh, conditions in, in, in a place changes in time, and that is precisely what happens when any measure is taken. So uh, my point here is data will always feed artificial intelligence, and the intelligence of this AI will be based on what we feed into the machine. Thank you. Can you clarify what you said then, rather than data obtained from statistical observations? Like what's the difference between data obtained from a statistical observation and an AI? Um, raw data or um, non-aggregated data is data collected directly from the source. So if we are addressing issues um, relevant to a population, we should ask the people. We should ask or we should measure conditions from the environment. We might be interested in um, uh, information that we can connect through um, IoT, for instance. But then it has to be from the location itself. If we um, assign this, um, this task to, um, to having a, a data set based on, on on uh, statistical observations from random uh, individuals in, in an area, and then we uh, draw inference to say everyone should more or less be in a similar condition. We are not addressing the individual, we are not addressing the, the problem that people are living, but rare the vague observations which are uh, like closing the, the data gap between knowing what, what the people need and knowing what we can infer from um, high-level data. Then I, I, I see a great value in, in the opportunity through IoT, for instance, or through local institutions that have direct contact and exchange with uh, people from, from the region to rely on, on uh, data with uh, quality, high quality of, of uh, content to address um, the, the, the issues um, of uh, sustainability. Thank you very much. Uh, do any, does any panelist want to comment on what's been said? I'm curious, what was the uh, applicate, what type of data are you collecting for what, what's the application? Um, the, the kind of data we collect is 
um, based on surveys that are directly asked to the people in, in, in these uh, regions and, and development. And then the surveys are drawn from, from the SDGs themselves. So it is possible to, um, to develop um, surveys which are uh, aligned with the SDGs. So for instance, to, to mention an example, SDG number seven is um, energy access for all. And there is a, a tool called the multi-tier framework which addresses different attributes to describe energy conditions in, at the household level. Then using these um, latest um, methodologies to collect data at, um, aligned uh, with the SDGs, then um, can, can be a reliable source of, uh, of data to then be able to analyze that at a, at a level that uh, AI can, can actually be a tool that addresses uh, the SDGs. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have someone else from the floor? We're still talking about opportunities for AI, for SDGs. Um, regarding the, the previous um, the floor participants' quite, um, the comments, I would like to um, share my experience. Um, basically, um, he collects some data from like the survey, survey data or the other things. However, a lot of people have misunderstanding about the AI that if we put something that we can get a magic. However, there is a common mistake and a common misunderstanding. So that's why if we want to get very um, useful research from the data using the AI, I think it's really important to set up the, um, the, the, the basic um, the automation process. I mean, uh, we um, actually we call it pure processing. That means that even though we have uh, plenty of the raw data, but if we didn't, if we don't do pre-processing, and those the raw data will be useless. That's why um, when we adopt AI to specific industry, then it's really important set the goals and how we use and how collect the data. So after we collecting the raw data, and we have to uh, set up the strategy or plan how to get used. So it, um, according to my experience, I also have collect some raw data from the um, manufacturing industry. However, I was really surprised that the raw data wasn't that beautiful. That's why a lot of researchers and engineers have to spend long, long time to do pre-processing. So that's why if we want to bring the AI to the industry, which I never done with the AI before, and we have to understand, and we have to uh, we have to understand how AI works, and then maybe we can bring the AI properly with the value of a research. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, you talked about data preparation, so. Does anyone in the room have experience with data preparation or would like to explain what it is and maybe the human element to it? Um, I think there, there may be some potential in AI for SDGs in terms of the huge workforce that's required there. So I'll, I'll be glad to comment, uh, having dealt with lots of data, um, and I'll take somewhat of a maybe contrarian uh, approach. Uh, in my view, uh, AI is uh, a fairly gritty, or at least uh, the machine learning, deep learning, is a fairly gritty uh, approach to um, making decisions. Uh, yes, you can have bad data and it can, it can uh, distort your decision, but it, usually it's in comparison to what's the alternative in that context. You're using the AI to help make a decision, so even poor AI may be better than the alternative that you have. And I think that's part of what hackathons and such teach people is that you can quickly get a certain type of 
information or suggestion at least, you can, you know, as part of a decision that you're trying to make uh, or a conclusion you're, you're trying to draw. And understanding the, the, the nuances is important. Um, I prefer techniques that actually work well with dirty data, uh, with messy data, um, mainly because it is, like you said, in labor intensive uh, if you require well-labeled data. Um, so I think that's part of, there's options out there. There's not a, necessarily a one size um, fit all, fits all. Okay, um, the people behind me, you might have to ask me to turn my head around if you have any questions. Um, does anyone else want to, yep. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Christian Resch. I work for the GIZ, the German Development Agency, in the uh, Fair Forward Initiative, Artificial Intelligence for All. Uh, we were successfully launched this morning, so rather new. Thank you very much. Um, I, I actually have two questions. Uh, the first one is rather simple. It is the question, who is developing and applying and deploying AI for SDGs? Uh, it draws inspiration from, from a remark earlier today uh, which uh, came from a private sector representative from a social business, mainly active in, uh, in Africa. And he said that on the demand side for data, his experience was that it may mostly came from the government and only to a limited extent from the private sector. And if anyone wants to comment on that, I would be thankful. And the second question is, where do you see the role of official statistics in this whole topic? Uh, looking to the rise of microdata. I mean, especially in, in uh, Western countries, uh, official statistics heavily moves towards microdata and away from the broad national aggregates, which basically defined national statistics for decades. Um, and that gives suddenly new data sets you can try and apply on. And uh, I also have a background in central banking, and they are already doing it with the data they have. So. Um, Thankful for every comments on that. Uh, very interesting. Uh, seems like it's not the size of your data that counts. Could you just explain briefly what you mean by microdata? Uh, sure. Basically, every data which has at its unit of observation an individual unit, may it be a person, a household, a firm, or even small geographical units like quarters, villages. Uh, small districts, etc. That that would be my definition, and uh, it could even be down to the level of single transaction. Might that be commercial or of another kind? And yeah, I haven't gone deep enough in literature review yet, but I'm suspecting that there was a, a, a similar excitement that happened around statistics around the 50s or 60s, what people called the quantitative re revolution and national development. And I think some of the promises of, of AI as we know it is actually statistics or supplementing statistics. So does anyone want to talk to statistics? Are there any statisticians in the house? I, sure, I, 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 can, I, have, I have a background. And I mean, I think the, the, the microdata thing is, is interesting because the you know, it turns out like the health data that you might collect on your phone or the Fitbit, you know, in, in some sense to the extent that it's telling you about your own performance, uh, you know, what makes you sleep well, for example, or uh, how does, uh, you know, your, 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 your activity during the day affect your sleep. I mean, that's the sort of microdata, would you agree that that's kind of a microdata application where you don't have to have a huge database. It's just collecting data on your phone and, and it, you know, at the end of the day, deep learning is statistics. So, you know, it's, it, but it's got a very nice name and you have robots and everything that make it much more glamorous and, and or insidu insidious, uh, depending upon your point of view. Uh, but it usually does come back down to statistic, statistics. So I'm not sure what the question is in terms of statistics. Uh, I think that was the question and uh... I think like the statistical capacity of governments is hugely important. So when we're stimulating AI, hopefully we're also stimulating that capacity. Raymond? 
Yeah. Yeah, let me just chime in on that, uh, because the question wasn't that very clear, but from what you're explaining, it seems to point to what uh, the imperatives are for micro, uh, macro data, not micro, but macro data. Uh, I think in, in, in relation to the SDGs, uh, macro data will be very critical to measuring and quantifying potential or actual progress in using AI to achieve the SDGs. And therefore, it's imperative to improve the statistical capacity, especially for developing countries. It is estimated that for this to happen, uh, there's a, requ a yearly requirement of about a billion dollars annually to enable uh, the, the, the world's lower income countries to establish these statistical capacities capable of supporting and measuring the goals. How this money and the funding will, will come about, uh, it's not still very clear. And, though, and so that's a very big bottleneck in preparing or being ready to harness AI for the SDGs. When we look at the critical macro data that is important for this process, we understand that uh, census survey and administrative data are the main sources of data that are used to inform uh, these processes, especially considering uh, the UN's 2030 agenda, as well as the 2063 agenda of the African Union with respect to the SDGs. Uh, we know that the UN recommends that a census enumeration should be done at least every 10 years, or even better, for better statistical results every five years, uh, rather than simply relying on estimates and projections alone, like someone alluded uh, in, in a previous statement. So when we look across Africa, for example, uh, a few countries have not carried out any census since the 1990s. My country, Nigeria, just had the last one since 2006. And therefore, it's important to improve this process, especially with regards to disaggregated data that can measure uh, and show disparities with, res with regards to age, gender, income, and geographical location. Uh, this will be important to ensure an accurate assessment of the progress made in these various areas and identification and categorization of the gaps and issues uh, of exclusion and inclusion in these regards uh, that can be addressed by the relevant authorities. So I think that's the imperatives for uh, macro statistics in being prepared to harness AI for the SDGs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of time and the evolution of the discussion, it seems like we've moved on to constraints. Um, so we're going to now talk about constraints on AI for SDGs. Um, I see Mina, you've just joined us. Would you like to mention some constraints that there exist in the developing world in terms of realizing AI for SDGs? <laughs> So I, th I think so. The, the very first thing, if I had to, to, to weigh on that question, uh, probably what pops in my mind, Sarah, what Sarah had actually said during the prep call, the, the prep meeting that we had before the panel on Tuesday night, if you remember, we were saying something about the, uh, the, where all the interesting, and that was when then I commented and I said uh, that kind of reflected one of the comments that Fatou made in her keynote opening when you were saying there are some really amazing, interesting pockets of you know, innovative ideas and innovative applications of people you know, who do some really innovative solutions in Africa. And the problem is that, or the question was, how is it that you know, they can gain access to capital and markets and broadband and so on so that they can scale? Um, so the question on whether collecting data or trying to build applications and building you know, an infrastructure that can, you know, capitalize on some of this innovation, can capitalize on the data, can deliver on some of the SDGs, one of the constraints I see in that is not specifically to how we architect the regulatory you know, uh, space around data and curation and collection and, and filtering and cleaning up and all of that, but one of the things for, to deliver on the SDGs in that respect is how we're going to create infrastructures where people have access so that they can scale, so that they can productize, so they can get an environment and, well, sell the products that they have, essentially. So if that was the question about constraints, I think that would be the very first thought that comes to mind. 
and Sarah, feel free, please, if you want, if you want to add more on that thought, uh, because I thought it was actually really interesting, and I was hoping that uh, on the panel when we had the discussion yesterday, that would be kind of a point of discussion. Uh, but thanks. Okay, would anyone like to pick up on the creation of infrastructures or a new constraint? I would say a, a natural constraint by definition of AI is the fact that AI will perform whatever the, this AI is meant to do. Then if, if there is an algorithm uh, designed for a specific industry, then probably the, the consideration will be to perform a specific task within this industry, and then the AI could be very precise or, or very um, powerful in, in, in doing what it has been meant to be doing. But then in terms of um, sustainable development, there is an environment and there are some surroundings that are those that will be at the end um, affected but by whatever decision AI has taken without considering the environment. We as humans perceive the environment even though we want to buy a t-shirt and then we heard that there is the possibility to buy uh, environmental and uh, social responsible cotton then we might change the decision to change to a sustainable supplier. If the algorithm that will throw to me uh, the alternatives to buy my t-shirt is not considering anything that addresses sustainability, then I will not have the opportunity to address my, uh, my concern with the environment. Then um, I think if we are leaving decisions to be taken by AI, these decisions should include all these things that we uh, humans are concerned of, such as sustainability and development and well-being. So uh, even if a process has nothing to do with sustainability as the direct process, a recommendation system for cotton t-shirts, at the end, it is related, and then somehow there should be a policy that says if you have a machine that will recommend products and there is an opportunity to address uh, sustainable aspects through the data that is fed into the algorithm, this information, this kind of data should be available also into the, uh, into the algorithm. So this uh, artificial decision-making is also loaded with information about sustainability. And um, uh, then my point um, with regards to limitations is that AI is as intelligent as the data we feed into the algorithm. And then we have to be responsible in choosing the, the right information and, and to shape the, the AI to, to do that what also um, is, is um, related to the sustainable development goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm trying to get you verbatim, but it was a good quote there. Um, I think you pointed to two issues, and, and yeah, the first is yeah, AI is quite brittle. You can't just bend it towards any purpose. And then the second is, yeah, the data, the data we feed it. Obviously, so much of this has profit motive that despite what you say, the recommendation system might not feed it. I was sitting next to, in the UNESCO panel, um, someone from a youth hackathon or youth IGF contingent, but yeah, she'd made a recommendation system specifically for sustainable products. Whether it had the logic of that's going to make somebody money, I don't know. So hopefully that could be combined, the person there. 
Uh, hi, Ansgar Kuna. Um, among other things, I'm also a working group chair at one of the IEEE standards. Um, I think you made a very good point regarding the AI systems are basically they're going to optimize, it, it, optimize towards a particular kind of goal that they've been pre-constructed to do. What the, the definition of what it is trying to achieve is something that has to be preset for it. The AI system can learn things from the data, but what it learns is how better to reach that optimization goal. The goal is defined by people. So what this, what I'm trying to point at here is it's not just the data that feeds in, it's also understanding the context in which it's going to be used so that you understand properly what it is that you need to be optimizing for. And for instance, the example that you brought about going to the market and you identify, wait a minute, there's actually something else here that would be better to do. This requires um, on the ground capacity to be able to adjust the optimization targets of the AI system. So what that means is you cannot rely on systems that effectively are parachuted in and just say, well, it's going to learn from the data, so it will be able to adjust to the local situations. You, you need to make sure that you have local capacity and that the system is built in such a way that it isn't a closed uh, box that actually things like optimization targets can be adjusted according to the situation. So uh, if we're talking about uh, possible constraints on the use of AI uh, in SDG, uh, for SDG purposes, um, that means we need to always be thinking about also the capacity building for the people in the area so that they can actually um, take agency of the use of these technologies. Hi, um, so my name is Imran Simmons. I work for the South African um, Foreign Ministry and I deal with issues of science and technology. Um, I'm just reflecting on the title of this session and I'm listening to a lot of what you're all saying here and also just considering the aims of the SDGs. And what I loved about why I chose this session was we're talking about dynamic partnerships. And I almost feel like you all are experts in the field of AI, but you're speaking in echo chambers. And my biggest concern is always that from a governmental perspective and those outside of government, we don't seem to understand each other. Precisely because we don't know each other's languages. And for me, the key is I've been fortunate that I came from the corporate sector into government, so sometimes I'm able to still crawl back into that spectrum and understand where you're going. But understand that your field, particularly around AI, is very technical. And somebody in policy development, it becomes too much for me. And so when we're talking about this development of these partnerships, we need to find a mechanism to actually use AI to help us understand each other. So this is the, the, the intervention that I was hoping to, 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 to discover here today. And, and, and I'm hoping that this is where we're going to end our moderator. Yeah, that's my five cents. Thank you. Dongyi. Uh, yes, thank you for the comment. And I also add one thing about the, the bad side of the, the AI as well. I think the most important thing is the uncertainty of the AI. Because like when, while I adopt the, like machine learnings or other AI things in the real field, and I realize that sometimes I really uh, get the value that I really want to get in advance. And actually we call that as a optimal value. However, even though we use same, the, the, the same method of the, the, the AI package or the AI, AI method, However, the, the weight we put the value, depending on the, the weighted value, and the result will be totally different. In that case, we have to, uh, I can make a question that, so what is the optimal value? For example, like, the, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of uh, 
points we have to consider it uh, on the SDGs. However, there, if there are different um, stakeholders, and like for example, there are um, party A and the party B, and A can A and B can think in a different way. In that in, in that situations, nobody can tell the optimal value what the optimal value is. So um, that's why uh, even though we put the the AI in real life, but we can get a lizard by the value, metric value. However, nobody knows why the value came from. That's why recently a lot of the academic researches are conducted such as a XAI, which stands for the ex explainable AI. However, still, we have to make questions why the lizard is, can be believed or not. So um, this is my point that depending on the, the people who make an architect, architecture of the AI, and the lizard can be changed. That's why we have to think, we have to consider within the multi-stakeholder model, and we have, to, we, we have to share the opinion, what is the optimal value, and what is the correct method to apply for the AI. Thank you. Okay, before we return, do we have any new speakers in the room? No pressure? Just mandatory call for... Um, so, it's me again. Thank you. Um, talking about uh, optimum values, the first step to an optimum value is uh, having the value at all. So, if you're, it, it already happens in policy. You, you can think about uh, driving a car and then you want to get somewhere as fast as possible. And you look into uh, some Google Maps thing and it drives and it traces you the route and then you have speed limits. And then, why are there speed limits? You would like to go a lot faster. You want to gain time. But then the speed limits say you can't be, go beyond because there are some safety issues. There are some environmental issues. There are some noise issues. And then the optimum value here is that you as the intelligence before AI, we will drive. And one day the car will drive and we'll know in this area, I can drive up to 40 kilometers per hour, and then it's out of the question. I have then pressed the accelerator, I come up to the speed, and then I can't go any, much, any faster. Then, which is the optimum value? The fact that something was established. And then the rest is left to the automa uh, automation or to uh, the other... Um, goals set in, in, in this like big, uh, big algorithm. So that, that was also my point that I said before, that for decision making, there should be something also that first asks the question related to the environment. And then w what should I be thinking about if I am an industry and I use water? And then what happens with the water in my area, what happens with the water of uh, my population. I am using the drinking water of my neighbors. I am, am I affecting the, the health condition of my neighbors because I am optimizing to increase, increase productivity and then that makes that um, I take certain decisions. For, now all this happens with humans, but then if the same approach is then brought into a machine, and the machine will continue to do the same errors as humans have been doing for many, many years. So if we are going to leave this responsibility to AI, then we should take into consideration that precisely there are 17 SDGs that should help us um, to build a framework to keep in mind that there are external elements present in the environment that are also relevant to the decision making. Okay, so we've got 20 minutes left and I think that's a very good important point about values and then there's the 17 SDGs and you can optimize for one SDG to the expense of the others. So maybe we want to move here onto the risks of AI or, or potential risks of using AI for SDGs. 
Hello, everyone. Oops. Okay. So actually, my question may take us to a little bit uh, broader scope, I would say. So a few years ago, if we had this session, like five years ago, we'd probably say what internet could do for the development goals. And somehow we still didn't finish the digital transformation everywhere, probably. And I'm thinking what are the challenges that we faced and that we probably could learn some lessons from. Personally, coming from Africa myself, I would say one of the problems is actually that at some point of the digital transformation, we tried to give people solutions without consulting them, like projecting solutions somehow. That, for my opinion, one of the problems. So I would love to hear from you, like, what do you think the lessons we could have learned from the uh, internet um, connectivity, from the digital transformation, that maybe the uh, fate of AI would be different? Uh, thanks very much. Could you tell us your name if you like, and anyone who's spoken, they can drop me off a card and just clarify the name for attribution. Okay. Uh, this is Yasser. I'm from Tunisia. I'm a software engineer from Tunisia. Were you? Uh, no, I mean, I think that we actually do have a lot to learn from, from the history of ICT access and, and digitalization. And uh, at Research ICT Africa, we've observed the digital inequality paradox. Uh, the more people get connected, at least from the high level, like mobile phone penetration, subscriber numbers, there's more digital inequalities that get introduced. And I think this happens with any wave of development. Tapani. Uh, so, Tabani Tadvarian, Electronic Frontier of Finland, not the foundation. Uh, I think the key point in what she just said is that we don't really know. We are talking about what AI, what it's today, or rather what it was last year, and we have no clue what it's going to be in five years from now. It may be completely different. We may even, okay, I don't expect to have real general AI by then, but it may be rather more general than it is now, maybe something unpredictable, how much it will affect what kind. It is rather dangerous, I think, to make rules or two very tight predictions on what we have now, because we are speaking about very narrow AI, what we have now, and it's likely to be already much less narrow a year from now, let alone five years. I just want to add that I think that the one lesson we can take away is user-centered design uh, is been part of the success of uh, connectivity, especially in um, uh, you know the, the most recent billion that have connected. Um, and I think you know to our colleague's question from South Africa, it's about being user-centered design. You know, what is the problem you're trying to solve? What's the decision you're trying? What's what's the decision you're trying to make better? Uh, and if you don't answer those questions, then you don't necessarily get user-centered uh, solutions. And I think user-centered design is really so key uh, to making AI effective, especially for the SDGs. Thank you very much. Uh, any other risks, potential risks, or considerations and mitigations? Hi, uh, yeah. So, so I'd like to build on what was just mentioned around uh, user-centric design and actually connect also to the point that you made regarding if we're optimizing for one SDG, we might actually be counter-optimizing, destroying um, towards another SDG, which is uh, one of the uh, aspects that comes with something like AI as opposed to the previous digitization things is that it is something that, in a sense, can happen remotely. It, or you may not be aware of the fact that an AI is being used in a way to, to, to do an optimization on you because it's using data in a particular, potentially computed in a remote location to then make decisions about services, perhaps, that are being provided to you. So if you don't engage in user sent, uh, you in a design methodology that actually involves the people on location, you may be 
um, prioritizing things other than the way in which they would like to have the prioritizations, um, which m might happen less in the case of previous technological uh, work that has been done that involved more of a hardware application at that location where basically the people in the area will at least know that this is happening. Um, yeah. Thank you. Does anyone have experience or anecdotes about optimizing for users in the location? I know in our studies in AI in Africa, we actually trying to, to pick up some examples of, but um, a lot of the cases and literature about bias is based in cases from the North and from the US. Uh, my fear is that this time next year we're gonna have a lot of cases <laughs> and we should get on it now. Dongi. Um, I think one of the risks that uh, I think I think one of the risks can be the responsibility because um, when human doing something, then um, each of the assigned the person will in charge of the work. So if any situation happens, and the responsibility will be up to the person. However, when we gather the data or the lizard from the AI, then it's, we will, it will be really, really on the blurred line that who take the responsibility. In the case, uh, uh, we have to consider who can solve the problems as well. So um, among the SDGs, um, we have to consider that there, is, there are a lot of the different stakeholders. So one might be a decision maker, one might be an end user, one might be of maybe like the people from the government. So um, uh, we have to take, uh, we have to think that if we decide to bring the technology, we have to bring the AI to the real world especially focus on the SDGs, and we also have to think about the who will take the responsibility. Because when some um, bad situation occurred, and um, for the, the better um, solving the problems, and we have to find who will take the responsibility. So um, if nobody can take the responsibility, and it will be very dangerous, especially for the for any stakeholder who really need high, um, uh, high, um, what can I say? Like for example, like a bank or the government, they always would like to uh, take the um, technology or actions with high responsibility, just in case, just um, for, uh, for for the uh, best situation. However, uh, however, if AI give really blurred. Um, Lizard, and it will be a problem. So we have to think about the responsibility came from coming from the AI as well. Raymond, well, just to chime in uh, on the on the risk that we need to keep our, our eye on, especially uh, as implication for developing economies uh, as we continue in this drive of applying AI for realizing the objectives of the SDGs. One critical issue or risk that I think uh, we might be amplifying is structural inequalities, especially if the analog, uh, both soft and hard infrastructures that I earlier alluded to are not put in place. Uh, if this technology continue to overrun the development of these institutional frameworks, then uh, as we continue to reproduce the structural inequalities in the digital economy, the global south uh, risk becoming an unregulated innovation playground for technology giants to experiment in. Uh, if adequate comprehensive policy measures are not developed that can govern the operations, as we know, self-regulation of internet companies will not optimally work. Companies with significant power 
should not be allowed to write the rules governing their own behavior. So we can't just rely on uh, industry developed standards and principles. We must ensure that regulatory intervention that is required on many levels, uh, especially with regards to governing data protection, is put in place, not just in the traditional format, but in, uh, in, in uh, a confine that understands and integrates the risk of emerging technologies such as AI. Thank you. I have a final risk to add, or another risk to add. Um, to the extent that AI augments decision making, uh, it can actually uh, cause one to be less resilient when there is an interruption in access to that um, that resource, that uh, that that tool that's helping making the decision. Um, I don't know about you, but me personally, I might use my phone. I've used my phone for uh, directions and. One time I just decided not to turn it on and I was making wrong turns everywhere because I forgot the route uh, that I had driven 20 times. And so, you know, I, I think there's a, a, a risk of uh, atrophy of one's cognitive skills if you rely too much on the AI. And so when the AI is not there, you're, 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 you're out of practice, as it were, for even some simple tasks, some simple decisions, which for me was driving and knowing the route from one place, one place to another. Sorry to say I share the same problem, but I <laughs> wasn't very good at nav navigation to start with. Um, sorry, the software engineer from Tunisia, did you have a inter or just waving? Okay. Is there anyone who hasn't inputted yet? I think most of us have. Okay. So, thank you. Um, I would like to put together, uh, well, one thing that Dongji mentioned as well as uh, Raymond, and that is, um, you said, explainable AI. Um, maybe for those that are not really in the technical side of artificial intelligence, this means that um, decision making should be uh, identifiable and someone can be able to address why uh, uh, an, uh, an algorithm took the decision of selecting one of the, the outputs of, of the solutions. Um, the counterpart of it, something explainable is non-explainable, so for this term it's called the black box. You just input some data and then you get a result and then no one knows how this decision was taken. You just trust that the, the, the level of uh, precision of this algorithm has done a good job. And then uh, the, the contribution from Raymond was to um, also uh, rely on, on, on um, setting rules or, or, or policies to consider things. And I think um, in comparing this to, to, to the way that industry functions, there are many, many rules in the industry. So if you're going to work under certain conditions, you have to use safety shoes, safety glasses, safety uh, helmet, and so on. So in AI, I can imagine that the, such regulations will, in the near future, become you have to use an explainable algorithm. You have to do uh, midterm checks to verify that algorithms are, are running with a certain level of precision. And then this uh, auto absolute autonomy that uh, we imagine now with uh, AI that can uh, evolve into uh, something catastrophic might be under control if there are always specialists like guiding this artificial intelligence into doing the right decision. So policy making is very important. The, the, uh, being able to explain why AI makes a certain decision is also important. And I think that is something that we'll start to see in the near future. 
Sure. Thank you very much. Um, Tabani. So I'd like to address that explainability a bit because one of the main features, actually the key characteristic of AI is that it's not explainable, at least not in the sense that traditional programs are. We can try to explain it to the same level that we can explain the actions of a dog, for example, which have been trained to do some things, but we don't really, can't really understand deep down how it works. And we don't really understand how human decisions work for that matter, so we can't even demand that, but we can't demand that from AIs either. It's always a bit of a black box. We can uh, try to explain it to some level, like testing how it works, or kind of that kinds of things, but it's not explainable, understandable in the sense that traditional programs are that the programmer can go deep and point out why this exactly happened and change it. So, and that's something we just have to live with if we, unless we reject AI completely, and I don't think we can. Or, or perhaps there's, a, there's still a chance to make AI even better and then refine algorithms to make them explainable in some certain level. Um, but then there, there's still work to do. It has to be done. Yes, um, that's why I think we have to uh, understand how the, the, the process of the development of the AI. So from like 2012 to 16, I think AI was all about the machine learning. So that's why machine learning was about the cognition. And from the 2016 to present, the, uh, the AI is about like learning and the inference. And the, from now on, AI is going to make the action and the decision making. So I think um, the speed of development of, of AI is incredibly fast, faster than any other technologies. That's why right now we can call it as a block black box. However, uh, I believe that uh, when there is a new lizard come up from the AI and I believe maybe there is the reason why the AI make actions. So that's why um, AI is not a perfect, the perfect technology right now. However, uh, if it's getting mature, mature if it becomes a mature technology, and then I think uh, we can use in a proper way as well. So uh, we have to uh, take a look how it can be changed in close future. Um, so we've got three minutes left for closing remarks. Uh, I think you've offered yours, Dongi. Could we have uh, Greg and then Raymond? So in one of the sessions yesterday, I think the, the question is, are you ready for the future? Uh, it's going to be, I think, quite interesting. Uh, the, the, the research is really continuing to evolve. And uh, you know, I believe in 50 years, or hopefully less, we will have explainable AI. Uh, but I think we'll also have uh, many people using AI on an individual level, small companies, uh, just in ways that we, we can't quite imagine yet. Uh, so the, the best, is yet, the best and, and maybe the worst is yet to come. Just to wrap up, uh, all the dynamics and principles and issues that we've raised are really embedded in framing a national AI strategy. Without a strategy, it will be uh, impossible or ineffective in measuring how much progress you are making on leveraging this technology to achieving the SDGs in Africa, why Kenya and Tunisia are the only countries that have set up AI-specific tax box working towards a national strategy. The outlook for AI in Africa still remains positive. Few countries are beginning to move in that direction. While some have that as a separate objective, some have embedded that in uh, a fuller smart policy. South Africa, Uganda, Nigeria, they are recently setting up uh, some of these national task force on emerging technologies. And this process is important to support government readiness in AI in order to ensure that countries from Africa are positioned to benefit 
from the potential of AI in their economies. While uh, it is notable that if you look at the 2019 government AI readiness index, it paints a, a familiar disincentivizing picture for the African continent uh, for global indices of this, this nature. There are presently no African countries in the top 50, and only 12 countries are in the top 100. So with regards to this, uh, African countries must be, begin to design strategic and effective national AI policies that can work for the continent. And key critical elements that I believe should be part of that strategy will involve a robust regulatory policy framework. It will involve capacity and expertise that is lacking. The framework with regards to data privacy and security, cyber security, uh, cloud adoption initiatives, industry-led standards, automating uh, the public sectors, which are huge uh, leveragers of data, as someone has alluded uh, from the discussion so far, and also ensure a collaborative environment, because in this digital era, the governments will and cannot do it alone, uh, so they need to cooperate with the multi-stakeholdership in moving the processes further. In doing so, I think in the next decade, Africa will stand at a better pedestal in harnessing these technologies to to meeting uh, the targets that have been set in the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Three, two, one. Um, I encourage you all to swap details, and anyone who's spoken to me, uh, please give me a card, um, especially the gentleman from my home government. Hi. <laughs> and thank you so much for coming. In Germany, they knock on the table, by the way. <laughs> <laughs>